So, the other day, I made a video about... What am I doing here? Here we go. Oh, I'm only... Okay. So, the other day, I made a video about Trisha Paytas. Um, I... And Blair White. It was, a, it was a quick little thing about how, you know, I identified... This is something that, that Trisha seems to do regularly, is that she will generally when she's under heat she'll point the finger at somebody else and say hey that person is bad by comparison so i must not be so bad she did it to blair white uh and so that was the point of that thing i talked about it on my podcast with mama gut no mama and papa gut show you can check it out look at the playlist <laughs> uh, but people there were some valid criticisms mostly people saying like hey you don't really you should look into blair white basically and a lot of people sent me this video here called the problem with Blair White, misinformation, and uh, moderation. So I'm going to watch it. We're going to educate ourselves on Blair White. I haven't seen too much from her. From what I've seen, like I didn't find her particularly offensive. But again, I haven't looked into her. So we're going to go through this just so you guys know. All right, The way that I operate is I give people the benefit of the doubt uh, until that benefit of the doubt is broken. I don't think that's a hot take or a bad thing to do. A lot of people criticize me on the Shane Dawson video because I didn't hate him instantly. I don't hate him in general. It was, he's obviously creepy, but uh, people were upset about that. That's just how I do content. I think it's a really shitty thing fundamentally in life to start off hating somebody. Uh, I don't. I think that it's always important to take people's words into context with what they mean and what they say, but you should also develop um, your own opinions on people yourself. So that's what we're going to do. So let's get let's get into it. Let's actually put it on a little bit increased speed. Watch this video. My scroll wheel's broken. And again, this is from uh, the right opinion. People, a lot of people sent me this video. That's why I'm watching this one. So. All oh, right, my favorite. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to The Right Opinion, the home of HBAT with too much free time. And 2020, not the most enjoyable year to say the least. I recall back to my Q&A in March, when the Nostradamus opinion announced that the year seemed to be calming down, which in hindsight was a slightly misguided forecast. In fact, I positively say it was a kiss of death, as the world is careening towards its frankly well-deserved Armageddon. I've honestly not handled it too well, personally. To see so much going on makes me want to curl up in a ball and hibernate, or estivate if you consider when all this was happening. At the same time, there's always reason within the chaos, and I've always led by the philosophy that I emerge from hardships a wiser man. And a part of me hopes that would be similarly... Oh, this is actually kind of a newish video. This is actually only... This is like just a few days old, like maybe not less than a week old. I thought it was older than that. Interesting. Okay. Well, on a macro level as well. However, we'll never reach that if we can't have a proper mature discussion to understand how such discord has arisen. And at times when emotions can run high, we often need voices of reason to lead that discourse forward so that we can all learn from such adversities. In the past few years in particular, I feel that YouTube has become increasingly integral to that conversation, introducing a new generation to the many complex and sometimes not so complex matters facing down today's youth, with online creators engaging audiences through fresh mediums, acquainting them with new ideas and perspectives. Although the nature of my channel can be a little biographical, I hope that people have found value in the viewpoints I have to share. And you know what? I'd say the feedback has been broadly positive. One way that people recognize the work you do often is what some regard as year end lists, where individuals compile a selection of their favorite creators and post it to their preferred social media site. At the end of 2019, I was once again honored by being placed amongst YouTube who put great effort into their respective hustle. However, one name whose presence I was surprised to see was a commentator by the name of Blair White. Oh, hi, welcome back to my channel. So you guys are currently in bed with me, which not a lot of people can say because I am very innocent. Blair White is a creator who has been on the platform for a good few years and has spent her time mostly preoccupied with socio-political commentary. She presents her perspective from quite a unique angle, espousing conservative-leaning narratives, which wouldn't be too exceptional on paper, but is somewhat intriguing when you juxtapose this ideology with the fact that Blair is transgender. A lot of the times on this channel and on my- I do want to say like, you know, Listen, I know people were going to get upset with this, but I think that fundamentally, like, pe there's nothing wrong with being a conservative trans person or a conservative gay person. I do understand that uh, more traditional conservative values are anti trans and anti gay. Like, I do understand that. But I think that a lot of people have an idea of what they think about conservative people. And that just because you're conservative doesn't mean that you're like a hyper right winger uh, that doesn't like gay people. Like, I have. It, 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 I have concerned people in my family and I have gay people in my family and it's not a big deal. <clears throat> it's not this huge thing. Um, not everybody hates gay people. So I just want to bring that out. And I think I don't think it's fundamentally a bad thing. Now, that doesn't mean that she's saying great things about gay people. We have to look into that. I'm just saying for 
context. Social media, I'm presenting a sort of side to the trans topic that not many people are used to seeing. I don't talk about things in the way that every single other trans influencer in the world talks about. I don't talk about things in the way that every other trans activist you've ever seen talks about them. I am different. These two positions aren't entirely incompatible. When considering that the doctrine of social conservatism in particular has often been quite hostile to LGBT rights, it would seem that adopting this outlook would be counterintuitive for anyone of that demographic's denomination. However, with young Republicans and conservatives seeming to be more amenable to pro-LGBT policy, the setting of an online platform aimed at a younger, more broad-minded audience could not be more alluring to those who may find themselves set apart from their stereotypes by their beliefs, identity, or in this instance even, both. Since launching her channel in 2016, Blair amassed over a million subscribers, garnering a dedicated fan base eager to see her tackle subjects which can often be highly consequential for the parties involved. In many ways, her personal experience as a transgender individual allowed her to provide a new energy to previously archaic conservative narratives that were often weighed down by their inherent lack of empathy for the individuals at the heart of the discussion, while also correcting misconceptions that have previously been peddled about Blair and many of her peers. To those who admired her, and perhaps to Blair herself, White was a bridge between previously estranged communities who on the surface had very little in common. However, unlike some political commentators who have sprung up in the last few years, Blair was never exactly renowned for a diplomatic demeanor. If you're trans, you don't have the right to share an opinion like this. For which I actually quote tweeted them and said, I'm trans, idiot! They criticized me for being a trans medicalist, which is me believing that being trans is a medical issue because that's exactly what it is. And just really mad that I don't think non-binary people are the same thing as trans. Too bad, too sad. I mean, first and foremost, <laughs> I don't, I hate, it, it is a, it is bothering, it does bother me that as a content creator, you get a lot of shit for the way that you react to fans. And I get it because you're a larger creator, so you're supposed to be more um, cordial, I guess you'd say. But also, a lot of people will abuse that. Um, per they'll abuse that relationship. They'll be they'll come in and say something really like super aggressive because they're like, well, if you respond poorly to my really shitty thing that I said, well, then you're a shitty person. Um, it's, it's just kind of shitty. That being said, you know, the trans, I understand why a trans person would be upset with compounding, um, well, somebody with gender dysphoria, let's say, compounding someone with gender dysphoria and non-binary, right? They're two very different experiences. There's obviously, if you have diagnosed gender dysphoria, there's obviously a significant amount of distress associated with your gender um, expression or in your gender identity not, I guess, matching. So... Again, like I can understand why somebody who's trans, who has gender dysphoria, would be upset that their perception could be that people who are non-binary are getting like pushed into the same field. Maybe they feel like it's invalidating to their specific struggle because just because you like you being non-binary doesn't mean that you understand the struggle of somebody that has gender dysphoria. So okay, I'm fine with her take saying that. Whatever. In fact, from my perspective, she had been a divisive figure from since I could remember. And therefore, when seeing her alongside a fair few mild-mannered creators, I was surprised. Now, I don't follow too many commentators outside my sphere, but I stay in the loop with all the current affairs. And it was intriguing that someone who I knew for being moderately contentious among communities, to put it mildly, had won over the hearts of those who would typically steer clear of that brand of content. However, I decided not to investigate further because it wasn't really of much concern to me. If she was making content that went down with a wider spectrum of viewers, then good for her. Nonetheless, there was this lingering expectation in the back of my head that this may not be the last that I hear from her, given that she was still outspoken on many issues, some of which would put her into conflict with some of her audience. Yet, she may well have evolved, and in her video, she definitely seemed to purport herself as a reasonable medium. No, there are normal trans people out there who don't believe all these radical things. And why don't those trans people get a voice? You know, there's so many people who talk about how, like, every trans story needs to be heard, and we have to listen to trans people, and blah, 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 and like, cool, that's great, but why is it only on your terms? Why is there one narrative? I don't see anything wrong with what she's saying right now. Like, there are different trans perspectives, and sometimes a lot of people online, people are very toxic online, and they're not super open to listening to different perspectives. So, yeah, I mean, I agree with this, why people will generally just be invalidating just because like, there might be worse things that she says later, but so far, um, I mean... I don't, there's nothing problematic about what she's saying. People just don't like it because it's not just particularly like a huge upfront narrative. And if we don't follow it, then no, everyone should be heard but Blair White. Like, what are we doing? Moderation. It's an important facet in 2020. With the post-election landscape to dwell on, a president-elect who pledged to take the US back to some normality, yet a residual skepticism of real change and polarized tension that seemed hard to palliate. Many of our fans would have argued that Blair's place could not have been more essential in healing the wounds that so many had sustained that year. Unfortunately, although some may have longed for a wisdom in this critical time, it was instead about to be the subject of an investigation, which, provoked by an avoidable incident, would drag much of her past back into light and bring into question that self-acclaimed reputation of a reason 
reasonable, rational, and logical voice amongst all the havoc, with former fans and foes asking if actually she had been the instigator of this havoc all along. I have thousands of people write to me every single day that they are so disgusted with the way that trans people are portrayed in the media, all because this is how trans activists and the more radical people on the end of the spectrum are dictating it be portrayed. Well, to answer that curious query, I suppose it's about time we take a look for ourselves. And to do so, I'd like to go right back to 2015, where the Blair White YouTube story all began. So if you care to join me on this journey, you'd be most welcome. Without further ado, let us commence. All right. 2015 YouTube, how does one characterize it? Oh, is this the YouTube Rewind? Saying Sean King is white when he's white is incendiary. Christ menstruating with tits isn't incendiary. I'm here to ask questions, and it seems like you guys aren't very open to them. For many years, oh, YouTube Lord. had been the platform dominated by creators who didn't appear to take themselves too seriously. However, this had been gradually evolving, and by the end of 2015, this transformation was mostly complete. Now, they were still entertainers galore, but a more prominent role had been occupied by a political clique known to some as the Skeptics, the title acquired from their responses to eccentric religious zealots. Some of the creators in the community were more like parted in their narratives, merely mocking their subjects and providing casual repousts, while others tended to attack the specific fabric of arguments quite aggressively, even being quite provocative themselves. If we come from monkeys, then why are there still monkeys? And who is giving them markers and pieces of paper to write on? In spite of this, by the present year, many YouTubers in this field were also referred to as anti-SJWs, an acronym for Social Justice Warrior, because they had shifted their focus towards other targets, many of whom were treated with absurdity or incredulity, either in their arguments or their attitudes. Now, not all skeptics went on to be anti-SJWs, and some, in fact, became very critical of that movement. However, this movement also seemed to broadly merge with creators who had not necessarily made anti-creationist content prior, some of whom, gamers, others just casual creators turned commentators, mobilized by incidents such as the infamous Gamergate, or just general antics that they felt were worth calling out. It's very interesting, um, because <laughs> quite clearly, I mean, at least from what I'm seeing, there seemed to be like a pretty intense movement of people, like, listen, of people who are a little too uh, SJWE out there and then there was a reactionary response of you know people being like oh i don't like this like i'm gonna call it out and it's so interesting because people call conservatives uh reactionary a lot and they try to use it as an insult but can, that's quite literally that's really just the position that a conservative will take um just fundamentally right a progressive is somebody that's trying to change things um that doesn't that's which is you it's a good thing to change uh obviously changing correctly is important as well uh, and then conservatives who don't want that change, whether it's good or bad, would be reaction, would be having a reaction to that like that's their, that desire to change, right? So conservatives are just reactionary in general. So. The social justice warrior was an infamous nemesis back in the tumultuous year. Of many online, it was not hard to see why. They were generally not the most personable individuals, often presenting their somewhat radical ideas They're in a rather rude. disagreeable fashion. And this subsequently made them quite easy prey for the enlightened commentator, who would regularly descend from the heavens to put the halfwits in their place. I even dabbled in it here and there myself, though that year I must say I had more pressing matters to attend to. What I do understand is that Jeremy Hunt is not qualified to run the NHS. His approval rating lies at 17 percent 17 fucking percent fantastic four has a better public rating fantastic fucking four damn i really put those politicians in their place anyhow turning back to this genre of creators in reflection it's very easy to look back at that social zeitgeist in a sneering fashion but there were many who were very invested from a variety of political factions because at the time i feel that what a lot of these self-proclaimed advocates of social justice represented to these creators and audiences alike was an attack on an internet called was that sargon of assad isn't he a little kooky i don't really know too much about him either so Okay which are quite sacred at the time, and one heavily exhibited in a variety of content. The sort of edge without any real weight behind it. I will see how it goes after a week. Can we do next promotion? Hell yeah, yellow n***. At the same time, it's important not to undersell the level of political engagement in a lot of these videos. There was a lot more at stake than just what happened online, and a lot more depth to the discourse, particularly contained within a multitude of social issues which had seeped onto the platform as tensions in the real world appeared to be rising with the impending plebiscites. It was an exciting time to be a creator in that genre, and more people wanted to be involved, one of those being our fabled title character. At this moment, Blair was a computer science student at the California State University Chico campus. However, she was not having the most fun with her life, feeling a bit outcast by her identity. A transgender yet conservative leaning individual, a stark contrast to many of her liberal professors and fellow students. Like many others in such a position, Miss White found more home in the online sphere, a place that she likely felt was more accommodating towards her beliefs and attitudes. In many ways, the online world had provided a protective enclave for a variety of identities, especially those that may face ostracism in real life. This was merely another branch of that outlet. Who knows exactly when she decided to become a YouTuber, but a turning point appeared 
to be when she appeared on stream with Crater, who we can assume to be Theron Meyer, based on the tweet and obviously based on the archive of the video. It seems that many people encouraged her to start uploading her own content, and not too long after her first video was published. Hello, my name's Blair, for those of you who don't know, and in this video I'm going to be discussing a few related topics, one being feminism, the next being the men's rights movement, um, also the concepts of privilege, both male and female privilege, and just kind of my thoughts on all those things. Now, Theron, whose stream Blair had made the aforementioned appearance on, was a creator mostly focused around advocating for men's rights at the time, and therefore it made sense the. I know there's a little laugh, like. <clears throat> <sighs> like, I don't know, man. The whole men's rights movement is kind of silly to me. I understand that there's some like pockets of feminism that are toxic towards men, and so people want to call that out and be like, hey, I don't like that, which makes sense, right? Because you want feminism should be about equality. But a whole men's rights movement just seems like an overreaction to me. I mean, what, what right are men advocating for? I'm just curious. I mean, I, I'm just like genuinely curious. It's mostly don't be so mean to us feminists, you know? Blair's Maiden video covers similar talking points. The uploading question is titled Female Privilege, and as the title implies, it seeks to observe various deficits in society, where women actually possess an advantage over their male counterparts. Seemingly- That's true. I mean, everybody, like, every identity has a privilege and a disprivilege base, especially based on what sphere you're in. Uh, when we talk about something like, let's say white, I can't, I can't attack this. When we talk about something like white privilege, for instance, right? There are uh, privileges to being a, like, I don't know, Hispanic or black or whatever. It, but the, but generally speaking, being white, that privilege of being white would outweigh the other privileges versus disprivileges, right? And so white privilege is really just about how much um, it's a better privilege to disprivilege ratio is what people will generally talk about when they talk about white privilege. At least that's how it should be talked about. I don't think people um, really talk about it like that. So, In contrast to many narratives disseminated by accredited institutes. I've lived my life on both sides of the coin per se at different periods of my life. I think I definitely am in a position to critique the concept of privilege as it's perpetuated by feminist ideology. So there was a shift that happened in the way that the world interacted with me as I went further into my transition. Sort of the way that strangers interacted with me, the way I was treated, it all changed. It manifested in ways such as doors being held open for me, seats on public transportation being surrendered instantly really. The term ladies first is definitely something that's actually implemented, it's not just a phrase. However, Blair also uses the video yeah, to express sure. her own personal investments and experiences given her rather unique background in this dialogue. As a person who has transitioned, bless you herself as someone who has encountered both sides. You know what's interesting, though, and uh, I don't, ho hopefully this comes off right, is uh, one of the negatives to being a woman is, uh, a lot of times it's more social than anything else, a social discouragement from doing what you want to do, right? So going into computer science is something that is usually, like, well, some women get discouraged from. I don't know if it happens as much anymore, but it definitely has happened in the past. Right, so you're like a young girl. It's not. I, I doubt it's uncommon for a young girl uh, that might be in here, or not a young girl, or a girl that's in here. Maybe when they were young, they were told something like, if they wanted to lean towards computer science or being a mechanic, they might have been told like, oh, maybe you shouldn't do that. That's a boy's thing, right? And what's really interesting is that Blair White, as a trans woman, has experience like experiences growing up as a man, and I don't say that's like to be invalidating. I say that because. I think a lot of uh, the gripes that women have are gripes from growing up and the lack of opportunity from being discouraged from doing things that they shouldn't be discouraged from, like things that would be considered more male. And since Blair White uh, has a lot of experiences growing up as a male, it would, make, it would make sense for them to look at female privilege and go like, oh, this outweighs male privilege because I didn't experience the female disprivilege growing up when it was like a really big deal and super impactful sides of the gender coin, and thus also the privileges and drawbacks of constructs often bestowed onto such identities, implying this provides her with unique insight onto the topic, juxtaposing these differing experiences. She calls upon personal observations before sharing some hard-hitting statistics with her viewers. The truth is that men make up 80% of suicides, nearly half of all domestic violence victims, more men in the US are raped, that is when you factor in prison statistics, 77% um, of homicide victims. It's really interesting. I know I've heard that before. It's a bizarre thing though. Like, th th I know that the sexual assault happens more in prisons, uh, or for men more when you factor in prisons. That, to me, shows a drastic issue with our prison system. Um, it also does show me, whether you guys want to hear it or not, that, like, men tend to be the uh, aggressors when it comes to this type of thing. And I just bring that up for context, because I like to use my platform to especially educate young men on, like, how to make uh, women or people they're engaging with, generally speaking, more comfortable with saying no, and et cetera, et cetera. But I've heard that talking point. Um... 
I mean, I just, I just think that it really displays how fucked up our prison system is, if, if that's that much of a problem, where it's happening to such an extent. 93% um, of workplace deaths, 88% of homeless individuals are male, and sure. are, they're constantly screwed over in child custody and alimony cases. This sort of content was hardly exceptional, mostly- I see that's generally speaking. I don't think that men get uh, enough of the benefit of the doubt when it comes to child like custody or anything. But I'll also say, though, and this is anecdotal, so you can take this with a grain of salt, but it tends to be men tend to be the ones that want to walk away from their children more than women. Um, it just seems to be the case. It's, I, I'm like, obviously, I was raised by a single mother, so you might be like, oh, that's really anecdotal. But, you know, my mother has general advice for a lot of the women because she's talked to a lot of women with the, like shitty men that want to leave their kids. And her advice is always to like let them um, have custody of the kid with them, like joint custody in some capacity because they'll give it up. And every single time, again, this is anecdotal, they give it up. Like they want, a lot of times, it's really unfortunate, but custody fights are really just, I want to fuck you over fights rather than um, like, let's actually do what's best for the child. And in my experience, uh, men tend to be the shittier ones than women, you know, because it's just the truth. It's just the, it's just the truth. Parroting core talking points made by a lot of its proponents. However, as a cornerstone for what her content was to become, it seemed to lay the framework quite nicely. Her tone, although stern, was not hostile. Her sources, occasional spelling error aside, are cited. And her production, although somewhat lacking, still allowed for content to be digestible. To be frank, a lot of political content back then consisted of an avatar that, if you were lucky, moved its arms up and down. So to have a fully expressive individual talking about these topics may have been. <laughs> was, that, was that a normal thing? People didn't put their face to anything? Oh, that's interesting. It was Blair White's a pioneer. The blessing to many. These numbers definitely seem unfamiliar to most people. I know they definitely were to me when I started researching all of these things but the reason they seem Amazing so lighting. unfamiliar and maybe even not so believable is because feminism does not even allow the conversation to be had as an upload blair white's anti-feminist dance didn't tell us much about the world but it did tell us a bit about blair however there was more to come and first impressions can only tell us so much so those are my thoughts on the topics at hand and i definitely want anyone who disagrees with me to comment because i am open to people disagreeing with me i like having these challenged and oh i am willing to change my mind if i'm proven wrong so, bye. Some of the chats said, yeah, yep, my son's dad left when I was pregnant. Bro, same thing happened to my mom. Five months pregnant, came back uh, on the day of delivery to pretend to his mother that uh, that they were still together. And then he fucking up and left again. Uh, I seen him twice when I was two and five years old. It's fucked up shit. What's going on to everybody that's new in the chat? Blair's first upload was met with plaudits from many within the community that she was appealing to, particularly given her mostly forthcoming tone and open-minded outlook. Nonetheless, it was more than that, due to the previously expressed contrast of Blair's gender identity with her political identity, and how she used it in discourse. Um, I am transgender, so that does affect the rate at which I may or may not experience violence. Violence does beat trans people at alarmingly high rates. In a way, it dynamically flipped a narrative that had been traditionally associated with fairly progressive circles. The reference to how one's experience and identity can often shape their viewpoints, often being used as a stimulus to call for more diversity in certain intellectual circles. Here we had someone who represented that diverse upbringing, but whose ideological path had diverged from that which would be expected of someone who was stereotypically associated with her demographic. Many clearly welcome this, though you may be justified in finding some people's enthusiasm a little nauseating. At the same time, as she acknowledges herself, she still passes as a cis woman in many spaces, so her perspective is somewhat different to that of other trans people who may be subjected to stigma relating to their appearance. That's very true. It's, um, I believe the amount of passable trans people is, is pretty low, uh, which obviously you're, I mean, they call it like passing privilege or whatever, which is a real thing, you know? Um, if you're not really passing, you're going to be faced with more people that are like, what the fuck? Uh, more ignorance, honestly, from people. They're going to be like, what the hell is this? Kind of a thing, you know, like the general inner ignorance perspective on trans people. So it's true. It's but I am lucky enough that I can enter most public spaces and the world does interact with me as a woman, not as a trans person or as a man. Mm. Now, there were many criticisms that could be leveled towards her narratives, particularly given her tendency to conflate her specific experience as a woman with female experiences in general, an issue that would rear its head in future escapades. However, she didn't seem averse to criticism and still pointed towards clear systemic inequalities that should be addressed. As first videos go, it could be worse. And her next few videos followed a similar pattern. He tells a story, and I don't remember exactly what he what his situation was, but basically, his situation was worse than any girls in this class who talked about how their boyfriend used to verbally abuse them or used to hit them or used to grab them or whatever. Everyone in the class started laughing. That's fucked up. Literally. I think the only person that didn't laugh was me and the instructor, the professor. And the truth is, you know, more women... I mean, especially back then. I know I say back then, it's six years ago. But I think we've changed socially so quickly. And yeah, like I, that is one issue that with men face is uh, feeling invalidated or less manly when they 
if you know if they are abused by a partner, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if they show some kind of weakness, and I know people will be like, "Well, men did that." It was like men and women do that. I just want you guys to know that there are people, like it's shitty people, who do that more than anything else. In the U.S., are affected by domestic violence in terms of being victims. Because I know a lot of people will be like, "Oh, well, that's the patriarchy that men created." But I want you guys to understand that, like, women also created that patriarchy with us. I'm not saying that it's women's fault. I, this is a complex thing. The only point I'm trying to make here is that uh, there's this idea of a man, and that idea of what a man should be doesn't just come from other men. It comes from other women who are looking for like, a desirable mate. And then over time, as a society, you know, we have these particular um, male patterns and norms, and et cetera, et cetera. And I'm, I'm just saying because I know a lot of people like to just like brush it off as like, oh, it's a big, big, big men are the only problem. But it's perspectives in general that come from everybody. But it's something like over 40% are men. So it's not like it's 90-10 or 80-20. It's like 60-40. And I would venture to guess that it might even be closer to 50-50 if you take into account the fact that men don't talk about it. And when they do, they get f***ing laughed at. Anecdotes interspersed with some factual information, often as a secondary feature. This isn't to a detriment, and there are many perceptual benefits to this, such as a more intimate relationship between the creator and their audience. But it also means there is a sense of trust that needs to be invested in the creator. For some people, that degree of trust needs to be earned. But if you're speaking to a believable experience that resonates with people, then the threshold is often lowered. So certain stories of institutional intolerance may hit closer to home for some individuals, particularly if it fits into their worldview. And back then, the idea of vicious, college-dwelling feminists who had it in for every cursed bloke who had ever set foot on Earth wasn't one that seemed far-fetched at all, especially with the prevailing narratives in many of these communities, substantiated by many, frankly, unflattering clips. What? Humongous what? Humongous what? <laughs> Humongous what? Humongous what? Humongous what? This person just, sex just, just spoke to me in a sexually harassing oh, way. I did not. Yeah, he did. Blair's early output was definitely Jesus. built on a somewhat personal connection between herself and the audience. This could also be reflected in the fact that her fourth video was a Q&A, surprisingly premature for a channel's lifespan. But she portrayed herself as an open book who felt comfortable divulging details about her life, which consequently commanded a lot of respect from her viewers. However, at the same time, this personal journey granted her with a lot of flexibility in the topic she could tackle, and with each subject she approached, we seemed to learn more about her and her curious opinions. Her videos were awesome even structured looking. in a way so that they would follow on previous theses, though this may alienate people who don't necessarily agree with her presuppositions, especially ones that kind of assumed that she was correct, which wouldn't necessarily be the case. So now that we're all in agreement that feminism is indeed cancer, let us take a look at the ways in which feminism is, like a virus, able to spread its misinformation, half-truths, blatant lies, and overall retardedness through the internet. Oh, okay. I guess we established that then. The thing is that it's hard to go along oh, with these rough. assumptions when a lot of Blair's points aren't the most ironclad. And to be brutally honest, Blair's content didn't particularly stand out in the points that she made from a lot of other creators, sometimes falling quite short. And it's true that women do have a higher pressure to look youthful and to stay young because we do value that in women within this culture. But, you know, that expectation is directly perpetuated by women. You know, the billion dollar beauty industry well, I feel like that's not entirely true. Like I, I, I like women are like women are a factor. Men are also a factor in the way that um, women, men, and women perceive themselves. Like it's not just women. You know, you can't you can't take the perspective that um, we all contributed to the creation of the society we live in and what we call the patriarchy, and then also think that it's all women's fault for the way that other women perceive them because it's it's everybody's fault. Like it's it's a societal perception. Industry, which is advertising anti-aging creams and um, Botox and things like that, those are largely ran by women, made for women. So if this meme is trying to imply that, w that men are doing this to women, it's actually not true. This is from a video titled Feminism is Pointless, though it was very charmingly titled Feminism is Cancer at one point, where Blair reacts to a slew of memes that vary in their logical soundness, but also expose some of Blair's internal biases, such as the one shown in that curious clip. Now, even if Blair was correct in her assertion regarding industry leaders, it wouldn't necessarily be a valid response because the meme was a critique of society rather than men specifically, and it never asserted that men presently were the sole cause of harsher beauty standards mm. that are often imposed onto women, an issue that Blair acknowledges as existent right off the bat. Now, as noted, this is freshman content from our budding creator, so we can't expect everything to fall into place perfectly i'm sure i and many other yeah i mean so far i would just be like yeah this is kind of a misguided uh, understanding of the world that that would be my take on this uh, more than anything else like i wouldn't have like a meltdown and say she's a terrible person because i feel like she has a bad take on on society creators were hardly producing content of the highest order at this size but it was symptomatic of that desire to prove a point even when there wasn't one to be proven exactly so this one's cute it's a picture of a feminist father wearing a shirt explaining that when it comes to dating his daughter he doesn't make the rules. I don't make the rules. You don't make the rules. She makes the rules. Her body, her choice. Oh, right, yeah. That sounds fun. I mean, obviously, as a father, you want to make some general rules, but I'm assuming that's just in relation to, like, women have autonomy over their own body. 
um, kind of a point. So, you know, I wouldn't have a meltdown. Be like, well, technically, you're her father, so you make rules. Like, yes, he makes rules, like, when to go to fucking bed. But I think that we, like, a gen like somebody normal could understand what the fuck they're saying. And her daughter's boyfriend does not make the rules. So if you want to stick a blowtorch up his daughter's hole and tell her to pretend to be a Charmander, um, he's fine with that because it's her body. Uh, yeah. thank <laughs> Okay, yeah. Well, that's ex oh, yeah, you're right, Blair. That's exactly what most people would have went to. Exactly. Thank you for your contribution, Blair. Yes, in spite of the personal tone and story it's shared, so it feels like there is still a default back to a generic narrative employed by a lot of creators around that time. So it's really frustrating to me that we live in a climate where there's all this discussion of gender politics, and these conversations often include things like manspreading and mansplaining and catcalling, and we have this huge elephant in the room, 80% of suicide victims being male, and we're not talking about it. The hack need any way feminism bad or strained whataboutisms. Sure, the number of men who take their own lives is undoubtedly alarming, but I don't know why that has to be compared to a discussion about catcalling, a behavior which I have to admit I personally find rather grotesque. This is an example of what was indeed a greater problem in the community. What's wrong with cats? What are you talking about? No, I know it's it's not. I get what he's trying to say. Like it's not like it's not as if she's saying, "Hey, these two things are bad." It's more like knocking and saying cat calling isn't so bad because men have a higher rate of suicide. It, you don't have to invalidate one person's struggle to promote another one. At the time, but also one found on the channel, being that it felt like Blair was drawn towards conclusions that would serve a specific agenda. This may have been a case of tunnel vision. When reviewing certain arguments, it becomes rather apparent. You have to question the motive of a person who's willing to be abused, willing to stay in a bad situation, more than someone who- Wait, more people are concerned with why women stay in abuse first than why men are abusing women. Um, yeah, that's obviously a problem. I mean, the women, the reason women stay in a bad situation is because they feel like their life will be threatened, but also because we don't have robust systems to help people escape. And I'm not, I'm going to do it. I don't care if you guys like it or not, but I'm going to talk about universal basic income being really good for people who are stuck in abusive situations because it gives you like the money and the ability to escape those abusive situations, take a, a bus, drive somewhere else, get the fuck out of there. It allows people to set up communities where they feel comfortable. Um, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. That's one of my biggest selling points for universal basic income. That's one of the things I like a lot about it. Is for that it it helps oppressed people do what they need to do to help themselves. You know, like it's really nice. It's it's a really nice thing to like. Hey, we should set up more battered women shelters. Like, but okay, what if the shelter is too far away to get to, or costs too much money to get to, or etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera? Wouldn't it be better if a woman could just say, "Fuck this, I'm getting out of here," even if they spend money on a hotel for a couple nights while they figure shit out? I feel like that's better than setting up a bunch of bad like women shelters. I'm not saying women shelters are bad. I'm saying that they're. They're practically, in a, they're generally speaking, hard to be accessible for everybody, of course. I feel like that's not a hot take. Who's just a f***ing asshole who's going to hurt someone regardless of who it is. There had to be something more to play, something that would elevate herself above the rote anti-SJW commentator. Well, there was. Her unique perspective and identity, right? Well, going off the first few videos, it was hard to exactly see how this influenced her worldview. But this was all about to change very soon. You know, what are the ramifications of being called a hoe by 40 people? It'll affect your social life. Really quick, somebody, I, I can't just play the donations now. Thank you so much for the bits. Hey, Papa, the girl I asked said yes, we're going out this weekend. Just wanted to say thank you for the content. Also, say, well, oh, very good. I'm, I'm happy for you. If 40 men can call a woman a hoe, you'll believe it. But if 40 men call one man a rapist, you find it questionable. No, it's probably. Fair. It's embarrassing, probably. But what are the ramifications of being accused of being a rapist? You see, Blair's video responding to the feminist memes was an interesting one in particular because it definitely showcased a capacity for her to be a bit more certain. Yeah, I mean, obviously that one's shitty because, um, obviously there can be false, there's obviously can be false uh, accusations in general, right? And obviously being called like a rapist is worse than being called a hoe. But also if a bunch of people are saying this person is a rapist, there's... I think a reasonable assumption to make is that they might actually be that thing. It doesn't mean that we should just be like, yeah, that thing. We have to go off that. But no, but we could also be like, okay. Yeah. I get what they're saying. Why? I, it's just one of those things where, like, why would you react to that? I get, I don't know why. It's, uh, well, let's keep listening. Started. As stated, there was a mixture of tones in which creators addressed the subjects of their videos. In earlier uploads, whether you agreed with Blair's conclusions or not, she didn't seem outwardly hostile. But this in particular seemed to be a pivot towards the combative content often tied to some of the edgier creators in the genre. At the same time, though, they were memes, and you could argue that she was at least mirroring the same energy that many of them emanated. It wasn't a typical Blair White video. No. I think the video of interest comes a couple uploads later. Hey guys, so one of the things people ask me about 
pretty often is my opinion on the sort of long list of arbitrary, obscure gender identities that exist out in the world. Which video could this be? Maybe it's the one titled Trans Mentally Challenged. I will expand on why this is. Though once is how would she called it? Trans retarded? Oh my god. Again, mostly serving as casual grounds for our channel's hostess to spew opinions on a hot topic is also a very relevant video. As for the first time, Blair's opinion on many trans issues is coming to the forefront of her brand. So yeah, I think all these identities are largely bullshit. I think they're super arbitrary. I think they're... Well, like, I can, listen, I can understand that generally speaking, right? Like, hey, I understand. It depends on what she's talking about. But if she's talking about there being a slew of different genders, like, yeah, I find those generally arbitrary too. I mean, like male, female, non-binary, those make a lot of sense. I get it. But there does seem to be a creation of genders for no real discernible reason other than to feel unique. Like, I generally can agree with that. But the video title being overly provocative, obviously, is off-putting. I think it's gross. Um, but yeah, like I'm not gonna go off base. What all of you showed me is her saying like, yeah, there's a lot of gender identities. I don't like it. It's like, okay, I mean, it's fine. Super meaningless. I think people who take them on are usually extremely boring and have nothing else to their personality other than I'm Jesus. demi-queer, non-binary, gender special snowflake kin. And if you pay attention to these people, you'll notice that very rarely will you meet someone who identifies as one of these things who is not heavily involved in political activism to some extent. In the video, she dismisses individuals who lie outside true. the traditional gender binary, makes some pretty generalized presumptive comments about their status and motives for assuming such identities, and in general comes off as quite elitist. These people are usually middle class, white, never had to struggle with anything in their life, but they want to call themselves a suppressed sexual gender minority as a means to silence any type of opposition they have. And I don't know. I honestly kind of agree kind of fundamentally with the idea of there are people in privileged positions um, that do like to almost seem like they're a pri like I, I do think that there are some people that um, weaponize gender or not even weaponize gender. Like, I think it's a good thing to explore your gender. But like, uh, let's let's not pretend that there aren't people who are in a privileged space, generally speaking, and use gender identity as a way to be incredibly um, negative and provocative rather than trying to be educational about it. Like there are people, and I think that there's too many people who are just like real dicks about it and uh, about like, oh, you need to, I mean, you've obviously used gender people correctly, but I feel like we've met these people before. I don't think it's a hot take to say that there are some people who do this. So it's, I'm not super offended by it. I mean, she's being very off-putting and not very sensitive. Um, but yeah, there does seem to be like a correlate, like, like, uh, I don't know if I was going to relate something Antifa, for instance, seems to be a bunch of fucking white people that just want to cause problems and like burn down fucking buildings, which then just ends up blowing back on the black people. You know what I mean? That's almost how I would compare it to in some sense. In any type of political conversation. Yeah, Patricia Paytas, yeah. Trans trenders, sure, yeah. It seems to be like a lot of young kids in school, especially people who maybe they're exploring their gender, which is fine, but then they get a bit gatekeepy and toxic about it, which is something that a lot of kids do in general. I talk about it, I, I always say the same exact thing. I talk about it all the time. You know, when I was in school, I was very gatekeeping about metal music, so. Because in our current political climate, oppression is a very valuable currency. Now, I'm sure there are many responses one can formulate to our statements here, and comments that you and I are itching to make. But now, I would like to put a pin on it, as I think we best keep an open mind and merely say that it serves as a good precedent for the content that was to follow. That rather notable distaste that Blair seemed to possess for those who fell outside the acceptability range of traditional gender norms. Yes, and as I noted before, when approaching topics on previous discourse, even topics pertaining to gender, like the upload before, she seemed reasonable. But this was a turn, and this persisted in uploads following as well. Not just in her tone, but in her attitude towards others. And I will allow- did I, did I miss like a video? And this was on previous discourse, even topics. Uh, range of traditional gender norms. Yes, and as I it noted before, okay. when approaching topics on male victims are funny. Okay, I mean, I'm assuming that she's making commentary about how they're not funny. I, these seem fine. Previous discourse. I mean, some of them are ignorant pertaining to gender, like the upload before. She seemed reasonable. But I mean, yeah, there's some gender, like, ignorant perspectives, but so far I'm not shitting my pants. This was a turn, and this persisted in uploads following as well, not just in her tone, but in her attitude towards others. And I will elaborate here. I avoided explicitly mentioning the title of this upload, as it's not a term I tend to indulge. However, back then it was more than commonplace. In spite of this acknowledgement, Blair still weaponized it in a rather derogatory manner, and her subsequent uploads, although having more temperate titles, can often be found to have much more provocative captions at the time, thanks to Blair's extremely professional thumbnails, and thanks to the archives. For example, feminist thinks all men are rapists, or triggering transgender people. <sighs> Damn it, Blair, you really love a good slur in the worst of contexts. Oh, did she make a video called triggering... well, yeah. 
mean, that's obviously shitty. Why? I, yeah, why? why? Trans and thanks to the archives. For example, feminist thinks all men are rapists or... That one doesn't bother me as much as, like, the second one. Um, triggering transgender people. <sighs> Damn it, Blair, you really love a good slur in the worst of contexts. I'd like to say she rectified these out of remorse, but given the fact that she's left offensive terms and other okay. titles, I assume it was to try and stop YouTube from demonetizing or age restricting them. Because another place. Well, did she apologize? Does this person say they apologize for them? That she apologized for it, but she also thinking that maybe it's just to maintain ad revenue. I mean, I feel like didn't they just say that they apologize? I mean, I feel like if they apologized, you know, YouTube, I guess, was a top more toxic place back then. Um, so I suppose it's a different context than like today. If you upload something like that, it would very, obviously be very different. Since so she's changed them when there really was no offensive term, just a sensitive word, such as this one, where I assume racist obviously set off the YouTube alarm. So Blair, in a state of pure Minorities. indolence, changed the. Minorities can be racist. Get over it. Okay, they. I guess yeah. You know, people of color can be racist. Sure. Okay. Ah, people are gonna have a meltdown. Be like, no, you don't understand. Like, I'm not gonna engage in the you know the conversation you know what i mean like it's not that it's not a super hot take to have a difference in opinion on the definition of racism the title to just minorities but as amusing as that is i will move on That's for now weird as said, this era was a curious one for sure, particularly for the political community online. It was one where many felt free from the shackles that had bound them in real life environments, and some clearly felt a catharsis in expressing themselves in a more unabashed manner. Nonetheless, I think some of these creators listened to a bit too much Ice Cube and drew the conclusion that a black person exclaiming the N-word on a rap track gave them license to start directing their- Hold on. Oh my god. I gotta get new headphones, they're so fucking uncomfortable. You don't- I don't understand Blair using the T-word being offensive since that's what they call themselves. Um, I think that she was doing it in order to get a rise out of other trans people because she has a difference in opinion and so she wanted to be provocative for views is probably what it was. Decently sized platforms towards other creators and barraging them with a slew of pretty relentless content fortified by slurs that they felt more comfortable firing off due to their identity. This wasn't exclusive to Blair. Darren, for example, was another person who engaged in similar antics. However, the fact that many of these comments or insults were often used in exclusionary or alienating fashion against people who may have personal history with those words didn't really justify it. So Cat Black's a YouTuber who's about as balls deep in Tumblr social justice as one could possibly get, and balls deep is appropriate because she's a trans. 100% comedy from uh, Blair White over yeah. here. You can tell that she would have surely become a stand-up if she had not pursued political commentary. But in a way where some may dismiss this as pointless edginess, critics would often see it as part of a greater ruse, which would be observed in other videos, with one garnering particular personal heat from myself. Yes, after making multiple response videos to contents that our queen had decreed as cringe, it seems that Miss White had her finger on the pulse of so many of those around her. So today I want to talk about why people don't like trans. I've received thousands upon thousands of emails, comments, messages from people why? saying that before finding my channel, they had absolutely no understanding of trans people and that they were shocked to find a trans person who was actually sane. In this lovely upload, once again, amended to have a more restrained headline, she decides to discuss exactly what the public's problems are with the transgender community. Firstly, mentioning about her experiences with many people who previously weren't aware of the existence of sane transgender people until they encountered the wonders of Blair White. Because let's just face it, the majority of the ideas and policies and things that come out of the trans community and the activists that they prop up to see for them in the public sphere are insane. I mean, I personally sometimes feel like I'm just drowning in this huge crowd of who are screaming and crying about 97 genders, and I'm just in the back like- Yeah, I mean, everything was fine until the invalidating term, like using that term. I don't really understand that. Uh, there's no there's no justifiable reason for that. It's just being provocative. I guess she thinks that because she's trans, it's okay. And I guess it makes it more okay than a non-trans person saying it, but it's still shitty and it's just meant to piss people off. And it's really just meant to get people to click. That's what it's all about. Um, there's no need for it. I mean, that's invalidating to her own fucking rhetoric right? because it's just intentionally divisive for what fucking reason? Like, I'm not one of them. The transgender community then becomes this buzzword and Blair once more sets herself apart, affirming her opposition to Bill C-16, for example, the controversial Canadian one that saw the rise of Jordan Peterson. And in this, she also calls out the transgender community on other incidents, such as one where trans activists were allegedly pressuring the midwife community into using gender neutral terminology, referencing an Infowars article, which could have used a little research in itself, because most evidence appears to imply that there was little to no evidence of any pressure being applied at all. But okay, that's one reference. We'll put that aside for now. Her point is clear enough regardless. But I'm sorry, like I said, acceptance is a two-way street and behaving like insufferable children who place emotion-based arguments over fact-based arguments is not a way to get anything done. There was a moment in time where Blair White just wanted to grill, but that was no longer an option. And in taking a stand against these trans activists who were making all these unreasonable demands of society, she was proving that transgender people weren't this monolith that many had previously assumed them to be. But was anyone ever saying this? And was Blair's narrative really as altruistic as it appeared to be?
instead of arguing for the validity of transgenderism on a neurological or physiological level, you guys instead give up and start screaming and crying about how there's 97 genders. It's like, calm down, calm it down. The examples covered in my previous part may have found Blair approaching the aspects of trans issues from different angles, but they all seem to transport me back to the school playground in a way, and I'll explain why in a moment. The channel was always a very personal venture, and this upload was no exception, because although she proclaims that she is attempting to decipher the issue from within the community, she mostly uses it as a springboard to pat herself on the back and tell people who aren't like her to calm down. And need I remind you that America and Western civilization in general is the pinnacle of safety and freedom for trans people. I mean, I don't know what context she's saying that in. But yeah, you know, it does seem like, I mean, she has the passable privilege. I know that sounds like a meme, but it is a real thing. It sounds like she's uses like, she very clearly has a different experience than other trans people. And I think that the reason that she's so open and okay with using that, the T slur is because she probably never really experienced it in a negative way. I don't really know where she grew up. Where did Flair White grow up? But clearly it wasn't a sphere that she felt uncomfortable in. Um... And by the way, that statement is actually true. So for her, it's not really, I would imagine it's not something that triggers her because it, she probably never got it called, said to her in a derogatory uh, term or derogatory way that was super impactful. Uh, I, that's the only thing I could surmise. Maybe I'm wrong. So that's just a weird level of insensitivity there for every group of people under the sun. As a trans person, you can't step foot in a single Middle Eastern country without fear of being jailed or worse. And the same goes for pretty much. Well, sure, uh, that's true, right? I get it. I get what they're saying, but also it's one of those things where it's like, well, why are you saying that? Are you saying that um, it's, the, I don't know, that the trans people are more accepted in America or the, in the, the Western world to talk about how poorly trans people are being treated in other countries? Or are you using it as a way to si like try to silence people who are talking about how they still feel face persecution? Because I'm assuming it's the latter, which is obviously like shitty. Much every African country in America, you have access to transgender medical care, the ability to legally amend Some people your gender. Do. Fancy a relative probation, Blair. Basic bitch logic. Come on. Is that? I think there's a lot more people out there who are opposed to the back crazy ideas and policies that come out of the trans community and their activists, rather than trans people themselves. Because let's just face it, the majority of the ideas and policies and things that come out of the trans community and the activists that they prop up to speak for them in the public sphere are insane. I think it was tan. Is that true though, or is that just like an online space? I feel like that's not generally true. So far, I think that she's just kind of dumb. Time, people have received an impression of leftism, or at least certain branches of leftism, due to chronicled attitudes of certain activists. However, to extend that logic to entire demographics and identity groups was ludicrous. All in all, it felt part of a greater narrative. Which, aside from being rather egotistical, like, come on, you started your channel after appearing on stream with a transgender woman who espoused similar talking points at the time, it felt like an attempt to cater to people to win over their approval by being the quote cool transgender person. This may be impudent for me to say, but it felt like the goal. Um, of I mean, maybe that was her goal. I, I don't, I don't know, because that's effectively. It, it's possible that she's some form of grifter that doesn't really believe what she's saying but so far based off of the, what i've been seeing it just seems like she's disconnected from the general trans experience um, and she's saying that because she's a trans person that hasn't faced a particular experience then that experience is, is just being overhyped and over exaggerated that's what it says to me i don't know that i think that she actually thinks these things i don't think that she's just like full of shit you know what i mean Dean Blair was her own acceptance rather than acceptance of the greater community. On Twitter and YouTube, she would present herself as the emissary, but I don't think the opposite could have been more true in a way. It felt like a playground where she was trying to fit in with a certain clique by ostracizing others, by proving that she was worthy, almost like initiation. I think it probably has more to do with like a general social media phenomenon of people getting reaction from a particular group and then just giving into it too much. You know, I think that she fell victim to, she was a conservative, she was a, a trans conservative and other tr conservatives probably liked her. So when she spoke more hyperbolically towards um, progressive people, she got positive attention from her conservative audience and she allowed that to take her and run with it. And I've been, I've done that as well on TikTok for a short period. Um, like it's shitty. I feel like I got lucky in not engaging in that behavior for a super long time. It was only like a, maybe a month or so. And then I got, I snapped out of it and was able to get back on my own roots. And so I don't, you know, with the context there, I'm not super harsh on people who do dumb shit like that. You know, it, it happens to a lot of people. I mean, we just watched a video on Nikocado Avocado. Same thing, I think, with him. It's just in the direction of making him really unhealthy.
investigation. In response to this, you could say that, okay, the mainstream was a lot of the time the intolerant progressive lot. And maybe at her university, it was. I'm happy to entertain that. But on YouTube, it was a very different story. And once you take advantage of the power that you have to belittle others in your own domain, then you're no better than those you chastise so fervently. This can be embodied more than it is in the title. Once again, Blair had initially and quite ironically used a slur in presenting why some people just don't really like transgender individuals. Now, yeah, like, the, 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 yeah, it's just unnecessary to use that language. It's pathetic. Some transgender individuals may be okay or comfortable with that, but many aren't. And already addressing a group of people in such a way is going to breed division and provocation. Really, you can make the argument that Blair was validating using slurs in such a manner. That's only really going to win one side over and provoke the other. And when they are inevitably provoked, Blair will just tell them to calm down again and high five all her edgy friends. Having someone who set the bar so low for trans acceptance could make it easy for people to accept her and reject other trans people who in many ways weren't making unbelievably preposterous demands from those around them. And you could make the argument that those people were never going to accept other transgender individuals regardless, and that Blair was at least making some level of acceptance somewhat accessible. Maybe she provided a ramp into the transgender community. I think this would be a somewhat banter response on the surface, and that in many ways, Blair's position as a moderate could have been used to facilitate discourse between two separate camps. Well, so far she doesn't seem particularly moderate. She seems like an inflammatory dickhead. But this never fully materialized because she only aligned herself with the ideas of one of them. And Blair never really made an effort to facilitate acceptance of people, sometimes quite the opposite. In fact, because her own bar of acceptance was high and sometimes rather uneven, and would lead one to wonder what sort of environment her own principles would lead to. Case in point, the following situation. Would you date someone who's trans? No. Would you date someone who's black? Maybe. Would you date someone who's fat? No. I saw that whole video, and that video, like, that, that person said some kind of disagreeable things you date someone who's disabled no one of the common recipients of blair white yeah i mean i understand like those so i would need to see more context because i mean obviously what's the frame like i i don't see a problem with somebody like i wouldn't date it like i didn't see a problem with her saying she wouldn't date a fat person so i don't see a problem with people like yeah i wouldn't date a trans person okay or a fat person or a disabled person i get it you know we're picking our mates you want somebody that more closely aligns with you um yeah i don't really that one doesn't really trigger me too much. My responses was created by the name of Riley Dennis. She was known for her takes at the time, which many found contentious, particularly given the era where she posted a preponderance of her political opinions in. I have to admit that I disagreed with a lot of what she had to say at the time, and I still probably wouldn't align with a fair proportion of what she said then today. However, disagreement is a healthy constituent of academic discourse, and the online sphere should be fertile ground to nurture production. Glasses, bro. They're getting like pushed out of position because of the fucking thing. I gotta get new headphones or Such something. A discussion. How the Blair's demeanor towards Riley isn't what one would always characterize as well healthy. The first video released on Blair's thoughts on trans special people is a response to a now deleted Riley Dennis video, which asserts that feminism isn't about hating men, amongst many other things. At this point, Riley was identifying. I'm gonna do something real quick because I need to be able to like see this better. So I wanna do that. And I'm gonna make it smaller for you guys so it's not super in your. Are dating trans? Okay, are trans are dating preferences discriminatory? Okay. As a non-binary trans woman, however, throughout the video, Blair refers to Riley as a he for reasons that are not explicitly clarified. But one can Why? assume are in line with those expressed in the upload prior. I can't believe it's 2016 and we still have to talk about this. Okay, right off the bat, he's using the current year as an argument. Why call a trans person he? What's that's like that? Why? Were they non-binary and used any label? Even if that's true, I don't think it's an unreasonable assumption to make that Blair was trying to, I mean, lack of a better term, trigger that person uh, by misgendering them. It seems just like a shitty, childish tactic. No, she clarified that she calls her he because they put no effort into transitioning. First of all, that person is fairly passable. Second of all, um, I mean, that's just not true. Like what? That that person put pretty tremendous effort into transitioning. It sounds like uh, she's upholding this idea that you have to be like incredibly passable just to pass. I don't know. That seems like a bullshit uh, response, like excuse. I don't really agree with that at all. It seems like she's just being a dick. That's what her reasoning was. Yeah, she's an asshole. In another video where she contends Riley's assertion that misgendering is violence, Blair generally avoids referring well, to- Well, I mean, I don't think misgendering is violence, per se. I mean, well, I guess it depends on the sphere you're in, or what the- how somebody's misgendering. Like, I wouldn't call this violent misgendering. I suppose there could be instances of that. Um, but, like, whatever. 
Riley under any pronouns whatsoever, an option she probably thought was decidedly smarter given the topic. After concluding that misgendering is not violence but still a dick move, she takes the time to express her feelings on the matter of Riley's gender. And Riley, you seem to be really upset that people don't refer to you as she everywhere you go, but can you really blame them? Like honestly, you call yourself a woman and a trans woman, but you actively talk about how you won't take hormones? And hormone therapy and surgery in some cases are what's actually going to give you those secondary sex characteristics. Okay, I just have to stop it because it's pissing me off. I, I need to explain to people why that's such a dumb is why that's a dumb thing <laughs> to, to think okay so i've talked to uh a, a particular i talked to a therapist who specializes in um you know doing therapy with, with trans people and helping them transition and it was a very enlightening experience and we talked a lot about um how how it works and generally speaking the way it works is um when somebody identifies as trans and they come in and they get diagnosed with gender dysphoria what you do is you will set their expectation for what they want to look like and then you will slowly have them meet that goal while you have them rein in their um expectations right and so the idea is like if let's say you uh, let's say i wanted to look like um who's a popular woman why can't I think this is the weirdest thing? I can't think of like a popular a woman. I don't know. I want to look like fucking Margot Robbie. There we go. Now, obviously, because I'm six foot four, I probably wouldn't be able to look like Margot Robbie. So my therapist would help me um, make steps towards looking like her while also reining in my experiences and keeping my expectations reasonable to a point where I was treated. You know, where I was happy and comfortable. That's the whole goal when you have gender dysphoria is to be happy. And so that means different things for different people. So if you're a trans person with the, I mean, I would assume they have diagnosable gender dysphoria, whatever. Their goal isn't to look like a look like what uh, you would expect society to call a girl. It's to be happy. Like that's the whole fucking point, right? Like there's people who have gender dysphoria who have, are actually are able to be happy identifying with their birth sex. That's a real thing. That's a, that's a factor. It's actually a real thing. Um, that's, that's an outlier. But so the idea that you should forcefully continue your transition just so that society will accept you, I find it very ignorant and shitty. Oh, Mama Guts in here. She said, my boss from the network said to pick a woman from the food court at the mall. Is that how they do it? You pick like somebody a little more realistic. Okay, but you get my point. I think that I made a, a pretty good point. Also, the women at the food court are fucking disgusting. I'm just kidding. They're very beautiful when you're there, Mama Gut, because you're there. <laughs> Give me kisses tonight. ...that allow people to visually perceive you as a woman, even if you are biologically male. Now, our statements on what Riley said are completely false, but we'll cross that bridge soon. We have other antics to address first. In tweets around this time, Blair was still taking more than enough liberties on labeling Riley under male pronouns, once more reaffirming her sentiments on the transition and proudly undermining any neutrality conveyed in that YouTube video. And a couple months later, Blair returned back to using male pronouns in her upload. In spite of this, Blair had also still used a heralded transgender slur in titles referring to Riley's uploads, which I find surprising if she didn't actually believe Riley to be transgender, really having your cake and eating it there. I have to say that I found what was flip-flopping at best and straight-up self-contradiction at worst, and some other things as well, rather confusing. Is this what bridging the gap looks like? Well, maybe that's not what it appears. Maybe over time, Blair worked up this theory in her head regarding Riley, and in an upload posted to YouTube on June the 18th, 2017, her theories come to the forefront of the commentary, with multiple backhanded comments about Blair's thoughts on the verity of Riley's gender identity. Identity. What were these thoughts? Okay, Riley, I know you're having trouble with this whole transition thing, mainly that you haven't done it. You know, if you went on estrogen, your sex drive wouldn't be so high and you wouldn't be guilt tripping people and having sex with you. Just say. Jesus Christ. If anyone Christ. calls you a white supremacist, you deny it. If anyone accuses you of guilt tripping lesbians into sucking your dick by saying you're trans, deny it. Blair's suspicions were. What the fuck just happened? Was that a thing that happened? Was that person trying to guilt trip people? I feel like we we're missing context, but also that's a horrible thing to say very clear. Riley's existence as a trans person was merely political and self-serving, and that in time this would be revealed as she wouldn't follow through on her transitioning properly. Why won't Riley take the estrogen, and what would it tell us about her? Ooh, well... Hey everybody, so today, the day this video is going live, I'm going to be on my way to San Francisco in preparation for my facial feminization surgery, or FFS for short. Somebody was about to have their well-deliberated theory swiftly debunked. Li well, not even, uh, dude, not for nothing, I don't even really... I don't know, because I don't know the situation too well, but either this person decided to, I don't know, um, transition more because that's what they wanted to do, 
Or it's even possible what would make Blair White more disgusting is Blair White bullied them into feeling like they had to transition more just to seem more passable, which I wouldn't count out. That would be horrible. I honestly think that it's possible that that might be something that she decided to do. Got bullied into transitioning more? That's fucked up, man. I don't know. I'm, I'm speculating. I'm just saying it's possible. Leaving us to wonder if these playground hijinks were really worthwhile. In the original video, Riley said, if you don't date trans people, you're a homophobe. I think they meant transphobic, or, but maybe... Okay, yeah, no, she can be kind of dumb, but also be the victim of Blair White. What, do they have multiple people editing different chapters? That's clever and interesting. Okay. Several large YouTubers have been peddling the myth that I'm not really trans for well over a year now. They say I'm not a- I'm not gonna lie, she's just kinda attractive. She's not bad looking, you know? True trans because they claim I'm not taking any steps to transition, like not taking hormones and not having surgery. On June the 26th, 2017, Riley Dennis would upload a video, basically expressing what I would say to the theories advocated by Blair and others in the community around this time, that it's none of their f***ing business, and that her status as a trans person shouldn't depend on what procedures she's embarking on. These people who vehemently hate me and make videos misgendering me and insulting me and making assumptions about my personal life, they feel entitled to information about my personal life. But I don't owe them that. I don't owe anyone that. What happens in my personal life is nobody's business but my own. What medications I take, what surgeries I have, what steps I take to transition, all of that is my business and nobody else is entitled to that. Especially not strangers on the internet. I have every right to keep all of that information to myself. Being trans is not defined by hormones or surgery. Surgeries and hormones do not change your gender identity. External things like that do not affect your internal sense of gender, which is what being trans is. So I don't want this to come across as me trying to prove that I'm a good trans now. I will be just as trans after FFS as I was before FFS, and I refuse to throw other trans- Well, yeah, the whole point of doing something like that would to make you personally more comfortable with yourself. Again, it's about making yourself happy more than anything else people under the bus just because they don't take hormones or haven't had surgery or don't pass because I think that's a really gross way of gatekeeping who's allowed in the trans community. However, it doesn't stop there because Riley also reveals that she will be actively undergoing facial feminization surgery in the next few weeks and had already been receiving hormone replacement therapy for almost a year, leaving those like Blair who had been chastising Riley pretty ferociously in the public sphere and all these theories out to dry. I'll add that our progressive friend here didn't come unprepared, dropping an ample sum of receipts to reinforce just how unsubstantiated many of these claims made about her identity were. All these claims by other YouTubers that I have been on hormones were just completely fabricated lies not based in anything I've ever said. In fact, a couple months ago, I got really worried about this. I knew that I hadn't talked about hormones since I had started them, but I thought maybe I had said something before that. So I searched through my Twitter timeline for any mentions of hormones or HRT, and I only found two tweets where I talked about hormones in relation to myself. One was from over a year ago, and I said I was planning on starting hormones as soon as I moved back to the US. The second one was also from over a year ago, and it was me saying that I was planning to start HRT soon. That's it. Those are the only times I've ever tweeted about hormones or HRT in relation to my I wonder where Blair White got this narrative from then to be honest like, so it's either because I doubt that she just like she didn't I doubt that she knew that Riley was trying to transition and decided to lie about it so that means that they constructed this somehow so either somebody said that to them or they looked at Riley and said well you're not very passable in my opinion so I'm going to invalidate you um, by saying that you're not trying to you know do anything that's also quite possible. What the fuck is this thing? Whatever. Myself. And I was literally saying that I was planning to take hormones. Anybody who took half a second to search through my Twitter could have found this information. So I think I'm going to be starting hormones. Well, it probably would have taken longer than a second. You, you've only had two of them. I'm just, but either way, you know. Um, I don't know about surgeries or anything like that yet. Um, it's all kind of up in the air for me. But I have proof from YouTube and Twitter that I'm right and they're wrong. They've been maliciously and intentionally spreading lies about me. Obviously, at approximately half an hour in total, there's a little more discussed than what I've spoke about now. But as a scaling clap back to many of the conspiracists, the video served its purpose, placing the ball quite squarely back into Blair's court. Now, as Riley had indicated, Blair wasn't the sole proponent of this narrative. However, as a reasonably sized creator and a transgender woman herself, it was pretty imperative that this little blunder be addressed. So on June the 20th, night three days after Riley's shocking revelations Blair uploads I'm sorry okay so this is a video that I really did not expect to ever make ever 
but those are always the most interesting ones, right? In this video, Blair takes responsibility for advancing the narrative that Riley was what many at the time regarded as a trans trender, the political leeches. However, she also expands on the reasoning for what led her to such conclusion, which I personally find a little dubious. One of the biggest things that I took issue with was that I assumed that Riley was taking on a transgender identity and label for political purposes. Uh, transgender. Now, I had a lot of reasons to believe this. The first Wait, being what? statements from Riley about growing up and never questioning their gender. As a trans person myself, that's very weird to hear um, because growing up, my earliest memories in life were that of questioning my gender and of questioning the gender role that I was expected to fill. So as a trans person, I couldn't get in the headspace of what? How did you never? Well, it kind of makes sense. Okay, so I don't know where she's coming from. It seems like Blair White grew up in a more conservative space. So maybe, um, you know, the, what gender was and what it meant to her was pushed more heavily by her family. Whereas this other person might have grown up in a more like liberal, liberal or for, or what do you say, forgiving space? I guess that is a better way to say it. And so maybe they didn't question it so much because it wasn't put in the forefront of everything going on in their life. So I suppose that's possible. Okay. Never question it. Another example is Riley's statements that trans people don't always want to transition. And again, as a trans person who's known many trans people. I couldn't wrap my head around that because for me, the transition was incredibly paramount. It was the key to me living the fulfilled life that I live now. I was also under the assumption, as hundreds of thousands of other people were, that Riley had no desire to transition and that Riley was not transitioning. That Riley was just taking on the label of trans with no real action behind it. In retrospect, it's easy to say these justifications seem rather flimsy. Anyone may grow up without questioning certain aspects of their identity, particularly in certain environments, and to doubt the veracity of a person's gender because they have the courage to admit that seems extremely cynical. And Blair's other reason, basically being that she went along with the mass consensus is barely a reason at all. Nonetheless, she had to explain her rationale whether it made sense or not. If that was the impression she received, then so be it. And once that was out of the way, she cut the chase. And to be fair, her reflection is pretty strong and suitably self-critical. But the incessant push to prove that Riley was not trans, and just realizing was probably really hurtful. And I'm aware that there's no way I would have known before the video where Riley actually discloses this information, but I feel like I was still in the wrong for trying to assume what was in someone's heart and mind when there was just simply no way I could have known. And make no mistake, it should have been. In many ways, it was starting to sink in that there was a toxicity in this online community that she was contributing to. Beyond just the narratives of making assumptions about transgender individuals, deciding who was truly trans or not, there are other statements she had made. For example, this one towards fellow trans woman Steph Sanjati in 2016. I don't understand why she comes to the appearance of a trans girl, but she obviously has no idea what she's doing. Are you joking? You're a fucking linebacker. Um, Jesus, that's fucked up. Uh, oh, well, what's the context here? Is she making... I, I, so this person said, I don't understand why she comes for the appearance of other trans girls when she obviously has no idea what she's doing. What does that mean? Like, oh, maybe they're telling Blair White she's not passable. That's what kind of the subtext there. Um, and then Blair White was like, oh, you look like a fucking linebacker as like a criticism. Okay, that's that's interesting. All right. When Steph tagged another trans woman to ask why Blair has to attack their appearance when she clearly has no clue what she's doing, Blair decides to jump in on the statement to inform Steph that she looks like a linebacker. It's so extra and unnecessary. In this specific case, I think Blair misconstrued Steph's comment as an attack on her appearance rather than just going out of her way to offend. But it was indicative of how antagonistic she had become, how skeptical her own perception was. It's so interesting. She grew up in a conservative household and yet she doesn't seem to have faced like, a lot of persecution for being trans. I wonder how many of those she shared experiences with Watts. A much worse situation included her making a rather mean-spirited comment in response to a video by a person who was posting about her own experiences. Once again, going at her ability to pass as a woman. So one thing has become pretty apparent since starting my YouTube channel, and that is that the trans community hates me. Throughout her time on YouTube, she had made yeah, a deal about why. being the public enemy of many of these trans women, how they hated her, how some couldn't be as good looking, how they weren't as pretty. And beyond all the complex theories that could arise as to why she did this, it was simply rather catty behavior. As her platform grew, having such a demeanor that could influence the actions of viewers, particularly towards the subjects of her videos, some of whom transgender, this could easily cause unintended grief, and Blair wouldn't want that, especially as someone who would experience that personally. With reference to the video about misgendering, she was at risk of becoming everything she had criticized in the past. At the end of the day, personal ideology transcends identity. So singling transgender people out in the way that Blair did on the basis of political disagreements alone wasn't really the most salubrious for either party. And I'm someone who's had my transition picked apart online. There have been Reddit threads and 4chan threads with hundreds of comments on it of people trying to prove that I'm not trans because I haven't done this or that or, you That's know, kind of fault, digging up huh? my old pictures and, you know, I'm a strong person, I'm a happy person, but to sit here and pretend like it doesn't affect me at all would just be a lie. So the thought that this entire so why to do that to why do that to somebody else then? That's so fucking ridiculous to me. Your time, I've done that exact same thing to someone else, and push that off on someone else. F with me. And 
fucking sorry. Now, I think there were some who probably doubted the sincerity of this apology. At the end of the day, this was a narrative maintained over a year by an individual who, given her own self-admitted personal experiences, should have known better. However, at the same time, as a person who did have some authority within the community, speaking out on the matter would at least cause some to listen to her, who may not otherwise relented. Maybe the growth and the community she was in had taken her on a bit of a power trip, and this was the warranted yank back down to earth she needed. You know, this whole thing has really taught me a lesson that I should really try to stick to ideas, opinions, policy, rather than like trying to get in someone's head and like make judgments about something that's so personal and so Yes. Yeah. To many, this appeared to be a turning point in Blair's content, as she committed to making her videos more focused on their political roots and gravitating away from the petty remarks and character judgments that had landed her in hot water this time. Whether That's Riley accepted good. it herself, we'll never know, though she did upload a video just over a month later discussing how to make a good apology video. Although not mentioning Blair's video at any point and using a different example completely to illuminate her thesis, it was a bit coincidental for some and seemingly reignited the feud between the two creators, even causing the video to be temporarily taken down in the process due to flagging. Fantastic. But deep breaths. Blair still had a new leaf to turn over. We were going to talk about political content, and a bit of a Twitter spat between old nemeses isn't substantial enough to say that she had returned to old habits. No. As the content went, it looked like there was a new direction for Blair. And to be honest, maybe it was the fresh start she needed. Hmm. I'm going to open this part by at least defending Blair White to a certain degree. I know, I even surprise myself sometimes. As much as I have detailed aspects of her channel and her behavior in a pretty critical light, it's important to recognize the zeitgeist and how that may have influenced her comportment. I know that to many people, even myself, that it may have seemed like she was pandering to seek approval from the online crowd, but throughout that period, and even up to this day, one of the prevalent narratives espoused by individuals from within this realm was that these ideas were the counterculture, that this was a pushback against the mainstream ideologies enforced by oppressive neo terrorists who didn't even want to allow room for discussion. Blair had been there herself. She'd set foot in the liberal university campuses and encountered that environment firsthand. That edginess that some wanted to shut down was part of that movement. It was greater back then. In her own mind, Blair may have felt she was the one fighting back by saying what she said. She was joining the resistance, and this attitude that she adopted was part of that movement. That she wasn't pandering, she was adapting, and many other people did the same. Channels from all genres probably said stuff they would never be caught saying today. Many commentators being no exception. Here, the idea lingered that maybe some of Blair's antics were in part a product of their era, like some of the other creators who had yeah, also probably. been in that position as well and had since reformed themselves. How this would only be answered by a content and how it would develop in relation to the evolving YouTube ecosystem. With the observed instant grounding her, this would definitely be a chance to realign those values. I'm not infallible. I've definitely, you know, over the course of doing political commentary for the past almost two years, I know I've probably said things that are not true, thinking they were true. I've definitely accidentally spread fake news, and I'm definitely not calling myself a fact machine. 2017 was an interesting time. In my opinion, it was when the pushback against presiding anti-SJW narratives on YouTube began to gather momentum. And the science says we're all on a spectrum. Um, no. Um... Yeah. This didn't necessarily quell the strength of certain commentators, but it definitely meant that a lot of discourse appeared to grow more balanced, with certain perspectives no longer going unchallenged. Alongside this, with certain US policy in particular skewing in concerning directions, it became more difficult for some to argue that conservatism was this oppressed political underdog. However, there was never an absence of content to on online, for a creator of any leading, and Blair was never star for content. Blair never positioned herself as a disillusioned liberal like some of her colleagues. She was a conservative and rather proud of that. Nonetheless, there were a few key issues that she liked to weigh in on. Ones that didn't necessarily fall too clearly on a liberal conservative spectrum, more coming down to questions of common sense. And in the months following her apology to Riley Dennis, she appeared to readjust her trajectory to present a more balanced perspective on political affairs that would reflect the current landscape. According to police reports and not sensationalized headlines, this occurred in a private residence in an apartment and it just happened to have occurred in a bathroom. And the person was a family friend. It was not stranger danger. It was not stranger trannies in the bathroom gonna get you danger. It just wasn't. Ian Miles Chong claimed straight up that it happened in a public bathroom. For example, this video corrects misinformation surrounding a transgender individual convicted of sexual assault and the factually incorrect claims made by some on the right that this had occurred in a public restroom. Or we could talk about the upload at the start of 2018, where she reacted to some of her older content that she no longer associates with, and although still being somewhat mitigated in her self-criticism, still demonstrates awareness of her errors. So there's been a bunch of pictures and videos that have come out that have led people to believe that she has some sort of neurological disorder or, you know, she's generally just unfit to be president because she's ill. By the way, I still think Hillary Clinton is actually the devil, but I regret doing this video. She may have very well been sick but the evidence I used in this video is reaching at best. It's so flimsy, it's so weak, 
and I'm surprised more people didn't call me out on it, honestly. All of these examples show growth from previous instance, hopefully allowing her to move towards being a more recent and independent voice within the community. Throughout this period, Blair also seemed to pivot back towards more introspective videos that spoke about her personal life and development in her transition. There was a fair bit that warranted praise, and I don't want to understate that. At the same time, there were still signs that aspects of her content indulged perspectives without being fully transparent in the delivery of that information, such as the Trump hat in Hollywood video. Hey guys, so today is a bit of a different kind of video. We're doing a social experiment video. You guys know I've been doing on the street stuff, and Joey and I hey. had this sick idea of walking around West Hollywood, which is the gay area of Hollywood, and just, you know, wearing a little hat that we think people will be really upset about. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so stupid. I mean, it's whatever. I think those kind of videos are dumb, but oh, okay. Now, on the surface, this is a standard intolerant left video. And obviously, when witnessing violence against someone, many would feel naturally shocked. In the description, a disclaimer sits informing viewers that Blair and her partner did not act in any way that would have provoked the attacks, implying the hats were the only variable of interest here. This caught the eye of many on social media given its content and led to some circulation and interest from those outside her typical audience. Nonetheless, this also reached the fact-checking website Snopeskin, who contacted the Los Angeles Police Department and were informed that Blair and her husband had crossed a dividing line set up specifically to prevent any physical altercation. Now, does this justify the behavior of those depicted in the video? No. no. But at the same time, it's hardly wearing a Trump hat in Hollywood, moreover wearing well... it to an anti-Trump protest. Uh, well, okay. I get what they're saying, that they set up a divider um, to, you know, I guess keep people safe. It's like, hey, don't cross this line because then things might get crazy. You know, it makes, if you're going to have your political whatever, make sure you do it uh, on your side of the fence. But also, I I don't know, because the, the, the suggestions here seems to be like, yeah, she kind of did. It was kind of her fault. I don't think that it was kind of her fault. I don't. I, she crossed the line literally but not figuratively um i don't know i just i wouldn't take the perspective like well you should you know well you shouldn't have crossed the line obviously it was a dumb thing to do but you get assaulted because of it so it's just silly I'll add the caveat that she does have a drink thrown in her face at the end of the video, which, although Snopes cast suspicion on comparing her to Alex Jones, I don't really think is completely fair, and could well have happened. At the same time, given the framing, doubt is obviously going to be inevitable, and given how heavily edited the video is, it's hard to arbitrate exactly what happened. But maybe that's just clickbait for you. Nonetheless, certain concerns harbored go beyond a single video. Now, these other beasts... <laughs> Let me not say beasts, but these other people who are pressuring people to be with them is gross. Yes, I'd say there are still comments present that showcased her rather flippant beasts. nature and desire to one-up those she viewed unfavorably. But these were aside and a far cry from what she had perpetuated in the past. We can all be divas from time to time, can't we? I mean, let's be honest. Most of the people who complain about this kind of thing are the worst people. The most undateable, cringy, miserable individuals. Just very tacky. Well, I don't know. But as we move further into 2018, she's... Well, I mean, she's talking about their appearance as shitty, but it seems like she's just kind of talking and shit about... They're annoying people. Maybe that's why they don't want to date them. Okay, whatever. She seemed to distance herself more and more from the political community that she had previously shared propinquity with. Her content gravitated towards topics that felt more blog oriented in a way, and this inevitably yielded some questions from viewers who were familiar with her more outspoken self. Although I think many were expecting a new direction, this certainly was a different flavor. Eventually, she'd upload a video explaining exactly why she'd done this and the reasons behind it. And to be fair to her, many of them seemed quite justified and believable. So the simplest answer as to why I've steered away from politics, at least recently, and at least for now, maybe not forever, is that, quite frankly, I guess just the best way to put it is politics and political commentary specifically has effed up my life. <laughs> the FBI incident, the going out in public and having people try to fight me, the uh, doxing, the stalking, the people entering my building, all that kind of stuff. Um, my family being harassed and, you know, I am at such a place where I feel like, has it been worth it? I moved yeah, I to that. LA almost a year ago. And one thing about LA is there's a lot of work here. So a lot of other political commentators, other people who you guys know, I'm not talking about obscure people here. A lot of them either live in LA or they're constantly in and out for work, filming something, doing whatever they do. Um, so I've met almost all of them. People have either been on their show or on a show with them, or I went to a dinner with them, an event with them, or I became close with some of them. The amount of them that I've met that have told me either directly or in a roundabout way that's very clear, um, that they don't believe everything that they say that they believe when they're on camera. A lot of them just flat out don't believe. <laughs> they're just actors. Mm. Grifters, threats, doxers, they're all plausible in such a polarizing community with such potential. And if you can't handle that, then it's understandable that you'd want to take a step back. It'd make anyone feel rather dirty once they've been exposed to it long enough. And the video itself feels like Blair finally washing her hands of such toxicity. This was the movement we needed. It comes in such extremes, it's like something really amazing will happen and I'll get like the coolest opportunity ever, but then something really effing terrible will happen. And it's these crazy highs and lows that I feel like are a lot more extreme than if I just did other types of content that make me equally as happy, you know? But were those hands as clean as they appeared? Hmm.
that venting session was so necessary. When I say it was so necessary, it was so necessary. Mwah, it it felt amazing. The video about why Blair Chain seemed pretty conclusive in the moment, rather scathing towards many aspects of the community and even the media beyond that, ending on a rather affirmative note that would cause many to assume that she was mostly finished with political content, at least for a while. And it's just not a world that I feel super comfortable in. Do I still care very much about politics? Absolutely. But being involved in this like commentary world is so toxic. However, it seems the contrary appeared to be the case. In fact, it looked as though Blair's open venting made her feel more reassured in returning to topics that she had distanced herself from. And after a month interval, she returned to her schedule of more politically oriented content. I'm not entirely sure why. It's not like many of the concerns that she had outlined in her video could subside. In fact, you could argue her shedding light on them had only heightened the attention they could receive. But if that's how she felt, then that's her prerogative. Hi. So I know I said in the last video that I wasn't going to talk about politics anymore. That was a lie. I'm a liar because women lie, just kidding, that was a joke and probably not fitting for this video, but... Well, I appreciate the honesty, Blair. Her first video back was a response to the slogan, Believe All Women, a rather contentious phrase which some advocates claim has been unfairly conflated with the similar though not identical Believe Women. As you can probably assume, Blair's position on this slogan was unsurprisingly quite critical, though not necessarily making the distinction mentioned prior. Nevertheless, the video was well received and she appeared to return to her routine schedule of content. This may have spiked some unease amongst those still skeptical of her intentions, especially considering some of the clickbait um, and chosen subjects. <coughs> right, Dennis? But her what the fuck's happening here? Why is it not... That's not pausing. Uh, I think that the... See, this I just want to talk about really quick. Like, the Believe All Women narrative, I think you should, like, listen to all victim or potential victims. You know, you shouldn't just believe everybody. I'm assuming that has to do with sexual assault. I could be wrong about that. Hope may have been instilled as she appeared to stand by her reformed demeanor and refrain from shabby character attacks, even reconciling with one of the individuals she had previously been rather insensitive towards and recognizing her responsibility. So all in all, we could say there was progress made, correct? Well, let's not get ahead of ourselves because again, as time elapsed, it felt like this was waning. So today I have one of the cringiest videos I have seen in a long time on the interwebs. I mean, the content itself was still lightweight at best and a bit misleading at the worst. I know it's kind of Blair style to not create the most demanding content, but conversely, I think there are videos which just end up failing rather in their portrayal of the source material, and once again fall back onto this idea of catering to a perspective. Now, obviously anyone would be pleased that her content is less incendiary than it was before, but at the same time, having many prominent flaws and just subtracting the evident offensiveness previously present doesn't necessarily make it good. And make no mistake, there isn't a great divergence from precursory output. Our example, this video where she responds to a notoriously unpopular teen Vogue upload. It's important that we really break down what are we talking about when we talk about sex and gender and is there something called biological sex and what does that well, mean? Yeah. Now, there are certainly points in the original that could be disputed, but a load of Blair's arguments are pretty lazy too. This idea that the body is either male or female is totally wrong. And I am living proof of that. We know. Well, I mean, okay, generally speaking, like I get what they're saying. I mean, there's 300 and fucking whatever, or sorry, there's 700 or... There's 7 billion people in the world. So obviously, um, you know, it's not like and male and female is a very generalized category for those things. So if you look at sex is bimodial and it can be considered that because, you know, I know that that's a generally an outlier, but there is intersex. I understand what you're they're saying, but we generally categorize these things for the most part. It's a fairly reasonable categorization, um, but OK, whatever. She literally just said that she's proof of that and didn't explain why. Like, it went on to the next scene. Blair, she literally elaborates on this later on in the section. I identify as an intersex woman. I have gone through surgeries that have really stuck with me through my whole life and affected a lot of different parts of my life just so that I can fit into this box of female. The video's over seven minutes long and these segments are even shorter, so you'd need to have a pretty short attention span to miss it. And as said, it's not an infallible upload, but she skips over so much of it and responds to the parts where she can drop a sassy takedown comment, some of which doesn't even work in the greater context of the original video. Another example would be the classic The Mob Tried to Cancel Me Again upload, where Blair is rather angry that an event she was part of hosted by Walk Away, a prominent LGBT movement promoting exodus of the Democratic Party, was moved last minute due to an open letter and accompanying dossier published by online communities, documenting what they had deemed as behavior contrary to the values of the venue hosting the event. She initially scolded the LGBT center for their decision to refuse their guests, and all the fans they would inevitably put out of pocket with the impending cancellation, a comment that some would deem slightly ironic given that she was accused of doing the same one and a half years prior for a debate with Theron Meyer and ContraPoints, another trans creator on the left of the spectrum whom she had debated previously. However, that was a while back, and so was a lot of what she had been accused of in this dossier. So she took to YouTube to defend herself. Today I am going to be addressing the mob. But more specifically, what I wanted to address in this video is the petition that was sent to the LGBT Center from activists online to have me deplatformed. The petition and what they were saying was absolutely just riddled with misrepresentations, lies, exaggerations, and just 
bullshit about me. So we're gonna go over some pictures right now that people love to bring up when they're trying to ruin something for me. People are claiming that that photo is me holding up a white supremacist hand signal. So yeah, I remember that. That's like fucking ridiculous. Um, that they were saying that that symbol was like white supremacist. I've never seen that before. It's just like the okie dokie, you know. Address that specifically. It's so the symbol that you're a dad that wears socks and sandals, you know what I mean? Like, it's all really what anything else. Stupid, I have to. This is again an okay hand signal. This is not a white supremacist hand signal. In the video, however, Blair picks out two isolated examples from the document in question and even then somehow manages to take one of them out of context. So here's another photo people love digging up from 2016 a photo of me apparently in blackface. This is all well and good, but she's omitted the caption, and this caption was present in the document, so there's no real Well, let's not skip over the reason caption. to do oh my This is all well and good, but she's omitted Black Blair. Blair Black, instructional feminist, depressed, mentally ill, Black Lives Matter, not okay. the caption, yeah, and this she's obviously caption being was provocative, yeah. Present in the document, so there's no real reason to do this otherwise unless you view it as strictly irrelevant to the discourse, which I would find unlikely personally. Now, does this make the offense terrible or even comparable to a lot of what is normally considered blackface? Not necessarily, because if you donned it with the primary intent of being a beauty treatment, then that's important information. However, it was still posted to social media as a reference to blackface, and that is of interest. And Blair was aware of that. However, instead we have to deal with the incredulous tone and touch from the astounded commentator who puts all these bottom feeders in their place. It's just so ridiculous. And it's even more ridiculous that people have the nerve to misrepresent someone like that. And I'm it's strange to me because it doesn't seem like a point that's impossible to respond to in its full context. And yet it was still watered down. Yeah, you could be like, hey, I made a shitty joke, sorry. You know what I mean? Like, that's, that's really all she had to do, I think. Even with this considered, there's a lot of the document that Blair just doesn't respond to at all. Some of it I can understand. She doesn't consider it a big deal. Other parts... Well, be in a lot better place. But unfortunately, we're at a place where instead of actually defeating your political adversaries with logic and reason or debate or hell, even a screaming match, it seems to be easier to brand them as bigots and brand them as people who don't have a right to speak rather than debunking their speech. And that's incredibly sad, let me tell you. When videos are like this, I just wonder why they're even made at all. And maybe that's what I get for making videos as long as I do. Yet it seemed for every step Blair took forward, they were offset by shortcomings that could have been alleviated if she'd been a bit more meticulous or upfront in the material she presented. And that for someone who valued facts and information so much, they could really be lacking sometimes, for the most pointless reasons as well. It's hard to fully diagnose what was going on, because it never felt fully malicious, just very lackluster, and I received the impression that maybe Blair was becoming tired of her content. Maybe she was an autopilot. Maybe she needed a new calling. Well, as we move deeper into 2019, it seems she may have found it. Okay. So I guess it's time to introduce a side character. This is an individual by the name of Jessica Unique. She first hit the headlines in mid-2019 after filing multiple complaints with the British Columbia Human Rights Tribunal as she was refused Brazilian waxes by beauticians and seeking damages from each individual involved. She claimed this was discrimination on the basis of her transgender identity. However, the defendants contested they were not comfortable or experienced with her genitalia, which included a phallus. There's a lot that takes my interest regarding this case that could be discussed in the future, but for now all I'll say is that there are many that understandably didn't sympathize with her plight and questioned her intentions in initiating these proceedings given certain details. Additionally, others the situation decided to dig further into her antics, discovering a consistent pattern of rather inappropriate and predatory behavior, provoking condemnation and backlash towards mm -hmm. the controversial figure. However, it appears there was another person with an eye on the debacle, Blair White. Now, Blair had perhaps signaled her intent to pursue a new direction a week before, although once- I was fine with people, uh, people call me a pedo. I had a panic attack and I'm highly triggered. I spent years being sexual as a child without Blair to make this rumor worse. Blair called me a I don't believe her because- It's again, not in- You are- you're also a predator, you're disgusting. Most graceful form. After she had confused a Twitter user by the name of Princess Death with a TikTok predator by the name of Mama Steph, in full fledged serving the wrong Chris Hansen style. She had deleted these tweets shortly after realizing her error, though I'm not ever sure if amends were made. Nonetheless, a good few days later, she probably felt on more sure footing as she launched a pretty extensive attack on Yannick, who she branded decisively in her upload as the trans predator. This week, this is trans activist Jessica Yaniv. Now, this person is the walking, talking, living and breathing embodiment of what people fear when it comes to trans people. I do not believe this is a trans woman. I believe this is a predator posing as a trans woman. Now make no mistake, none of these messages are how women talk to each other or trans women talk to women or anyone. Yaniv clearly has an obsession with, you know, feminine products and women and girls and it's incredibly disturbing and this needs to be called out. The video delineates the evidence accumulated against Jessica while also discussing the greater impact on the trans community and how the general public may regard it, lambasting the activists who haven't spoken out. This. Why are you silent when this type of thing comes up? This should be part of your job. It should be part of your job as an activist who wants to apparently put trans people in a better light and better social standing. It is important for us to distance ourselves. Why did she make this assumption that this person was a predator? What had come out about 
this person that made them seem like a predator from this. I'm not here to police what, you know, other trans public figures do with their social media and with their platform, but they seem to complain about a lot of stuff, right? And I know they've seen this. So maybe to those people, I would ask when you're writing, you know, your 17th tweet about how bad I am, maybe use one tweet to be like, that's not us, this is horrible. In many ways, these assertions don't feel out of place for a standard Blair White video, but the narrative of exposing someone for such egregious behavior appeared to provide it with greater moral foundations, attracting praise from a broad spectrum of viewers, and great galvanizing her ratings and engagement like seldom before. And when the formula works and you seem to be enjoying it, like Blair was, you pursue it a bit further. I feel like this channel is becoming a predator hunter channel, and I'm actually 100% okay with it. So a few more videos go up on the matter, a couple of these continue to follow the Univ saga, including a belated live stream in which both the participants clash heads pretty explosively. They discuss a medley of subjects, with Blair occasionally just driving home the very pertinent point of how much more attractive than Jessica she is, instead of merely calling Yaniv out for a blatant bigotry. You didn't answer the question. If, if, if you go, if, if you go, for no example, one deny me a facial. I'm sorry, but no one's gonna deny me a facial. And and honestly, I, a facial. no one, no one would. Okay. Me. I don't want to. I don't want to deal with 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 fantasies in which I want. I know. I know. But Blair, it's not a fantasy. I can show you right now that they didn't. They did deny me a facial. I mean, maybe you, but I'm just saying for me that wouldn't happen. Overall though, I think it does contain some interesting character indictments about Yaniv at least, so I won't complain too much on that front. However, some may begin to question this general direction on the basis that Blair's content was portraying transgender individuals in a negative light. After all, what does a person's identity have to do with how they behave? Well, in another video about an individual who Blair believed to be enacting sexual roleplay disguised as transgender activism, she appears to explain this justification. But what we don't need is people who are not even trans enacting this predatory behavior under the guise of being trans, under the blanket, the protection of being trans, really. It says I identify as a six-year-old girl. That whole like map, which is a minor attractive people, it's a, it's like a bullshit uh, identity that people are seem to be using to invalidate the LGBTQ community. So people like Jessica and Eve and people like Stefani actually use the trans label as a protective force field to stop people from criticizing their predatory behavior. It's not who they are; it is their scapegoats. Similar to a Jessica Uni video, it's clear that she feels there are certain people who are masquerading their rather sick depravity under the veil of the transgender label. And as a transgender person herself, Blair wants nothing to do with that. She wants to let people know that such behavior has no place in her community. I suppose it's an understandable sentiment when you have an activist community who you want to set yourself apart from. But I think you also have to be wary that you avoid perpetuating the conflation yourself, that you're not just pouring fuel onto the fire to then try and put it out. Blair seemed pretty pleased with its direction, even dropping an Onision video in the process, who isn't trans as far as I know. However, there were still a couple red flags that maybe she was a bit too emboldened by her newfound penchant for exposing people. Where drag queens are brought into public libraries, elementary schools, preschools, kindergartens, to read to children. Mm. And they come in drag, and it's supposed to be this thing that's very... Yeah, I obviously think it's weird. I do. I wouldn't let my kids go to it, to be honest with you. <laughs> but the parents are letting the kids go. And also, you know, it's it's interesting because we have a we associate sexualization with drag a lot. But I don't know that it's actually sexualized. I feel like the media's pre presentation of drag is sexualized because they want to present it as something that's as provocative as possible. <laughs> What I think that really what drag is mostly about is just imitating a character and really paying homage to them. You know, like a lot of drag shows will do, they'll do drag of like women that sing for the most part. And they take on that character and you call them she and they're a character and it's like a fun time. What's interesting though is that people are so upset with drag because it's like gross and sexualized, but we're all fine with like your fucking eight year olds being a cheerleader. It's like, okay. Maybe you gotta get your priorities straight, bro. Because you know, kids doing cheerleading is fucking disgusting. Like, think about it. like you're doing. They're taught to do moves like this, where you like pump out your chest. Like that's your like your eight year old is gonna wear a fucking uniform and do cheer, and you're gonna have a meltdown about drag shit, bro. I'm just saying. Um, mind opening for children. It's just this super woke thing. So meet this man, Albert Garza. Drag queen performer, has performed numerous times at Drag Queen Story Hour to underage young children. And what do you know? He's a convicted predator, but is somehow still allowed to read to children as a drag queen. In this video, she decided to cover a predator who was participating in the drag queen program, providing it with a title as endearing as ever. However, when initially released, it had this thumbnail. What's the problem? Well, the problem is that this drag queen in the thumbnail has nothing to do with any of the charges actually mentioned in the video. In fact, the only acknowledgement of this person is at the start, where they're once again so tastefully placed alongside the news report of the actual offender's conviction. Bringing drag performers together with little kids is kind of a perfect relationship. I'm hoping what the kids get out of coming to Storytime is an opportunity to see that things 
things that are different aren't scary. Relationships and gender identities and everything. Revelation that a registered sex offender participated in a story time for children might be surprising in and of itself. When called out for this, Blair did make the change relatively quickly. It oh, so she put that person as the thumbnail to be provocative? Okay. I mean, like, it's obviously shitty, but it sounds like I'd have a meltdown about. I, I'm assuming that that person was actually a, a, some kind of a predator. Uh, if this person didn't correct it, so like I'm not gonna take a huge issue with that part. It does need one to wonder how many times this can happen. I don't really like the video much either. It felt like the reservoir for such content was already running dry, especially given the fact that the video once again just sucks. And to make matters worse, there's a library board in Wichita that can't seem to agree. They can't come to a clear consensus on whether or not convicted child predators should be reading to their kids as drag queens. I'm not joking. It's a thing. This article states, board members were split zombie. between those who said registered sex offenders should be automatically disqualified from ever giving a talk at the library, and those who said it should be allowable in some circumstances. What circumstances is it okay for a predator to speak to kids? Yeah, Blair, have you heard of scrolling down? It's literally written there in the article. The exceptions that could be considered. You can disagree or dispute them, but you can't act like they don't exist and get all hot and bothered when they're right there. Talk about due diligence. Well, I think that she just meant like as a general thing that if you're a sexual predator, you shouldn't be given the ability to get like the benefit of the doubt kind of a deal. I'm not entirely sure if she meant it in the literal sense. You know, like I, I, I that's what I'm assuming. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but. Deep breaths, focus, focus. But what I am saying, which is what something that LGBT advocates don't seem to ever get through their head, is that sometimes you guys are so lax and so interested in being woke that you leave the door open for this. Stop. Like, I hate to constantly get all think of the children from you, but think of the children. Shut up. Okay, I have to admit I'm feeling rather faint and I need to sleep this frustration off. Okay, let's regather myself. Where were we? Nobody likes predatory behavior. It can be pretty much universally denounced. And Blair going after people who had acted in such a way was a goldmine, whether always completely accurate in the assertion she made or not. However, it also bestowed Blair with power that she'd previously not been accustomed with. This social gravitas, a currency of credibility that extended beyond a political clique. This like complete change of heart if in person you weren't so fake. I continue seeing how fraudulent they are and how gross of a community or genre of content that is. Um, it's starting to, again, affect my willingness to be part of that community. And obviously all doesn't mean literally all. There's two or three good ones, but the overwhelming majority and those people that you guys know are just liars. Now, when she made the video about why she had changed, it may not have served her channel much purpose in the context of the political content that followed almost immediately after. But it did begin to cement a distancing from certain highly polarizing figures that throughout much of the channel's early stages, she would found herself rather congenial with. The political community that was once rather tight-knit in 2016 had definitely divided itself in the years ensuing. To those who had become more amenable to leftism, like Sean Head, for example, and those who were still quite resistant to it. And this would only become more lucid as time transpired. Both of them very much. I really do like both of them. But it's become obvious that Sean Head is becoming radicalized towards communism. And in fact, I, with my burner account on Twitter, have tweeted at her, look, dude, by the end of the year, at this rate, you're going to be a communist. And she replied with never, and then deleted that tweet. And all we see now is this radical cascade into what appears to be just full communism. And I'm just staggered by it. Blair was no different in the sense at least. 2016 Blair hung around with a very different crew than her 2019 entourage. The strange detail in Blair's situation is that she maintained a lot of her narratives that remained critical of communities that she'd always been outspoken about. However, pairing them with topics that expose predators appeared to win over a larger audience and push her more into the mainstream. Finishing the saga off on the Onision video was a fitting end, especially given the apolitical nature of despising him. Hating people who behave in such a manner transcends politics. And even if you don't agree with Blair, a lot of people found it in themselves to look past their differences to support her crusade. In a way, it's what finally made her mainstream, which is a pretty incredible feat considering less than a few months ago she was lamenting cancellation of the walkaway event due to the antics of her and her peers, and her continued involvement with that movement since. However, as soon as she'd embraced her new direction, she once again shifted course back to more political content. This was fair enough, I suppose. She likely would have received flack for overstigmatizing the community if she'd only spoken about the worst of the worst through her archetypal lens. On the flip side, though, there wasn't any greater cause that could shield her from criticism for shortcomings that may be present in her content, so it was more 
imperative than ever that she be rigorous and balanced in her presentation. Was she though? Well, I mean, let's tackle the three most prevalent issues with Blair White throughout this video so far. Poor research, reckless insensitivity, and I suppose what many would regard as invalidation. The last one you'd hope would be a mostly outdated criticism given the fact that she'd obviously acknowledged how unfair she'd been in the past towards trans women who didn't pass enough in her eyes and how she wanted to move back to more serious, sensible content. However, the upload after this exposing phase, she uploaded a video called The Truth About Contrapoints and Non-Binary, covering an incident that transpired in the political community at that time, where Contra would face some pretty hostile resistance after expressing her predilection towards attitudes and environments with a more traditional This has happened to me before in hyperwork spaces, like it's me and a bunch of cis women and then we all have to go in a circle saying she, her because I'm there. Uh, sometimes it's funny when you're the only trans person in a space where everyone is announcing their pronouns, like what, like it gets to you and a hush falls over the room and can just like check your phone because cis people need to be working on their pronouns game. What, is this just problematic to people? Why? at that time, where Contra would face some pretty hostile resistance after expressing her predilection towards attitudes and environments with a more traditional approach to gender roles over the, quote, hyper-woke spaces. Now, obviously, this is a per- There's like a paradox, I think, that's where- Oh, what's, what's so, what's so, what's so problematic about this? This person is basically saying like, hey, I find it really annoying when I go into a space and people focus on my transness by like, oh, let's go through our pronouns just to make me feel more valid. But it ends up really just pointing out my identity and making me uncomfortable. Why is this such a bad thing? Like, what the, what's the problem? Why, why are we having a meltdown over this? I feel like that's pretty fair normal criticism to have of frustration that they're expressing i don't see it as particularly like problematic or really an issue person sharing their experiences and thoughts and even if you disagree or think it could have been worded more sensitively some people definitely overreacted however blair had her own take well maybe her opinion has reformed since then of course speaking of transition from what i can see the overwhelming majority of non-binary people do not transition they don't get surgery they don't get hormones etc of course there are some and there's gonna be someone in the comments i know of someone okay well you know of someone in terms of gender i have about as much in common with a non-binary person as i do my fiance who is not trans just a guy because you stayed a point a just like non-binary people do. No, not really. In fact, her video is packed with a large set of assumptions about the non-binary community, not really backed up with any proof or evidence, appearing kind of pissed off, to be honest. So non-binary is a topic that comes up on my channel in passing, but I've never really gone in depth about my feelings towards non-binary people, non-binary as a concept, in terms of gender, obviously. And this person insisted that they were trans as well. They were the same thing as me, right? This person was born male, presents as male, has not transitioned to anything but male, um, doesn't mind going by male pronouns, but yet I'm supposed to accept that I'm the same thing as this person. I'm dead. I'm sorry, but I'm not. Well, I mean, listen, I can understand her perspective there. There's obviously a different struggle, um, like different expectations and whatnot, and different experiences as somebody who's trans and non-binary versus trans with gender dysphoria, which is what Blair White would be. Um, and I can understand why a trans person would feel invalidated by somebody saying that they're trans when they haven't experienced or they don't they don't have the same struggle. Like they clearly don't have um, like a massive amount of distress associated with the way that they're expressing themselves versus like their biology. I guess, for instance, is, you know, to say it bluntly. So do people really get meltdown over this? Like who gives a shit? Like I get it. I mean, the tra it's weird to put everybody under the same blanket, like a trans blanket when they obviously have very different experiences. So I get what she's saying and what she's like going through or whatever. I also can't really endorse her assertion that this is the first proper time she's made her feeling as apparent on the matter. I think she's been pretty clear. Even in the midst of her hiatus from the political community, she uploaded a video where she reacts to a non-binary individual with her friend and fellow creator, Eden the Doll, and makes some pretty disparaging remarks while also continuously failing to address them correctly. When you're assigned male at birth, you have to fight like how to be feminine. You have to fight like how to be feminine. He had to fight? What was your fight, girl? Picking the right shade of lipstick? He's talking about a fight to be feminine when it's like, oh, a fight like surgery? Oh, no, he hasn't done that. A fight like hormones? No, he hasn't done that. A fight like therapy? Oh, he hasn't done that. A fight like changing your name legally? Oh, he hasn't done that. So what's the fight? I feel like whenever people says like to refer to them as they and them, they're like kind of saying that they have like multiple personalities, like split personalities, oh, like a million people. In yeah, them. She also chose this apparently unknown non-binary person as the quote, worst SJ. I mean, yeah, I mean, I get what they're saying. I think it's shitty. I'm not like a fan of it. I think it's a bit ignorant because what they're doing is they're deplatforming somebody else's experiences um, just to promote their own, right? That's what's, that's the shitty part about it, right? I get that. It's totally shitty. But I also feel like I understand what they're saying, and it's not that big of a... I'm, like, I'm not going to have a meltdown over the...
It's not something that I would be like, oh my god, this is why Blair White's such a terrible person. W over numerous other public figures in another video between then and now. So here's one where she claims there is no such thing as male and female brains. That's what's really, really annoying is you have all these random, honestly, cisgender people claiming to be trans to look cool and spreading out things like there's no such thing as male and female brains. And then we find ourselves over here where she keeps reiterating the fact that non-binary people are not the same as her, which is all well and good. I'm happy for her, but it's a misleading point. Take a look at this very short clip in which I tell the non-binary individual that we are not the same. My name is Blair, I'm transgender, and I'm a Republican. My name is Jamie, I use they, them pronouns. I identify as a queer, non-binary, trans femme. Um, I also identify in the spectrum of asexuality. I believe non-binary is under the trans umbrella. I completely reject how non-binary people specifically have injected themselves into the trans label. I am a transsexual, there's a medical basis for that, there's a scientific basis for that, and for non-binary, it's really not the case. You don't know Maybe my life. You don't I'm know my saying, experience with the gender dysphoria. You don't know my experience life, I'm not saying that. You're the one that said that I was well, I find it weird because um, what I find interesting there, so I didn't see the person they're referring to. What I find interesting there, though, is like, how do you know that they're non-binary and don't have some kind of an issue, like not issue, sorry. How do you know that they don't receive like therapy or some kind of like whatever treatment or whatever you'd want to say? Because her whole thing was like, oh, I'm fine. Because I believe if I was listening to her correctly, she made a point about how... Um, most non by the her issue with non binary people that she's experienced is that they don't actually try to transition or whatever, right? But this one may possibly be that to make this like a just rounded assumption, it just sounds kind of silly. Um, yeah, no, with erasing um, you as trans, I, I am like you're not trans, like there's a medical definition of being a trans. I'm gonna stop you, Jamie. How are you doing? I'm okay. You're okay? Yeah. Do you feel like talking? No, happy. Blair plays this clip like it's some huge gotcha, but it actually just shows the disparity kind of between up. the two points she's trying to make. Someone has asserted they fall under the umbrella and Blair disputes that, which is her prerogative. But that's not equatable to saying that another person was claiming you were the same. In fact, they seek to emphasize they believe in a more inclusive label that Blair seems rather bothered by. You can only reclaim that these two points are compatible if you solely derive your identity from your trans label, something that I'm sure Blair would never advocate for. No, I am not trying to bash non-binary people. I'm not trying to say that I'm better than them, above them, higher than them. We all put our hands on one leg at a time. We are all equals here. What I am saying is that we are different. Okay. It seems to me that the goal of non-binary people is to completely destroy and deconstruct the binary. And the goal of trans people is to operate within the binary as in moving from one to the other. Listen guys, oh, I'm talking about I peace, guess. love, understanding. I love everyone. Is that what people is? I don't, isn't the, what? I feel like that's a weird thing to say. Like, I don't know that. I think the point of being non-binary is just to, ex to express yourself outside of the gender binary. I don't, I, I mean, I don't think that it's, it's a characteristic of somebody who I don't, like I, identify or aligns themselves with their sex or somebody who picks female, male and female i don't think it's their life objective to invalidate non-binary people like fundamentally like there might be people who do that but that doesn't mean that it's, it's not part of being like a male isn't like saying like oh non-binary doesn't exist it's not part of it it's a fucking weird perspective very bizarre we're all equal, especially the greengrocers. I'm sure some of them are great people, but I'm pretty sure the greengrocers are kidnapping cats and claiming the reward money when missing posters are put up. I have to save some of this, but the point being, if you didn't like Blair before, she didn't seem to be more sensitive. And when it came to validation, this is someone yeah, who is not sure. trans. This is someone who's claimed to be trans by what? Putting on lipstick and then going in the media talking about trans issues as if they know. Well, if there's moving the goalposts, Blair was moving the gateposts. Well, I mean, it depends on what they are saying. If they're saying like, I have particular issues, based on the way that I dress, or not the way that I dress, based on my identity, like, sure. If they're saying that because they're non-binary and they dress that way, they must know all the experiences of a trans person with gender dysphoria, like, yeah, that's obviously would be untrue if they don't have that thing. But, like, you'd have to prove that. Are they doing that? Is that, like, a thing? Or are you just making that point just to make a, to try to force a bad point? Because that seems more likely, to be honest with you. But at least she still had her research sorted, right? Well, let's talk about it. Okay, here's the thing. The first two points that we've discussed, Blair may defend herself on. She never promoted herself as a bastion of sensitivity. On the contrary, in fact, she knows she's the problematic queen. If she has strong opinions, she's gonna express them regardless of who she offends. If you're going to criticize her, you could say that this sort of attitude makes her more sensitive videos, such as her apology video to Riley Dennis, somewhat disingenuous. There have been Reddit threads and 4chan threads with hundreds of comments on it of people trying to prove that I'm not trans because I haven't done this or that, or, you know, digging. I don't know if it invalidates those videos. I don't think that that's necessarily true, just because they are insensitive. Um, but okay. 
I wouldn't take. Yeah, those my steps. old pictures, and you know, I'm a strong person. I'm a happy person, but to sit here and pretend like it doesn't affect me at all would just be a lie. However, even with that said, she may respond to this, claiming that these two situations are not equivalent. After all, her whole point was the non-binary individuals were not the same as her, and this mostly staved off the criticism, even if it did feel like an us versus them narrative sometimes, no matter how much Blair declared there was no ill will in her rhetoric. And honestly, I know I'm gonna get crucified for this video, but I really don't care. My intention is not to, again, bash or put down or belittle non-binary people. I really don't care whatever you identify as. How about it? We'll put this on the back burner for now though, and turn our attention back to the third issue, one that we wouldn't necessarily expect to be present in a video like this, that being core research. This is the one aspect of content that Blair wouldn't really have any defense against. After all, you can't really dismiss it and say, deal with it liberals, I'm bad at fact checking. Intellectual rigor is to be aspired for, regardless of political affiliation. <laughs> However, in the aforementioned upload, not to be outdone, Blair manages to tick all three boxes with a rather bizarre citation. Another thing is that there is a long historical basis for transsexuals. Like, as early as surgery was a thing, people were having the desire to change their sex. Gender dysphoria, previously known as gender identity disorder, is something that has been around forever. Whereas this new wave of non-binary is literally something that's popped up maybe since 2014 and on. Google Trends shows it. Ah yes, Google Trends, the bulwark for scientific grounding. Now I personally use it, and I have used it, for illustrating public interest or awareness of a trend, but not for the existence of an entity, and Blair's assertion can be quickly challenged with a bit of actual research. For a video titled The Truth About Contrapoints and Non-Binary, there isn't really much contrapoints, and there's also a distinct lack of truth, though I'll give her points for having no deficiency on the non-binary front. Recently, Sam Smith came out as non-binary and wants the entire world to use they, them pronouns because it wasn't enough to be rich and famous, he also wants everyone around to bow down and, you know, change their language for him. The videos that followed were no less brash, with her attitude seemingly becoming more and it more. Just, it kind of just seems like she has like a weird thing with non-binary. I suppose I get it because she feels like it's invalidating for people to identify as trans when they don't have the same experience as her. Who's and she's somebody who's traditionally trans, I guess you'd say. Um, so I'm not gonna like I don't I'm not gonna hate her for it, but I think that her way she expresses it is ignorant. Yeah. You know? impersonant, but I don't really want to focus on that, and let me make it clear, I could. We could talk about the thumbnails that continue to feature people who have nothing to do with the video topic and merely serve to allow Blair to pull her grossed out face, despite the fact she was literally just called out for that, or we could talk about her ridiculous and pointless flame war with a smaller creator, where she once again resorts to insulting the person's trans identity regardless of what they said. Just grow up. The antics that persisted after this with the photoshopping and all that crap, I have nothing else to add. It is self-explanatory at this point. Oh, I feel like I start out so many of my videos saying today's video is kind of sad, today's video is kind of dark. This one is too, just being real. So with all that behind us, let's talk about the children, a topic that has always been very close to Blair's heart, and one that has also been the center of gender discourse for a long time. Certain commentators in particular take an interest because it's a sensitive and controversial topic that has led to some mishaps in the past. And obviously in these instances, there can be ramifications of great moral significance. At the same time, with such topics given their sensitivity, it requires attention to detail and respect for those who may be affected by the consequences such narratives may invoke. Blair, like she did with a fair few other subjects, held a pretty cautious stance on the matter, but mostly tried to talk about the issue from a perspective of common sense, a safe bet with the internet at least. However, her track record on the subject wasn't the cleanest. She had previously generated some controversy a few years back in a now deleted video titled Child Transitioning Equals Child Abuse, the title being the least provocative component. In the infamous upload, she claims that the mother is pimping out her child's identity for profit. Hmm, what are the odds that a transgender activist gives birth to a kid who ends up being transgender? Shocking coincidence, right? So then the question becomes, was she an ideologue before or after her kid became trans? Well, her pinned tweet is of her doing a public talk years ago in which she explains how her child transitioned at four. Four. A really quick Google of the mother shows that she's been doing press and interviews and talks for years about her kid, and I'm sorry, but this just reeks of pimping out your kid. She also has her own organization called Transparenting. She sells t-shirts. I mean, this is lucrative for her, and I'm sure that this cover of National Geographic is just her big break. This was not just debatable, but frankly preposterous. I'm uh, kinda gonna have to disagree on that preposterous thing. So, I mean, obviously this isn't a politically correct take, but like the reality of the situation is that everybody is a mixture between environmental and biological factors, right? And that the same goes for people that are trans. Everybody's gonna have a different level of each, but realistically speaking, like, yes, if you are <clears throat> somebody who is in a very, I guess you can, you can environmentally encourage somebody to be trans, you know, through like not affirming a gender and probably other things. I don't think that's a hot, or shouldn't be a hot take to say like, yeah, we're a mixture between environmental and biological factors. Like that's just, that's a very commonsensical perspective to have. Um, also, the kid transitioning at four, I mean, for most kids who they might, who they think that they are trans and they say, oh, I think I'm trans, you could literally just be like, oh, maybe or no, and they'll probably give it up. Um, 
So, like, yeah, it's bizarre. I mean, a four-year-old doesn't... I don't think a four-year-old has any complex understanding of gender. I don't think that for most four-year-olds... It's very coincidental that you'd have a trans person with a trans kid at four years old. Like, they're probably feeding them ideology. And it's fine. It's their kid. You do you. I don't really give a shit. I'm just saying that to say it's preposterous, that there wouldn't be a factor of the way that their parents are... Um, raising them like i think that's silly like it doesn't like quite literally the a social argument is that we raise our kids too strenuously and we should you know raise them in a different way and teach kids that they don't have to fall in line with the gender binary right so the social construct right now is to raise your kids based on their biology and the new social construct that it wants to be developed is to like hey maybe allow your kid space to be raised without falling on that binary i just like eh yeah, I don't know. I don't think it's preposterous to acknowledge that environment um, has a factor in the way that you're raised because it does. You know, that's why different people, you could have two biological twins raised in two different environments and they will become different. There's going to be similarities because, again, there's the biology is a factor, but, you know. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's preposterous. And research showed that the mother, who was the prime recipient of these characterizations, was practically the antithesis of everything that Blair alleged, leaving many to arraign the creator for inducing a tidal wave of hatred against a person who was merely trying to support her daughter. But okay, that was 2016, Blair. This was 2019. I'm not going to give a spiel about the fact that she had a wide audience now, because we know that doesn't play a large role in dictating her narrative. But allow me to give a brief preamble about this situation. Essentially, just under a couple years back, a child became the center of a political tug of war after the divorced parents disputed their gender. The father in this family claimed that the mother was forcefully transitioning one of their children against their will, setting up a page and fundraiser to fight the custody battle after a jury ruled against him. This caught wind in the media and online conservative circles, causing the issue to become quickly politicized as well, with one allegedly highly incriminating clip making the rounds, in which the child claims the mother told them that they were a girl. Uh -oh. You're a boy, right? No. I'm a girl. Who told you you were a girl? Mommy. Blair decides to weigh in on this matter. After all, her personal investments run deep, and she delivers a decisive verdict on the clip in question. So you guys, this video to me is... I don't even want to get emotional. It's so sad. I think, first of all, you know, children going through custody battles emotional. And, you know, being weaponized by either party or both parties and just going through that is so sad. And adding in this transgender layer, but you know, I have to be honest, a child saying, my mom told me I'm a girl, um, not cool. Now, I've been looking into this story, and many people are saying that this child has been coached and is being forced into this, and just based on what I have seen, I have to agree with that. That is personally my opinion. She then moves on to the regular narratives about the transgender community and the discussion about putting children on hormones at the age of seven and the dangerous, dangerous consequences it can have. The institutions who have yeah, supported this and pushed it through and caused a great, great threat to this child who is far too young to make such a decision for themselves. I don't know. Sometimes I seriously lose faith that trans people will ever be accepted into society and integrated into society when just the insanity that comes out of the community is so constant. I don't know. I just feel like you never have anything positive coming out of the community. I feel like it's always, if you don't date me, you're transphobic. Yes, seven-year-olds can decide to transition. Yes, male athletes who pops two estrogen pills should be able to compete against women and demolish them. Like, when, like, when is the community going to step up and realize things are going too far and regain some credibility here? Because it's not looking good. It really isn't. Honestly, the, the biggest thing for me, this is a kind of different rant, the biggest thing for me is that the trans community seems to have no self-awareness of how they're viewed by the outside world. They literally have no clue. A lot of these people are so caught up in their own sort of discourse and people who agree with them that they don't realize how insane it sounds that a seven-year-old is having his gender changed legally, is going to appointments for puberty blockers, and they just think it's so bewildering that anyone can possibly conceivably think, should we slow down just a little bit? No, transpo. Like, it's just disgusting. But here, Blair was engendering much more trouble than any of the people that she seems so concerned about. I'll say this, you know, in the off chance that the mother of James is viewing this video, um, I don't want to come across as I am attacking you. In fact, I would like to publicly reach out via this video if you watch it and say, let's have a conversation. I would love to talk to you. I am not some random internet troll. I am not some anonymous person on Twitter. I'm not some hater. I'm a trans woman myself. And if anything, I've walked this path that your son and yourself may seem to think is the right path for him. And I'm actually willing to talk to both of you. But it's okay, I guess. At least she's willing to have a discussion. Well, Blair, let's talk about it. Okay. You know, it, it's so sad, but I, I hope to God that James lucks out in the sense that um, he grows up and, and truly is trans and also doesn't want a family because those are the only two circumstances that would validate the choices being made for him right now is if he both is really trans, to which he won't regret the medications, and that he doesn't want kids because it's already seems to be decided up for him right now.
that that's the case. So. So yeah, I think that there might be infertility associated with um, prebuter blockers. Maybe that's not true. I'll have to look into that after I fight this guy. Uh, but I think it's re reversible once you come off whatever hormone you're on, uh, because that is like a struggle with like some trans people. Like they have to get off. They have to temporarily detransition. Some of them, we'll call it, in order to have be able to be fertile. So. Yes, is that what she's referring to? Um, let's see. Before it circulated by a load of conservative outlets, creators, and even some on the liberal end of the spectrum, this whole story was pretty comprehensively investigated by a creator called Timber on Toast, who quashes most of the narratives put forward by those in favor of the father. You should go and watch that one after this. But he shows that the dad in this instance is by no means a helpless passenger losing his son, but someone who instigated a lot of trouble which was practically rebuked by every medical professional who supported the contrary perspective. Dr. Johnson receives a letter from the child's father in which he makes allegations about the child's mother. This letter is ignored by Dr. Johnson, who sees the child and diagnoses them with gender identity disorder. Following the diagnosis, the medical center tries to contact the father to keep him involved in the process. He delays scheduling an interview with them, saying that he is gathering information he wants to present to the head doctor. The records show that he never followed up on scheduling that interview. The therapist confirms the diagnosis of gender dysphoria which was made by Dr. Johnson, and advises the mother that it would be better for the child yeah, so, uh, yeah, it might be long-term effects on growth spurts, bone growth and density, future fertility, depending on when puberty blockers are started. Okay, yeah, so they can have that negative impact. Um, so, child's psychological well-being to socially affirm them as Luna, which is a girl's name that the child has chosen for themselves. The therapist advises scheduling another appointment when the child is eight or nine to discuss whether or not hormone blockers are an appropriate measure to take. By this time, it transpires that the- Okay, well, it seems like they're doing everything right. I mean, like I was saying before, everything's a mixture of environmental and genetic factors. This, there might've been a genetic predisposition here, or maybe there was an uncontrollable environmental factor that wasn't the mom just being like, you have to be trans. I don't know that the narr I mean, I don't know too much about the story, but that does just because the kid is identifies as trans early, and just because there are some people who let their kids choose their gender when they probably shouldn't um, and don't take it seriously, doesn't mean that this one isn't serious, right? So I would say that if you're somebody who, if their kid expresses, hey, I might be trans, and you're like, okay, explore that, do your thing, that's fine. But then if there's people where they're like, oh, I might be a boy when they're biologically a girl, and they're like, oh, well, then let's buy you this and do this and do it. And they give it too much into it, and they don't let their kids explore their gender identity. That's a different, that's a whole different topic. And it's kind of something that gets like a little, that obviously gets very loaded. Um, but this, I mean, if the medical professionals are saying whatever, like, what the, who the fuck am I, you know? I mean, this isn't a specific case. It seems their thing was done, what you'd say is correctly. I, under father has I understand the, the, the father's concern because like he doesn't it's something that people don't understand I get it like obviously like I don't even understand it fully um so I get why he would feel like it's not right you know, it was like like honestly as a parent like you know if you it's it would be it, I could see why it'd be upsetting for your kid to be trans specific like I wouldn't want my kid to be trans specifically because that's a, another big like, big hardship for your kid to have to face right and if my kid was trans I would love the fuck out of him but it's it'd be tough, and the first thing that parents do think is like, "What did I do wrong?" So I can understand why the the father would be upset. Uh, I'm not gonna fault him for him fighting this legal battle, but you know. Contacted Dr. Johnson, Child Protective Services, Genesis Clinic, and the follow-up psychologist, making allegations to all of them that the mother is abusing the child. He states that he suspects the mother is suffering from Munchausen by proxy, the very same mental illness proposed by Dr. Michelle Critella, the lady quoted in all those articles I read about this case. None of the professionals who receive the father's letters find his allegations to be credible. This information can also be found in court documents published around that time if you're fun enough to read them. And I'm not saying this necessarily makes the mother a saint or that this whole hubbub even has a bearing on the child's identity, which has now probably been completely disrupted by political figures sticking their nose in far too deep to a case they have no knowledge of, and interfering with a court case which has been deliberated and heard out by a jury. However, once again, a preconceived narrative was pushed as truth without question. I mean, hell, the governor of Texas basically complained that his own judicial system wasn't working well enough. Somebody said the issue is medical professionals instantly jump on the trans train instead of looking deeper. Yes, they could be trans, but most likely something else. Uh, I don't know if that's necessarily true. I don't know that these things are more as politicized as like you guys think they are. It's possible, but I don't think that most that, uh, that you have a bunch of. I mean, I'm sure there are bad actors and everything, but I don't think that we have like an onslaught of psychiatrists or psychologists or whatever the fuck it is, therapists that are like desperate to 
give it a false diagnosis just to be woke. I don't think that that's like most people don't really fear the the, the woke mob so much in the real world. Like you're not going to have your license removed because you give a reasonable, accurate uh, perspective on your job. So Jesus, I'm getting my fucking tits turned. I love you. Please leave a comment. I want to know everyone's thoughts. Um, please share this video as well. I feel like this is extremely important. Blair was a part of that, and she, of course, doesn't have the mainstream draw of any of the figures who took to Twitter to make known their outrage. But it was once more wrapped in those points of view that tried to make her look like this disillusioned observer and frustrated moderate that was becoming more and more tiresome by the upload. And honestly, even wearing what they want, if I'm being completely honest, I don't have an issue with that at all. But the mother has been going to consultations for puberty blockers, is quote, not ruling it out. And it seems like this boy's fate is already decided. You know, I do believe seven year olds can experience gender dysphoria. I was one of them, but no seven year old is prepared mentally, emotionally, anything to make the decision to go on puberty blockers and then hormones and then live as a woman at seven. You also. I mean, like, uh, I think that's a reasonable perspective, right? I mean, I don't. I mean, that's something I'm still investigating is do I want my kid to go on hormones if they're trans? But. I mean, that sounds really like, hey, seven-year-olds can definitely experience gender dysphoria. I just don't think that they should go on hormones. Why is that considered so inflammatory? I don't I don't know if I agree or disagree because it's something that I'm, like, struggling to consider. But, like, why would that be considered, like, such a shitty, inflammatory thing to say or hear? That sounds like a perfectly reasonable perspective, even if you disagree. Like, it's a kid, so, you know, it's hard to balance everything out. Like, oh, my fertility, etc. Because there are neg side effects to negative side effects to, to the, you know, um, puberty blockers and whatever. So I get the perspective. I mean, why is that considered so fucking inflammatory? What the fuck? To see in the court notes that there is no concrete plan for the child to go on hormone blockers. The child is six years old. It's stated that when they are eight or nine, they will have another consultation where they will seek advice on whether or not hormone blockers are the correct course of action. Back Okay, but still, it's a relevant criticism because they're going to be the potentially going on hormone blockers. I, I don't know. What, what's the... When she was edgier than this and controversial, you could at least say it was pretty clear where she would stand. But here it just felt like a bit of a ruse. Blair constructs Why? a fair few of her videos like this, especially when they're short and quite loosely formulated. She starts with a root situation and branches off with a variety of observations and opinions. You can deal with a few of those branches being off, a few points that don't quite hit. However, if the whole root discussion is off, then the video is basically nullified. Most people, left or right wing, wouldn't advocate for young children undergoing hormone therapy because, like Blair said, there can be serious consequences. Well, that's not really true. What are you talking about? There's a lot of people who advocate for children going on hormone therapy i feel like that's a bigger like a, high, a more prevailing narrative people will be like well the puberty blockers have no ne negatives so who cares they should just be able to go on like even if that's right i don't know that it is right but even if that's right it still exists this narrative is still getting promoted so why would you try to make the assumption that people aren't saying kids should go on hormone blockers there are people who are very much in defense of that i'm very confused that's a fairly somewhat popular like narrative at the felix what is for a decision undertaken at such a young age when one still has a very uncertain grasp of their identity however because the mother wasn't actually advocating that blair's secondary points here don't feel authentic it uh i don't i mean i think that the story fundamentally is the mom's trying to and the dad are trying to do what's best for the kid the mom like the kid seems to have gender dysphoria or something along those lines and the natural course of action for a young person identifying would be potentially to go on hormone blockers. So, like, I think it's a reasonable thing to talk about because um, it could potentially happen. Why are we not considering that? It often feels like Blair shapes the evidence to fit the narrative rather than vice versa, which is risky business with such a high stakes case. And she wasn't the only person who did it here. I will make that clear. But there's a point where if you use your identity as a badge of credibility, you need to certify it by proving you're better than those who are pushing identical points of view. Otherwise, that additional experience means very little. Now I'm transgender and I have feelings of gender dysphoria at that age as well. But one thing was that I felt like a girl at that age, but it wasn't because anyone was telling me. It wasn't because anyone was putting anything on me. It was actually the opposite. It was the entire world, including my parents, telling me, you're a boy, you're a boy, you're a boy, and me still feeling that way. So it was not based on what my parents were instructing me on. So that's incredibly worrisome, in my opinion. I think the problem is perfectly embodied in a situation like this, when you have a common sense position. Many viewers, regardless of political background, will be in unison that a mother should not force a child to transition against their will. But Blair utilizes the case and pushes the narrative of the dangers that transgender extremities within the ideology will produce. Blair's assertions appeal to mainstream audiences because the positions they're rooted in are moderate by nature. That's the catch. But she's validating this stance through a manufactured scenario. Sometimes she picked up the narrative from secondary sources, such as the I'm a predator, but- What are you talking about? That sounded like she perfectly explained her perspective. She said, hey, when I was younger, 
Um, I had feelings of gender dysphoria, but nobody encouraged them, so that validated it for me. And what she's saying is in this case, the encouragement from the mother might end up causing somebody who doesn't have gender dysphoria to feel like they do because they're being overly encouraged. Now, I don't know that that is something that's happening, but it's a fairly reasonable criticism to make or point to bring up. I don't, why, I, I don't know, man. I feel like, uh... I feel like we're... I don't know. But it's okay because I'm trans, where she once again echoes many claims that this individual received early release from prison because of their gender identity, which was later contested. I'm gonna read this headline to you. Convicted pedo to be released from jail after becoming a woman. No longer deemed a threat. We need to dissect this. So that person was sent to prison and is now being released, get this, because they are identifying and transitioning into a woman literally because and i thought that can't be the reason there has to be maybe like i don't know good behavior or an exoneration no this person still did what they did but is getting released because they're on hormones and according to the judge no longer deemed a threat so apparently the recommendation for josie to be released was based on the fact that josie is on hormones estrogen and apparently now doesn't have a high sex drive and so they think it's a low risk um future offender and that they're confident josie's not going to offend in the future so i know i love how she states that parole isn't about the risk and the maybe like Fine. So that later contested. Pose many claims that this individual received early release from prison because of their gender identity, which was later contested. Huh? I'm going to read this headline to you. Convicted pedo to be released from jail after becoming a woman. No longer deemed a threat. We need to dissect this. So that person was sent to prison and is now being released. Get this. Because they are identifying and transitioning into a woman. Literally because, and I thought that can't be the reason there has to be maybe like, I don't know, good behavior or an exoneration. No, this person still did what they did, but is getting released because they're on hormones and according to the judge, no longer deemed a threat. So apparently the recommendation for Josie to be released was based on the fact that Josie is on hormones, estrogen, and apparently now doesn't have a high sex drive. And so they think it's a low risk um, future offender and that they're confident Josie's not going to offend in the future. So I know, I love how she states that... Okay, I mean, uh, so they're wrong in the first place, which is the bad part, or the assumption... Gun's off, Sorry. Gun's off lamenting that this individual... I just want to, like, make sure that I'm clear with what's sex felon. So, okay, so the narrative is that somebody that's a sexual f felon is getting released on bail or whatever. Okay, so, like, I could see why... And the, the, uh, so they said the narrative is wrong, so obviously that's the big issue, but if the narrative was correct, what she's saying doesn't bother me, right? Like, it makes sense. Like, it would be weird to let somebody, like, a sexual predator, I don't know. I guess not. Maybe, I guess, I don't really know. I mean, I guess I just don't really know how I feel in general about, uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. I'm going to think about it. That's something I have to think about more. Okay. Let's go. Sure. Side note, I love how she stayed. Like, I guess their point is, is that this trans person was in a male prison, and now they're going to go to a female prison, and they might have assaulted a female. So now they might assault that person again, but also would you be equally outraged by a man being in jail with other men since they've, if they went to jail for assaulting other men? You know what I mean? Like, um, I wonder. Case that parole isn't about the risk of reoffending. 30 seconds after lamenting that this individual wasn't released for good behavior, which of course has nothing to do with the risk of reoffending. It's the same routine, moderate position. No one's going to agree that a person's sentence should be shortened just because of their gender identity, but on further investigation, that appears to not be the case. However, it's that P word no again bad. that seems Fair to enough. not make a lot of people think twice. I'll defend Blair on the front that a lot of the facts were only easily accessible after she had released the video. However, the same can't be said for her exposing games to a transgender person video, which includes her own interpretation of personally collated research. Tiffany proclaimed on her social media that her child now, go figure, is trans, specifically non-binary, refers to them as a gentle them, which is so, like, that makes me want to do something very permanent to myself that I won't say because I'll get uh, demonetized. There's photos of Tiffany painting the nails of this small child, which on its face is not bad. I don't think anything is wrong with pigment on someone's nails, boys or girls, but when you couple it with now trying to convince your child that they are also trans. Am I missing something here? Like, what's happening here? with her own interpretation of personally collated research. Tiffany proclaimed on her social media that her child now, go figure, is trans, specifically non-binary, referred to them as a gentle them, which is so, like... I mean, listen, so I talked about this before, and I was talking about the, the environmental impact. Like, yeah, of course, it could be environmentally... The, the environmental impact... You can raise your kid trans, just like you can raise your kid whatever, you know? There's obviously biological predispositions that we could, you know, recenter them, whatever. 
but also I, I'm kind of at a point where like I almost don't care anymore. Like, what's so about if you raise your kid trans? Like, I mean, it might increase their hardship because it's stressful growing up in that way. But then also, it's not my fucking kid, and like I like, really, you know, what I don't give a shit. It's not my kid. I mean, <laughs> I don't know if that's uh, <laughs> if that's like a mean take or something. But, I don't know, it's their kid, as long as the kid's happy and being treated well, I guess, who really gives a shit? Um, that's my hot dick, I guess. That makes me want to do something very permanent to myself that I won't say because I'll get uh, demonetized. There's photos of Tiffany painting the nails of this small child, which on this face is not bad. I don't think anything is wrong with pigment on someone's nails, boys or girls. But when you couple it with now trying to convince your child that they are also trans, that's an issue for me. People also message me with concerns over photos of Tiffany and Tiffany's boyfriend. Someone out there for everyone, apparently. Uh, wearing fetish collars around the sun, posting really weird photos. That's just like a weird thing. There's someone out there for everybody. That seems kind of shitty. Like, it's just like a knock at their appearance, I guess. Photos of the sun laying in his crotch while he's wearing women's panties. Yeah. So all of that's really concerning, as well as a bunch of photos of Tiffany seemingly posing very seductively in bed with the kid. And, like, you don't want to attribute something you know, oh, nefarious God. that isn't necessarily there. When you that with seems all the like a reach. And fetish collar and the weird picture where the kid is in between the lap and the women's panties. You know, it's just very suspect and I'm not making any direct accusations here, but I think it's something worth looking at. Now, there are many causes Feels for like concern when it comes to Tiffany's social media conduct and parenting skills that I would raise, but none of these explicitly prove what's denoted in the title. Hell, Blair's own video seems to state this, but once again, yeah, the, the trans predator thing seems pretty shitty. I mean, like, yeah, they might be a bad parent. I guess there's something in there that makes them a bad parent, but calling them a predator is, seems to be quite a reach, yeah. I mean, that's a very a heavy accusation to throw people at, like, just to throw at somebody. And the video's presentation of the word predator and ultimately inconclusive evidence of a person who I stress is with their child is a massive stretch. The use of the word predator is no longer just being used to play towards that mainstream audience. It's a word that provokes strong feelings and universal condemnation. No one wants to defend a predator, but how low are you willing to set the bar? And I hope to God that things are not as bad as they seem to be. Almost like, just I go to the bathroom really quick. <sighs> this here, so I know to edit that out. I'll be right back. Oh. Okay, let's get back into this. It's a fucking long ass video. We got another hour left. All right, all right.
based on social media. But what we know about social media is that it's like the highlight reel of people's lives. So a fair proportion of what Blair presents as moderate has been first distorted to appeal to the moderate crowd. Though a lot of the time it is unclear whether it has been distorted before Blair has interpreted the content or not. Although Blair has her biases, she may just be a bit susceptible to them. To say definitively that she's actively neglecting due diligence, you'd need a bit more solidified evidence that she was misrepresenting the content that she depicts on her channel, henceforth undermining so many of her precious narratives. And that wasn't exactly there yet. Still one day left in 2019, and I feel like 2019 was no one's year. I feel like no one is making it out alive this year without some sort of cancellation, some sort of scandal, and I'm a little shocked. But it seemed that we were about to receive it. Okay. One of the points that many sympathetic to Blair would draw from a fair proportion of her commentary is that even if you feel she's wrong time to time, that she was at least consistent to a fault, and that most of these issues that we've observed are yielded in a variety of political cliques due to a fairly basic application of confirmation bias. Her greatest failing was parroting misinformation rather than looking it up for herself. But this theory would be tested when a new situation arose, thanks to someone by the name of J.K. Rowling. J.K. Rowling is a pretty famous novelist, who shouldn't require much introduction, but she's primarily known for her authorship of the Harry Potter book series, an international best-selling saga of fantasy novels, which launched an equally successful set of films which has only manifested its fandom in the years following. On a more personal level, many regard them as a pretty integral part of their childhood and hold the works very close to their heart. However, in recent times, some have found themselves alienated by Rowling's divisive political nature. What sort of convictions were these? Well, you may be shocked to find they were related to gender. Yes, despite having socially liberal views on many issues, she began to attract disapproval from some online after expressing support for Maya Forstater, an individual all right, let's, uh, okay. Jill, who had lost an employment tribunal after her relationship with the business was discontinued due to statements the My belief, as I set out in my witness statement, is that sex is biological fact and is immutable. There are two sexes, male and female, women are female. It is impossible to change your sex. It was until very recently understood as basic. Okay. I'm assuming that they don't because i mean like yeah i guess you can't really change your sex but uh, usually people say that when they say you can't change your gender they don't separate gender from sex i'm assuming that means that they're not a supporter of trans people okay firm had deemed ill-suited for her position at the time it was implied that she had been sacked with immediate effect and some headlines also understated the extent of poor status comments but even with this information publicly available rowling didn't back down white was also someone who advocated for poor status at the time and a few days later would make a video defending jk rowling's comments jk rowling is actually someone who has traditionally been referred to as very woke someone who is very much favored by the type of people who go out and call everyone trans so I was really curious as to why everyone was saying this. And apparently it's because of this tweet. Dress however you please is the first line. Not seeing any issues so far. I feel like that is very agreeable. Who disagrees with that? I don't really know. Uh, call yourself whatever you like. Okay. We're choosing our names out here. Love it. Now, as noted, there wouldn't... Well, usually someone says call yourself whatever you like is a generally like an invalidating factor for trans people. It's fine if you believe that as long as you're not violent or whatever, but it would can mean it would generally mean you would mean you're transphobic, you know. Um, but that's just like a common conservative talking point. They're like, oh, you could dress however you want, call yourself whatever you want, but I'm not calling you a fucking woman or whatever, you know necessarily be a huge issue with Rowling's tweet if its presupposition was correct. Most people took issue with the fact that she backed someone who many found held unsavory ideas that were unbefitting for a position, and the fact that the inference followed that certain gender identities were merely about how one dresses. Now, one thing that I will say is that there was a lot of misinformation on both sides that muddied the waters unnecessarily. However, the hearing in question did not rule against Paul Stater on the basis that she believed sex wasn't real. More on the fact that she was judged as believing that trans women were not women, and pronouns aside, she would not refer to them as such, even if they were recognized otherwise officially, and that her take on the matter was deemed absolutist, henceforth possibly yielding behavior that could be seen as hostile to the work environment. Maya's beliefs were repeated throughout the trial, okay, even when explaining her misgendering of a non-binary person continuing to misgender them, I'll add. Something else which Blair harps on. In fact, managing to misgender this person as well. Now it's going around that Maya actually was on Twitter and misgendered a trans woman. I'm going to put that trans woman up on the screen and I want you guys to tell me what pronoun you would probably naturally use for this individual. Right. Okay. With all this said, you can still disagree with the ruling and think that she should be free to express those opinions on her social media without fear of reprimand. The judge does acknowledge that there are shades of grey in this case, and I think they can be okay. observed when reading the court documents. In fairness to Blair, I gotta read this because if Blair it's necessary. Acknowledge in respect of the belief that the claimant contends she does not hold, that everyone has a gender which may be different from their sex at birth and which effectively trumps sex, so the trans men are men, trans women are women. I consider that this is a good example of why, at least certain circumstances, one needs to apply the grainier criteria of lack of belief rather than the alternative belief. Believing that a trans woman is a woman does not conflict with the approach 
of the European uh, Court of Human Rights. Good word, or the okay, or no, it does it does not face the same issue of incompatibility with human dignity. Okay. All right. Well, I guess that person didn't look like a whatever. Like, I, well, who cares? I feel like who gives a shit? Just call them whatever they want. Just leave it alone. I mean, who fucking cares? But I guess if your job's worth it, you know, you have some pretty well-rounded priorities. <laughs> but there are shades of grey in this case, and I think they can be observed when reading the court documents. In fairness to Blair, she recognizes this is critical towards Forsata and expresses her opinion of the information available to her. But I also will say it's my opinion that these are not beliefs that I think should warrant someone being fired for their job. I understand it's a private company and they can decide who has the values that align with themselves and that's totally fine. I respect that, right? I respect the company's right 100%. But two things can be true at once. You can respect the company's right to hire and fire as they see fit and also think it's kind of a lame reason for firing her, in my okay. opinion. I personally don't think the jury is out on a lot of these issues that we're debating and talking about and so I feel like we should be allowed to have them without fear of risking of losing our jobs. At this time, she also takes a moment to affirm her stance on JK Rowling. I do not think JK Rowling is transphobic. I think she's probably someone who is paying attention to this culture war happening on gender. And if we're just basing off of her tweets, I don't see anything transphobic in her tweet. That was a big reason, her simply stating that biological sex is real. And if we're getting to a point where we can't say that, girl. And to be honest, maybe Rowling was misinformed, but that doesn't prove that she was outly transphobic. So Blair concluding on this point was a safe bet. Yeah, I was about to say, like, that seems reasonable enough. Like, maybe she was just saying that, you know, yeah, sure, okay. Especially for her audience. However, as always, Blair set a benchmark for her opinion, and that meant she was going to defend it pretty staunchly. However, this would be tested as Rowling's fiascos escalated. Essays were published, tweets were posted, heated interactions were shared, some of which certainly seemed questionable on the writer's front. However, Blair maintained her stance, framing the author's outlook as mostly misunderstood by those who wanted to simplify it to if sex isn't real, there's no same-sex attraction. If sex isn't real, the lived reality of women globally is erased. I know and love trans people, but erasing the concepts of sex removes the ability of many to meaningfully discuss their lives. Isn't hate to speak the truth? I don't really know the context there. It doesn't sound that bad, I guess. Are they, do they believe in gender? I, I'm like a little confused. Like, what's the point of saying that? Are they saying that as an invalidating thing when it comes to uh, people identify with different genders, or are they just making a point about how sex shouldn't be completely erased just because gender exists? I, I don't know. Because I've seen some people say that. What the fuck? I'm bugged out. I've seen some people say that, like, um, make like a weird argument about how sex does, is, doesn't exist. I guess we saw it in this video, right? They make an argument about how sex doesn't exist and that, that maybe she's just defending that sex exists while also def like maintaining that gender exists. I mean, that's fine. I don't think that's transphobic. I think it's reasonable. Okay. Um, sure. The one that could easily be classified as bigoted without the nuance or respect it deserved conservative and liberal, the world is definitely right now divided into people who can have a meaningful, nuanced conversation about sensitive issues and people who can't. That's it. That's the division I see these days. The conversation gets very muddy because people who are on the outside looking in at this whole fiasco happening, they really do think trans people are turning on JK Rowling and don't like JK Rowling anymore because they think JK Rowling is transphobic. But I want you guys, the next time you hear someone talking about how transphobic someone is, please pay attention to who is saying it. I think I know what transphobia looks like. And try as I might, and as many people are I guess you would, to tell me you're that transphobic. JK Rowling was transphobic <laughs> in these tweets, I'm not seeing it as a trans woman. And that's my gen- Because you're just calling trans women like the tea slur before so yeah i guess you would know however blair's commitment to this standpoint would be tried once more when rowling released a crime novel directly spawning further allegations of transphobia due to its portrayal of a character who doesn't conform to traditional gender roles as a sadistic predator this was the rallying cry for blair to drop her hot take so in typical form she uploaded a video declaring she'd read the book and that people were once more overreacting to a simple detail how could we doubt such an informed observer this time everyone is up and I'm hoping this guy gives us the perspective on that more because I've heard that book thing before and on the outside it doesn't sound that bad from just from what we just heard. Um, just because the main character is like a trans predator or something doesn't necessarily mean it's anti-trans. But I'm curious with the context. I'm about her new book being released called Troubled Blood. And just a heads up, I read the book. The concept of being a transvestite makes a very quick brief fleeting appearance in the book and it's extremely unimportant it comes in the form of one line in the book one page in a 900 page book and it's where the killer is described in one of the instances of him snatching a woman up as wearing a disguise of a wig and a woman's coat that's it i'm not kidding that's it that is everything to do that you could even remotely if you really stretch your mind sort of bring that to the idea of transgenderism 
Well, the first red flags come when you realize she is wrong. In fact, there are multiple pages that could be deemed troublesome in their content. But okay, maybe Blair just... Um... Let's see, there's... I guess we have to read these now, huh? I mean, that would be... There was little Dennis, <laughs> melting on the Wheel of Fortune, and Jenny's code anonymous worker called the president. Some of them. It doesn't, these, these lines don't really seem particularly transphobic to me. It seems like they made a book about a person, a guy, I think it's a male cross-dresser, based on what I'm reading, that um, made a book about like a male cross-dresser being a sexual predator. I think that the area where you would draw a comparison to transphobia would be the, in questioning why did she feel the need to make a book about... Um, It would be more, why did she feel the need to make a book about somebody weaponizing, like, I guess, transness in order to be a sexual predator towards women? That would be the question I'd ask more than, like, those specific lines aren't as troubling as that overarching, like, narr potential narrative. Missed other references. We all know she's not the most meticulous sometimes. Well, this becomes even more concerning when you realize that she was not even the first person to make this specific error. In fact, this incorrect assertion had been published in a Spectator article a few days prior and also spoken about on public interviews. I want to read this excerpt from a review on The Spectator that I completely agree with. With. Let me put it like this. When you reach the last pages, the full absurdity of the statement that Rowling's moral seems to be never trust a man in a dress will be revealed. Just going back to the book itself, it, from what I understand, it's simply just one line. And it's, it's not even necessarily referring to the killer as a transvestite. I think it just mentions that the killer at one point wore a wig and a woman's coat. So that there is no trans rhetoric coming out of this book at all. Then you combine this with the fact that she claimed to have read a 900 page book in the space of 12 hours, which although not impossible, seems even less likely to be the truth Sounds of the impossible to me, dude. Available. It's like when two people sitting next to each other make the exact same mistake in a test. You kind of know that one of them is cheating. Because coming from the perspective of someone who did read this book in the last 24 hours, there's no honest, genuine way you can link the two. I mean, honestly, anyone coming to the conclusion that this somehow demonizes transgender people is either lying or has not read the book or is really, really nutty. Some may have admired Blair's readiness to defend Rowling against the, quote, woke brigade. But if she was prepared to falsely claim she had conducted research that she actually hadn't with the intent to bestow herself with extra credibility, how trustworthy was she as a source and as a creator? And how many were beginning to take notice? While I do believe that her book is extremely problematic, and before you even comment, like, did you even read it? Yes, bitch. I read the book. At least I read the first 10 chapters that were free. I was not about to pay this woman for her book. And honestly, the first 10 chapters are all you need to read to like determine that one, Blair's a liar, and two, JK Rowling is a little like- I Most of the excerpts I've referenced in the previous part were derived from a video by trans YouTuber Samantha Lux, who made a video responding to Blair, not just correcting the misinformation in her video, but also responding to a lot of the ensuing arguments that Blair had averted. Blair demanded in her video that she is not a cross-dresser and she's not a transvestite. So to say that characters like Buffalo Bill or to say characters like Dennis Creed have any impact on her would be offensive. Girl. Girl. It is not only incorrect to say that, but it's wildly irresponsible. I'm not claiming that these movies or even J.K. Rowling's new book should be trashed or that you can't watch them or enjoy them. All I'm trying to say is that we need to be aware of the ways that representation of identities in media affect our perception of those identities. It's a pretty solid response, and it certainly brought some previously wandering eyes firmly onto Miss White's questionable groundwork and rectitude. There have been doubts earlier on in the year related to her coverage of Darby Vanity, where she appeared to use the source material of another creator known as Tamimi while contorting the perspective to protect the infamous Jeffree Star. Blair White, the person who has gained over 500,000 subscribers for doing this, omitted information in her video and then lied about it. Oh, right, that's because she used some of my clips in her video, and I could tell this specifically from the music I've used, and also from the pictures that I personally edited out so that way my video wouldn't get buried in the algorithm. But in the first, like, 60 seconds, I want to say, of my Davi Vanity video, I put up screenshots where Jeffree Star says these tweets, and then 
I emphasize the date on it. And then right after, there's another clip of him talking about going on tours and doing all this stuff with Davi and supporting him again and making a song. And then boom, there's a date on it again. And Blair White had the audacity to omit that information. She clipped it out and made it seem like, wow, Jeffree Star is this hero for saying something about Davi Vanity and never mentioned the fact that he had retracted his statements. If you support that piece of shit, then unfollow me because you're supporting child Davy is the lowest worthless scum I've ever met. When Jeffree Star tweeted what he tweeted about um, Davy being a pedophile, Jeffree worked with him afterwards, which shocked me. I thought it was, you know, Jeffree worked with him and then tweeted that and then it was over. What do you mean you didn't have all of the facts? They were right there, 20 seconds into the video of mine that you downloaded for your video. That's a lie, Blair. At the time, however, in spite of the pretty irrefutable evidence contributing to this pattern, this didn't seem to affect her reputation too much. Partly because the original video included this as a chapter rather than as a dedicated subject. And although a more popular video was also posted on the subject, some people struggled to follow it without the background information. Combine this with the fact that this was still a footnote in Blair's greater video, and she was exposing someone rather reprehensible nonetheless, and most people appear to let it slide. She would also appear to go against Jeffree Star in a later video. Isn't Dobby Vanity's that fucking scumbag that was um, in that in the band, Blood on the Dance Floor? Is that what I'm, t am I right about that? He's a real scum fucking piece of shit. Right, am I right about that? I think I'm right about that video, though, some found it slightly convenient. It covers James Charles and another unnamed YouTuber, and it's a very uneasy upload to say the least, with Blair mostly rambling once again, feeling like she was attempting to find a reason to publish a video with a snappy title, but ultimately culminating to very little. What? You know what I'm saying? Like, if this is my first interaction with you, and you feel comfortable to tell me this, thinking that I'm just going to be in on this little game and complicit, and he he he, no! That's something serious. And yes, it did take me a month to do this video, but that's because I have been scared. This is something serious. And I wanna be very clear, this is not my place to out this person, you know, the victim's name, because this is clearly their story to tell. But you guys have to understand the position I'm in. If I receive credible information that a very famous, very powerful YouTuber is a sexual molester or predator, but am I complicit with helping cover up for a predator, by not saying that at least that much is true. I have to say, I do find the tone in the video rather confusing because although I think it's fair to call Jeffrey out for his pathetic behavior, I was confused as to what trap Blair was breaking out of exactly by going public with this information after it was already public. But I digress. What matters is that the JK Rowling video attracted attention towards Blair's potential missteps. Though once again, I think people were more focused on the present and it would likely phase out as it normally does, provided she didn't exacerbate the situation with greater blunders. But Blair's errors were always pretty scattershot in their occurrence, so what were the chances that would happen? Well, maybe she tempted fate one too many times. And with that in mind, let's talk about trans athletes. And there are plenty of female athletes that could absolutely wipe the floor with me. Female athletes in the comments, just comment what sport you want to beat me in because you can do it any of them, pick one. Transgender athletes is another subject of interest on the Blair White Network, and it's not hard to see why, as it, like many other channel favorites, it pertains to gender identity and how it interacts with other social variables. It has similarly been the center of heated debate for a few years, given the often gendered nature of sports and questions surrounding the suitability of individuals whose gender identity, some feel, could give them an unfair physical advantage against cisgender athletes. With sure. this in mind, yeah. you can probably take a guess where Blair stands. Sports teams are segregated for biological reasons. Therefore, even for trans people, you have to take biology into account, and it should not just be based on identity. It should be based on their bodies and their puberty they went through. How early did they transition? How late did they transition? I think all of that matters. Well, little surprise there. But up until September of 20... Well, why is that? That's not a bad take. I mean, I think it's a reasonable take to say I think that trans women, for instance, have a biological advantage unless they didn't go through a female puberty or a woman's puberty or whatever. You get what I'm saying? It's not like a... I mean, I'm sure people disagree. I agree with it. But it's not like a divisive take, I feel. The 20, she hadn't really been caught up in too much controversy, mostly holding her own within the discourse on the affair, partly accountable to the fact that there is still some ambiguity within the public sphere, even on the more liberal side of the political spectrum. Therefore, it must have seemed like a routine upload when she decided to criticize a transgender powerlifter. Ah, uh, yeah, I saw the Jane Marie Croc thing. I saw that. Yeah, that was shitty. I watched that. I was actually, I'm a big fan of Jaina. Um, I think she's great. I remember when she was identified as Matt Krasinski. Or Matt Croc, uh, pretty cool, really uh, great athlete. So I think this whole thing centralized around her. L I don't know if it was a lie or a misconception, but spreading the misinformation that Jaina wanted to compete professionally as a female powerlifter, but she never did at all. She just wanted to lift. So that was the, I think that's where the, the whole drama comes around. But competing against women, despite the visible bodily superiority. The bigger point is the idea, the concept of Janae competing against oh, biological women oh, is- Oh, it's Janae, no, my bad. 
ludicrous. It's almost intentionally ignorant. And anyone who thinks that that is some sort of level playing field is a liar. I mean, the audacity of anyone to pretend or insist that there are no very obvious benefits that Janae, as someone who developed completely male well into her adulthood, would enjoy when competing against people who did not develop male is insanity. She metaphorically tackles the person at the crux of this curious case, Janae Marie Croc, and moves on. However, there was one little hitch. And something we don't often see is that Janae actually went back post-transition and competing against men just because, I guess. Like, it was kind of like, she's gone back and forth competing with men and women based on I don't know what. Oh, that's shitty. Maybe they, if that is true, if they did do that, it would be just to compete. I mean, not, not, I would be, and not compete with, you know, women. But one of the things about powerlifting is, like, when you compete, you're not really, like, you're competing. Like, obviously, the person with the biggest totals at the, at the event is going to be the winner. But for the most part, you're really just competing against yourself, so, or having fun. I mean, like, for the most part, most people don't have a shot at winning a powerlifting competition. So you're really just there to beat your old PRs. And uh, Janae, I guess is the name. Uh, I thought it was Jane on my bed. Um, maybe they were trying to beat their own like PRs post transition. It's entirely possible, or see where they're at, or maybe just be there to have fun. And uh... um, I mean that's just a dick move. No pun intended. This was all fundamentally untrue. Yes, Croc had long made the commitment to not compete against women. But okay, Blair made a false assumption. This isn't new territory. While you see, the information that Croc would not be competing against women under any circumstances was actually written in one of the posts that Blair references. In fact, it's in the post that Blair uses to push her point Janae Marie Croc is competing against women. Up until that point in the video, although it had been- I know she said that. Did she also make a point about competing against men too? I, I think I heard that right. Okay. Clyde, she'd mostly spoken about Croc's involvement in women's competitions, as if it was a hypothetical. With this post, she solidified that assumption, when really, reading that post should have debunked it. Not soon after the upload, Croc posts a comment on the video, and a separate Instagram statement expressing her yeah, dismay at the misinformation that. being disseminated, and the consequences it could have. This was also picked up pretty quickly by a fair few online, with creator Sam Collins uploading a response to Blair around a week after, primarily covering this mishap alongside other prior incidents. In spite of this criticism, though, Blair- All you can really do at that point, Blair, is say, oops, I fucked up on the information, and I was being a dickhead. I know that's really all you could do. What did she do, though? I'm really curious because I don't know the backlash. This this was pretty early on, I guess, into my like commentary career, so I didn't really talk about it or pick up on it. Did not respond. This was not out of the ordinary for her. She was used to being castigated by communities. This time, though, the outrage didn't subside. In fact, as she appeared to provide people with radio silence, their annoyance only grew, demanding more accountability from someone of her size. As the videos and comments piled up, it became clear that this was something that had to be addressed. And in mid-October, two to three weeks after Janae's initial comment, the video was finally removed. At this point, though, Why? a mere retraction take so wouldn't long. suffice for many viewers. She had already caused excessive harm, and that needed to be rectified. Not just for her sake, but for the sake of the affected. Well, it's not that it's necessarily. Well, I guess she did cause harm because people probably looked at that and said, like, oh my god, are you serious? They're not going to fact check that because people are fucking lazy as shit. They want to double down on their confirmation bias. So, yeah, she does need to definitely say something. Party. At the same time, as some began to take note of her other transgressions that had previously flown under the radar, the backlash began to augment in new ways, and some began to wonder how much Blair had to apologize for. So, I want to be as clear and upfront in this video as I humanly can be because I have essentially disabled myself from being as clear and upfront as I need to be. Well, we were about to find out. Let's find out. Let's get right into the news. I'm fucking delirious. Blair right released now. two apologies. A just for context, I don't like Keemstar. It just fucking pops into my head to say random shit sometimes. Version and a video copy. The text version coming on the 15th of October, and the upload coming approximately a fortnight later. I assume this was because some had felt the Twitter format was not extensive enough in the audience that it would reach. Because as themes go, neither diverged too much from the counterpart's core message. She made a mistake, a fundamental shortcoming in research. She never published it with the intent of deceiving anyone, and that since she had become conscious to these failings, and now has been taking these steps to resolve the situation with Janae, transferring the AdSense money she had made from the video after it had been deleted. With that said, there are a couple of curious observations that one can make on closer analysis. I've always found the, unlike many trans athletes, a rather strange comment. I'm not entirely sure what the intention of that interjection was, whether it was to shoehorn in a political point or to try and make sense of her misguided assumption. Regardless, there's no way Blair would know how many trans athletes compete against cis athletes, or if it's a majority. But anyhow, the main issue is actually buying her response that she could have sincerely missed this information when it was readily available to her. But she at least admitted it was sloppy. In the text post, she announced a hiatus, which is formally concluded with her video. So she's clearly taken a bit of time to refine her thoughts and provide her viewers with a more lucid reflection in certain aspects. In the background, I'm on a work trip and I'm doing my best to film with no light and just weird hotel vibes. So I want to be as 
clear and upfront in this video as I humanly can be because I have essentially disabled myself from being as clear and upfront as I need to be in the recent weeks due to me going offline and not having any social media apps on my phone. Uh, but now that I'm logging back in, I'm seeing a sentiment of people who definitely want me to talk about this again, but this time in video form. And I actually want to as well, so I'm here to do that. Two weeks ago, I posted a public apology to someone that I highlighted in a recent video of mine, which is now taken down. It was a video on trans athletes. In this video, I highlighted a couple different trans athletes and I talked about upcoming legislation. What's going on, guys? We're just in the middle of a segment. Sure that's like relevant to the topic. Uh, but long story short, one of. I, I missed what she was saying there. It's probably something stupid. <laughs> and I talked about upcoming legislature that's like relevant to the topic uh, but long story short one of the trans athletes named Janae I really fumbled her story I got her all wrong it is for no other reason than my own lack of due diligence and my own lack of sufficient research on her story that I said that I genuinely did think it, it did not come from a deceptive place I was under the misconception that she competes in both men and women's leagues she corrected it and said actually just men's leagues and to be frank there is just no excuse for that kind of inaccuracy to be present in any of my videos and well I don't think that's just the problem too because you did say that like oh you basically questioned their transness when you said something along the lines of like oh make a make take make a choice why are you competing as a man and or a woman you know what I mean that's kind of invalidating the way that you promoted it, which shows a fundamental lack of understanding of the way powerlifting works. Again, powerlifting is just about competing against yourself really more than anything else, unless you're super serious. I mean, there are people, but most people that go in powerlifting are just trying to beat their own PR. So their personal records are their personal best. So, you know. I definitely never wanted to happen again. I took the video down and I also, <sighs> once I got paid from YouTube just a couple days ago, I actually sent her the totality of the AdSense revenue that I accrued from that video. She also explained okay. her delayed response, yielding from her reputation as a bit of a renegade to many who chastised her, and how it influenced her perception of the criticism that she was receiving. Also, I know that some people are critical of the delayed response I had when I apologized to Janae, and for that, I also have to say I'm sorry. I think the unfortunate thing is it took me a lot longer than it should have to differentiate between valid criticism and hate. And it wasn't the right thing to do, but I think that for a minute there I had my blinders on because I'm so used to sort of you know, I do controversial topics on every video, so there's always people mad, and I think to a certain extent, I was almost just in this rhythm where like, post a video, people are mad, post a video, people are mad, but this time, obviously people were mad for a valid reason, and okay. it was always valid, and I should have recognized it even sooner. However, her reflection appeared to have obscured her memory on other fronts, as her JK Rowling ebook had now become a physical copy. Being a long, obnoxiously thick novel of JK Rowling's for research to doing such incredibly subpar research on the second video, but I did, and it was dumb, and I am sorry. It was slightly ironic that this statement followed after a persistent contention that she would not lie intentionally, but I understand why she used this as an example to try and emphasize that this was an exception rather than a chronic issue with her content. Listen, I'm I know I'm running around right now. I'm looking for a fucking sheep. I can't find any goddamn. I need to kill two more fucking sheep and skin them. And I just think they don't exist. I don't know where they are. And it's pissing me the fuck off. I'm being absolutely honest with you. And that's why I'm running around like an asshole right now. It's pissing me the fuck off. But here's the problem. It does seem to be a chronic issue. And it couldn't be stressed more than in this scenario. As just a learning opportunity to implement that in every area of my life. Here and in my real life. I'm not infallible. I am most definitely susceptible to getting things wrong. And it's really how you respond to it once you do get it wrong that makes all the difference. And I totally get that. In the context of the video, it's presented. Yeah, I mean, it seems pretty genuine. It's just that it is, it's bizarre that it seems to happen quite a bit, and like bizarrely often. And then it's a reasonable response. We've all made mistakes. We've all made videos we regret in hindsight, content that we would have done differently. And for anyone to act holier than thou in such a situation is hardly justified. Unfortunately, with the information available on her previous actions that she had simply not addressed in the past, it became increasingly hard to fully trust her account, especially with the JK Rowling gaffe in mind. It would be easy to read this as her only choosing to respond when she actually faced consequences for her inaccuracies. She had lost over 20,000 subscribers by this point, and although such a sign may make you more conscious, many more cynical views felt like her hand had been forced to save her skin. At the time, though, many were simply not aware of this and welcomed her apology with open arms. She didn't necessarily need to make a video statement. So what she provided was a solid step up. However, not too long after, the tide once more began to turn, as the content of those critical of her began to accumulate. However, the fatal blow could be attributed to someone by the name of D'Angelo Wallace. The JK Rowling book? How did she say she got it? Overnight shipping, a long, obnoxiously thick novel. Overnight shipping? But I thought she said in her book review that... I spent the last 12 hours reading it as an ebook. So she didn't read it. D'Angelo Wallace had been mostly known for making videos on subject primarily involved in more tabloid drama up to this point. Pretty comprehensively, I'll add. Though I'm not going to stroke his ego too much as he's probably watching this video right now. So he knows what he does. His video on Blair White served in part as a doc 
documenting of this pattern of behavior that we've discussed throughout this episode, but also took the time to respond to our admission video, pointing out what a more casual viewer may have missed, drawing unparalleled amounts of attention to an abundance of inconsistencies, causing many to flood the comment section of the videos with these observations, and swing the like-dislike ratio in a much more unfair direction. Mm. Unfortunately, Blair's apology really needed to be flawless to avoid being picked apart by many of those who had come out in force against her, and it just wasn't. It was made with a precision similar to the videos she was being called out for in the first place, and as more turned their ire towards her, Blair's impassioned pleas were gradually being weathered away. However, it didn't stop there, because as D'Angelo Wallace's video came out very shortly after Blair's response, its time meant it served almost as a retort in itself. But Wallace nonetheless also took a great amount of time to tell his own story. I used to be a huge Blairite fan. I personally disagreed with her conservative opinions, but that was never what she really centered her content around when it comes to YouTube anyway. I mean, she is a writer for this conservative publication called The Post Millennial, but as far as her videos go, she mostly just provides a perspective on things that happen that's alternative to the ones people typically run with and i found that fascinating what i'm trying to say here basically is like i was super transphobic when i was watching her content i'm not saying like oh i was raised this way or i didn't know i legitimately believed that trans people were irrational unless they were exactly like blair white and that's Insane. His upload spanning just over an hour addresses his parasocial relationship with the creator in question, and deconstructs her appeal as a supposedly transgender spokesperson for the community, ravaging the fabric of many of her principles and asserting that much of her content was built on belittling other trans people who didn't match up to her standards. Here, or the one thing here. It's this entire pattern. And now when I think about the fact that she has gone after somebody like Janine Marie Kroc, who absolutely fits the description of being non-binary and says so. I'm nearly positive that Blair Wright has done this on purpose, because it's what she's always done since 2016, is trying to make these people look bad so Blair can feel better. This not just shifted focus towards the inconsistencies in Blair's content, but also towards what many found in her, particularly those who may have placed her on a pedestal previously. Sure, she had always branded herself as problematic, but I think many still held her in higher regard than the light that a lot of these negative videos cast her in. Even the ethos of her predator exposés were brought into contention. All of a sudden, the significance of her apology video was dwarfed by something greater, the issue of whether her content had been tainted by the same toxicity that had been illuminated in this debacle. D'Angelo would argue so. But was that the entire story? Well, let's talk about it. All right. So, so far, she got caught in a lie. Yeah, she does seem to have a pattern of just trying to do her best to invalidate non-binary people. Okay. The Angelo approached Blair White from the perspective shit. of a former viewer, and even supporter of Blair, and this created a case that was very compelling in itself. In part two, I want to look at Blair Wright's track record of mistakes, and what they say about the kind of person that she is on YouTube. And I want to do this from the perspective of a former fan. His video walked us through the process of realization, many of which he had only come to understand himself somewhat recently, being told with a harsh sense of self-reflection, and consequently provoking the question for more conscientious audience members who may hold their creators to high account. The fact that he doesn't pull any punches against his own past self means that he does not need to compromise on his own presentation of Blair. I mentioned earlier that I used to be a pretty big fan of Blair White, but when I stopped watching her, I didn't just unsubscribe. I stopped and questioned myself and had to evaluate why I was ever subscribed in the first place. I could claim that it was just because I wanted to hear the opinions of a trans person, but if anything has become clear by now, there are much better people on the platform who can speak up for their trans experiences. This personal connection within D'Angelo reached Blair White viewers who themselves were prone to disillusionment, and as people began to experience this epiphany through the lens that Wallace presented, some decided to make known their dissatisfaction by using the only physically tangible method they have beyond likes and comments, taking up their qualms with the unsubscribe button. In the comment section, beyond the many expressing shock at some of Blair's actions, others wrote to confess that they themselves had been won over by her rhetoric without considering it seriously. It seems that D'Angelo's message had effectively broken through. But why though? After all, much of what she was being called out for was hardly surprising, and the catalyst for all this hullabaloo was a research error that most would probably feel isn't worth crucifying someone over. Hell, it wouldn't necessarily change her viewpoint as long as there were grounds for it to still exist, which as noted, there was. And on her offensive content, well... I know that casually saying the n-word with a hard R means you're definitely racist. So literally use the uh, n-word with a hard R because they're angry at someone and they're screaming at them. I don't care, and I'll be super honest, I like do that when I'm playing video games, or I do that if I like stub my toe, like, I do that, so I don't really care. You screen things out of anger, you scream the n-word hard R? Sometimes. <laughs> Oh my god, okay. I didn't see her address those in the Truth About My Racist Past video. Go back a few years and you had one of the most prominent commentators on YouTube arguing that slurs were completely acceptable. And whether you like that or not, the truth is that it's not a deal breaker for a lot of audiences. So beyond this and D'Angelo's ability to relate feelings and responsibility to those watching, how did this video show Blair up to the point where she was hemorrhaging? It's like so weird, right? Because it's bizarre that you'd be so comfortable to take that perspective. And not even that you would just do it, like, but you would be like, yeah, 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 who gives a shit? I, I screw it. Like, like, you're proud of it almost? Like, that's a fucking take. I think the the most part you'd be like, yeah, I do it sometimes out of habit, but I'm fucking ashamed of myself. Subscribers faster than she was before. I really do feel as though this is sort of a very simple, natural consequence of sort of the entirety of the trans community, their activists and the wokies, as we call them, really plugging their ears at every ounce of evidence that people are constantly trying to give them that like, look, it's not about hating trans people. It's not about like having horrible feelings towards them. It's literally just- This is this a long video, fair. yeah. And it's obvious. Can you guys please address this? And they just don't. We're in for, we're for the long haul, fellas. Her videos, but herself as a whole. She bases a lot of her assertive persona on the stances she takes and the fact that she has a grasp on them. She walked that balance of being the outspoken person who isn't afraid to say it as she 
she sees it. But if that's not how she actually sees it, if her vision is that obfuscated, what grounds does she have to say it? How can you justify all the jibes and snarky comments without the grounds? At that point, you risk reducing yourself to an edgelord with no greater purpose than to stir the pot. People questioned how she could sincerely hold the beliefs if she wouldn't properly evidence them. On a more serious note, many felt with the misinformation that she purported, this could lead to false beliefs being held about marginalized groups that may drive bigotry and discrimination. This also compromises elements of her demeanor, because when you reverse the logic, you realize that everyone she has characterized as being unreasonable activists who hated her because she was spit in facts may have actually just been critics who were irked by the alleged mistruths propagated in her content, and her status as this pariah becomes much more apt. The shoe is on the other foot now. I'm also highly aware that apologies, especially on the internet, are not just some magical fix-all of the situation, and that you really do have to pledge to just do better going forward, and I'm definitely giving each and every person watching this that pledge. And what could Blair say to this? Well, to be honest, it was a very rough predicament, given she had already admitted to making a mistake. Creators were free to draw their own conclusions from it if they were well evidenced. She could respond, but it would risk prolonging the turmoil that she was already going through, and possibly inflicting more losses onto herself. Unless she had some receipts to turn the situation on its head, it wasn't worth the hassle. So she moved on to calling out Amos Yee, who is completely deserving of being called out. Of course, she had to make the point that no one else was talking about it, other than these people, of course. But that's just the Interesting. So I guess she also engages in the tactic of... Um calling people out when she's in trouble to try to be like look i know i'm bad but they're worse and then to try to like downplay her thing try to put them in the spotlight because i criticized her uh, trisha for that but i guess this is just trisha if trisha was actually trans clickbait game. The video itself is fine, but with that shadow still over her, it seemed that much of the momentum that she had was now against her, with a gross subscriber loss of over 70,000. Some Jesus, may wonder if that is truly really? fair on someone who hasn't done anything of the scale and consequence of some that we have given airtime on this channel before. But at that point, she had been charged with the crime of influence. In my opinion, Blair White is the most irrational one out of them all, and it's not because she's transgender or for any reason other than the fact that she is a liar who wants to manipulate the emotions of the whole world into becoming evidence for something that she knows isn't true. I'm not saying she was being persecuted here for having unbased opinions. It was a great point claiming that she was either being unbelievably reckless with her platform or that she was just an outwardly bad actor, and that convinced many to withdraw their support. It was difficult to argue against it with the volume of evidence available, and I think the most disheartening fact was the revelation that very little had changed over the years which had passed, even if it was presented under a different guise. Blair had gravitated from the outdated cliques of certain viewpoints to 2016 and the trouble they would often instigate, which was great. However, this ultimately worked against Blair because whereas in past situations such as the Riley Dennis case, the behavior could be chalked up to certain communities and environmental factors causing her perception to be colored, it became apparent to many that these shenanigans transcended external variables. Even as she moved into the mainstream eye, she perpetuated a lot of these issues. Even as some had warned her and called her out, she had time to fix this, and ultimately it was a Blair White problem, which is why she suffered to the extent she did, and why videos like D'Angelo's hit as hard as they did. As a matter of fact, many commentators had clearly cottoned onto this, because they were all choosing to come up with their own hypotheses for what personal motives drove Blair to act in this way, latching onto the examples of invalidation to push another fairly common hypothesis we previously considered, the good transgender person. I cannot even tell you the thousands of emails, thousands of comments that I got from people who had literally no understanding of trans people before that Jessica Haney story, and when they saw my video calling it out, and they realized that I'm trans calling it out, their perspective was changed 1000%, and suddenly they realized, I shouldn't have painted the entire community with that brush, and this girl seems normal, this girl's cool, and that was what happened. Like, no, there are normal trans people out there who don't believe all these radical things. However, this only really addresses a personal philosophy that may drive certain aspects of her beliefs, and risks overlooking the actual conduct that landed her in this jam in the first place. It's a jump that ignores a few steps, and I'd like to take a moment to step over the- It's very interesting, because it kind of makes sense. Like, I understand where people are coming from. It's like, her perspective seemed fairly reasonable, she was a little hyperbolic, a little intense. Most people gave her the benefit of the doubt, so when that one girl originally, was her name Riley? I don't remember what her name was. But Blair was lying about that person transitioning for whatever reason, or not transitioning. And then it's like, oh, the motive was probably just that they thought that thing and they were just being ignorant. But then now it seems like there's a motive that's constructive, which seems fairly credible that she just hates non-binary people so much that she's just going to go after a non-binary person. Than myself, because I do believe there was a bit of disparity in what people actually believed here. Do not fear, we'll cross the bridge of what Blair's personal philosophy precipitates when we reach it. Beyond the fact that it is of course just theory, whether well backed up or not, I'm sure there are a few people who likely feel the way that Blair does, yet for some reason they haven't ended up in the public quagmire for peddling misinformation on the internet. Blaming that solely on what Blair believes seems somewhat insubstantial. Misinformation comes down to more fundamentally two explanations, negligence or malice. Or both, maybe who knows. Some may be inclined to say that this is a case of negligence, that's what Blair herself said. As a matter of fact, mm. she actually alludes to it in her video, making this bold claim in her defense. You know with the Jane Marie, the Janae Marie Croc one? Janae? It was the, the her information was right in that thing, and she skipped it. But I've done stuff like that before. Well, I'll read something and just misinterpret it. I feel like she can't be that stupid to intentionally like read an article that would debunk her and then include the article in the video. So I feel like that one was just was misinformation. Was that was just like uh, ignorance, not malice? I forget what they said, but you know what I mean. 
while I know some people think this was intentional deception on my part, I can guarantee you this is not the case. Lying about something that the public can then go correct you on is only slightly more dumb than not doing enough research and coming to a false conclusion. And it was a really dumb moment. Toe wrestling is a competitive sport, guys. I don't know if you knew that, but... On my part. That's probably the most exciting part of this video. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and I'm not taking away from that, but I also would like it to be known that it was not malicious intent or something that was intentional. Now on paper, it's not like this doesn't hold water. It would be incredibly counterproductive for her to intentionally spout falsified content when she was already under scrutiny. There were other examples that would have been more appropriate, examples she had referenced in the past herself. To some, maybe Blair's biases had finally conquered her. She went into the video with a perspective first and didn't pay mind to any information that would actually counter this, and could have easily prevented this faux pas. It wouldn't have been difficult to find a new subject and uphold her point of view, right? Well, I suppose it depends on what point you believe she's trying to make. This is where we can reintroduce the point that many were articulating, that she'd like to make an example out of those trans people who didn't look like her. And in many ways, the uploading question was no exception. I'm not making fun of her appearance. I mean, I think that obviously her appearance is outlandish, and I think that even she would admit that, because how could she not? But that's the point. The bigger point is... <laughs> this was one of the comments that many harped on when criticizing her. It felt like... I think they're talking about... Are they talking about Jaina Marie? Jaina Marie? That's very interesting. Um, Because, like, Jaina Marie... So, if somebody said that Jaina Marie's uh, appearance was outlandish... I could interpret that one of two ways. Either it's transphobic or they're very large and muscular. I think that all bodybuilders and a lot of powerlifters have an outlandish physique, right? And it's and the reason I brought that up is because when I when she said that that like I'm assuming they're talking about Janae Marie. My first thought was like, yeah, Janae Marie's appearance is outlandish. She's fucking huge. Like, have you seen her? She's a huge fucking powerlifter. I think that she actually does bodybuilding now. So, like, I just think fundamentally all powerlifters, well, more all body, those are, are you know, uh, outlandish. But she probably means it from a trans perspective of invalidation. And the reason I think it's important is because she seems to say a lot of things that have multiple interpretations and people will tend to give her the benefit of the doubt on what that interpretation is. Like, in that sense, my first thought was like, yeah, it's probably just because she is. It is outlandish. But, like, I think it actually is it's supposed to be some kind of a transphobic invalidation thing. She was going after an individual on the basis that a person did not appear as orthodox as she did. And this is what motivated her to single out Janae. Was this enough for her to discount information that would serve to the contrary? Well, some would argue that as well. Especially given only the video before, many believed that she had lied about reading a book she never did. Especially given it was a lie that she subsequently repeated in a video where she expressed remorse. If lying was easy, then how could we trust her intent on any other front? Well, the truth is that you can't, but does that definitively mean that it was an act of malice? You see, her comments about J.K. Rowling's book was definitely one to bolster her credibility, and likely views as well. It was daft and would justifiably prompt one to question the integrity of future comments about her tenacity. However, this is mostly a disposable comment, which although she shouldn't have made, also wouldn't have had the greatest implications whether she had actually read the book or not. In fact, if she had her facts straight, nobody would have any reason to disbelieve that she read the book, even if she didn't. It's easy to make an aside comment to try and outperform fellow commentators in the algorithm. That doesn't mean you're capable of knowingly twisting information about other people that could, in reality, be borderline defamatory. However, you could also respond to this by saying that Blair had been called out for this behavior on a continuous basis. There are more than ample warning signs that her research was not sufficient and that she would regularly either dismiss this criticism or sweep it under the rug. Now, to be honest, I wouldn't necessarily expect her to address every individual mistake, when she wasn't the only person who fell foul to fake news. However, the fact that she clearly was aware of certain incidents and reacted to them, such as the drag queen one, for example, should have been an indicator that she needed to tread more carefully. But it Well, uh, to me, Claire, by the way, just seems fucking dumb right so it seems like she again like she has an audience of conservative people that like to hear a particular thing and i don't think that she's necessarily grifting i think what it is is that she sees a story and she she was or at some point because i don't know if she posts that much now she's desperate for a story to get views of course because like, people are addicted to views as well as money money probably more than anything else um and so she'll bypass she's like oh this is a hot story. Let me make a video on it so that I can get people to watch because I know they'll tune in. And so I feel like, and again, I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt. What did I just talk about before? How people give her the benefit of the doubt too much. Um, that would be what I would say, though. Dude, what is it, what is it though? Because I just realized, like, I'm giving her a massive benefit of the doubt, saying that, like, I think that she's just being ignorant because I've been in the space where, like, you're like, oh, a hot topic like thing. Let me talk about this even if it's not right or not, whether it's right or not. But maybe there's just like a weird phenomenon with Blair White that people just give her the benefit of the doubt. I wonder what it is. I genuinely wonder what it is. Maybe it's, I don't really know. It's interesting. Never felt like she- Because I give people the benefit of the doubt fundamentally, but I feel like maybe I'm doing it more or maybe, maybe I'm right. I don't know. It's hard to tell now. Now I'm just questioning myself and my general perceptions. Love her. And that made it much harder to defend her. However, the question still begged. What did Blair really have to gain from being so intentionally dishonest? 
Well, I guess the obvious one would be clout from pandering to an audience's ideology. In the case of some creators, they'll find a niche, realize they're somewhat limited in their scope, and begin twisting or stretching stories to their audience tastes, even if that means not being completely transparent. There are some cases where it feels like Blair. Yeah, that's like the shittiest thing in the world. I think the my least like oh, that was my least favorite part of my content. My least favorite thing about my old content was that I would get a lot of views on some a lot of it on TikTok, like a lot of views. But I would but the people's like responses to my videos were so disgusting. Like I would make a point about a particular topic. I might make a joke or something. Um, but it wasn't lighthearted. Like I would make a, an edgy joke and I was just having fun, but they would interpret it as this horrible thing. And it was like, wow, my audience is like fucking scum shit. It's, 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 it's frustrating. Did this such as the Trump hat in Hollywood. However, by 2020, I wouldn't say that her audience had a collective credo and she could have easily taken a more moderate standpoint and not been strung up. She'd done that before with the transgender bathroom issue and not been criticized. So it does point to something personal and arguably possibly the most malicious explanation. The idea that Blair was trying to indoctrinate her viewers, using content calling out prejudices to advance her moral standing and then capitalizing on that with dangerously slanted opinion pieces based off dubious sources that she knew wasn't the case. This would indeed be a very ruinous portrait and would certainly explain at least a fair majority of what we've discussed. However, it is also based on assumptions whose verity we can't be certain of. It goes on the pivotal assumption that Blair knew she was lying in each of the stories, which although plausible is not the sole explanation. You can say a lot of things about me and I know I'm messy. I'm a messy ass bitch. This is nothing new. Everyone who knows me knows it. Everyone who doesn't know me but hears about me knows it. It's true. Many of Blair White's videos emanated the high school goss energy, and Blair's demeanor similarly matched that. She never appeared to be openly vitriolic towards anyone, but she constantly walked the line very precariously, blurring the boundaries between idle-minded errors and intentional manipulation. The failure to provide proper information and omit a lot of relevant facts appeared to be a result of laziness of research, and the fact that she based a lot of her material off other creators who were also heavily biased. She'd come in with her own preconceived narratives and not question the intent. Her controversies often showed her as being impulsive, petty, and in a way self-interested, but not really in a particularly calculated manner. To paraphrase Blair a bit more unflatteringly, one would expect a person to be a bit smart if they really wanted to take advantage of their audience in such a way. I'd say the greatest lie that Blair has maintained is this idea that she is some high research creator who is working behind the scenes, when really she's just a T YouTube who talks politics. With that said, there were other situations such as- That <laughs> mood here, brother. <laughs> I, that's, that's pretty much what I am now. I'm a T YouTuber that talks politics sometimes. Let me tell you, man, it's so much better than talking like pure politics. It's just fucking exhausting. It's so toxic. Discourse doesn't truly exist. Like political comment, they, they, a, lot of, a lot of political content creators, they like to pretend that they're all for discourse, but they're really just looking for hot gotcha clips. They're a bunch of fucking losers. That like really all pol political YouTube is fucking political tea, honestly. <laughs> it's looking for their hot take, their jump on point that they can be fucking obnoxious for. It's just so toxic. It's lame, dude. It's fucking dumb. Certain response videos where it became very hard to believe that she'd missed information, or cases where it seems she was presenting slanted points of view. The fact that she leaves next to no references means <sighs> that people can't fact check her as easily, and may make one question why she T is a guilty pleasure for sure, man. She does it. Maybe she knows her sources are a bit unreliable. More importantly, though, this is why Blair's biases have come to the forefront of her content in the first place. Otherwise, no one would really be able to challenge her opinions too deeply, provided they felt like they were properly derived from the actual observations that could be made. Too many times, her opinions led the videos rather than the subjects themselves, and that was a detriment to her and those that she spoke about. We you know, know what's what interesting, though, is that she seems to have a bias against non-binary people. Um, and it's an interesting... It's just an interesting... And this is just, I'm just bringing up this point, uh, just like a point. So... It's interesting because generally, like, if, if, if she had a... And the reason that she has this bias seems to be because she feels like non-binary people invalidate her um, identification as trans. What's interesting, though, is if she had uh, a bias against cisgendered people, it would be more socially palatable for her to be, a, like, hate, like, have a bias against cisgendered people than it is about non-binary people because of, like, whatever oppression chart exists. It's just interesting. It's probably more socially acceptable. It really is more socially acceptable. It'll be like, yeah, I don't like cisgender people than it is to say, hey, I don't like non-binary people, even as a trans person. Very interesting. What these opinions are at this stage, but what can be said beyond that? Well, let's go there now. As said, I've never watched Blair White routinely, but I know a fair few people who have, and one of the recurring comments that stopped them from watching her was the fact that her takes became predictable. This is never a good trait to attribute to a creator, but I think it's worse when you're dealing with information that is warped to suit your predictability. What does that mean, predictable? Like... Because, what does that mean, predictable? I, I, it's like, I would generally assume that somebody that you've been consuming for a while would have takes that you would expect. Like, you know, if, if, if somebody brought up a fucking case about something, I don't know, in my channel, I would probably have, you'd probably know what the take is going to be. Maybe I'd have some nuanced points or whatever. Um, but it's more about talking about a hot topic issue. So, you know, like if something happened tomorrow where I don't, I don't really know how to fucking what example to bring up with this, but I would imagine everybody would be like, yeah, I expect this person to take a particular take. So what does predictable mean? 
As the years passed and she became more mainstream, she may have changed, but not necessarily in a way that rectified the previous issues that she'd been called out for. As a matter of fact, you could harken back to one early video that clearly reflects her core views to this day. So I think this meme pretty much sums up how I feel, but I will go into more detail. So yeah, I think all these identities are largely bullshit. I think they're super arbitrary. I think they're super meaningless. I think people who take them on are usually extremely boring and have nothing else to their personality other than I'm demi-queer, non-binary, genderfuck, special snowflake kin. This mostly unsubstantiated idea that many of the people she railed against in certain scenarios were concocting their gender identities for attention. And you know, on the internet, sure, there are people who go to extreme measures in certain communities, but many of the- It's very interesting though, because she makes that point and about how people that identify as, you know, I guess not binary or whatever, uh, demi queer, also the weird shit. <laughs> not demi queer, demisexual. I'm not even getting into it, but demisexual is when you feel you can't have sex with somebody or you don't feel attracted to somebody until you have a very strong connection. It sounds a little bit more like traditional values, whatever. It's not the point of this video. But what's interesting is that she, her, she seems to think everybody that's non binary is acting out of um, some kind of a disingenuous nature and that they don't really exist and that they're not valid. And I wonder if she's projecting. Like, I wonder, because a lot of times people will project their feelings onto other people um, in general, you know, like if you have somebody who has trust issues, uh, they're going to expect you not to trust them, I guess is what you'd say, right? Um, so I wonder if she actually is aware that she's, like the, the, maybe, maybe it is an actual active, like, dishonesty thing people she would go on to subsequently make an example of were not people who she had any way of backing up such a claim other than her own prejudices. In her first ever upload during her brief anti-feminist phase, she talks about the differences between how men and women are treated in society. She does reference some evidence-based arguments, but as we noted, talks about her personal experience as well. The term ladies first is definitely something that's actually implemented. It's not just a phrase. Um, and while these are sort of frivolous examples, I do think there's something worth noting um, about the quality of life that women experience based on operating through a society that's just kinder to them, that's just more polite to them. You know what's really interesting about that point? I want to bring, I have, I've been dying to bring this up and I should have brought it up earlier when they made this point. So like, yeah, there are male privileges, female privileges, whatever, privileges, whatever. But I want to give you guys a little anecdote. I was driving the other day, well, actually maybe a month or so ago with Mama Gut. We're driving on the, and I, uh, we're driving on the road and we saw some maintenance people, you know, on the side of the road, digging up the ground and there's somebody operating a machinery and there was one woman there and of course she was holding the sign, right? And my my first thought was to make a joke. I was like, of course the woman's holding the sign, not doing any work, right? And um, then Mama Gut says to me, she says, do you think that she's holding the sign because she's not strong enough or not capable to do any other job? Or do you think that she's holding the sign because the men there don't think that she's capable of doing the job, so they just threw her on the sign? And I sat there for a minute, and I was like, that's a really interesting question. I started to think that, like, you know, when I, in my period of being a manager, I would generally go out of my way to do things for women, not because I thought down on women, but because, you know, chivalry and whatnot. And I remember a specific instance where my boss, it was, uh, it was wintertime. It was very cold out. And I used to work outside, so it was whatever. And my boss didn't. She was uh, a road supervisor. She's a great boss. But she was a road supervisor, and so they didn't usually work outside. And then we had to organize buses for um, the snow. The next day it was a snowstorm. So we, we organized buses. Instead of parking them in their spots, we line them up in like rows of 10 so that they can plow the whole place, and then you can move the buses easy, and then you can plow that spot. And uh, she was supposed to be out there the whole night with me. And I was like, don't worry about it. I got, I'll take care of the whole thing. And then she's like, okay. And that was it. And, you know, I was wondering, like, maybe there's like a bias that I didn't realize existed there. Um, I don't know. But I wonder if that's it. Because think about it. Do you think that that woman working the thing couldn't operate fucking machinery? Like machinery technology is the ultimate equalizer, right? Like men and women can operate a fucking forklift or whatever it was. It was like a steamroller, I guess. The same capacity. So I really do wonder, like, there, I'm sure there is a factor of women not being able to... Women generally aren't as physically strong as men, but then also there's probably there's definitely got to be a factor of men just perceiving women as weaker and being like, eh, fuck it. The way that I, you should operate is like, hey, do you think you can handle this job? Rather than just be like, yeah, just go on the sign. So it's a very interesting thing that she brought up. Yeah, it could be both. I think it's always a mixture of both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's always like a mixture of both of those things. It's just a very th interesting thing to think about. It's just more welcoming of them. It's curious because those she has most vitriol towards, in many ways, are the people who are already receiving a lot of stigma from the communities that surround them. And if you are to consider how society treats you on a personal level as a form of privilege, then...
Mama God is too smart, yeah. That's why I love her. Many of the people that blare her ranks are some of the most alienated in society, whether that was the transgender women who struggled to pass or non-binary people who identify in a way that is contrary to traditional gender roles. So to pose the question, why would these people act in ways that are attention-seeking if there is so little to prospectively gain? And who are we to say beyond a shadow of a doubt those are acting in such a way regardless unless there is serious evidence to prove it. The other point that Blair would regularly advocate is the one that she doesn't want to be thrown under an umbrella with certain individuals who may not have shared similar experiences that one would consider inclusive of what she feels constitutes as transgender. What really gets me about that is that there are so many different letters in the LGBT acronym at this point. I think we all know it's basically the entire alphabet plus some numbers. So there's all these micro distinctions. This is this type of person. This is this type of person. This is this type of person. But yet for me saying, okay, I'm different than that is a problem. She seems highly insecure about the fact that she may also have to share the spotlight. I don't know what that means. Uh, but like, I see there's a general argument from people who aren't ingrained in the LGBTQ community that like, we, I'm going to say we because I'm part of We just don't get it and we don't care. And I know that sounds harsh, but I want to explain, right? So... You know, LGBT makes sense, right? But to be hyper, then I think that everybody should be educated on what that means and be like compassionate towards people and advocate for their rights. But then after that, it's like, how much do we really need to be educated? Like, do I need to understand the hyper specific labels? I feel like I don't really need to. You know, like it's not really like, hey, non binary. And then if you have like a really deep perspective or whatever, it's like, I don't need, I, I as a normal, as a, as a normal, that's obviously shitty of me to say. It's not what I meant to say. Obviously, it's a shitty slip. My bad. But as somebody who's not ingrained in the LGBTQ community, I don't think that we have to be super hyper educated on like the hyper specifics to like know like an entire chart. Like this isn't something that I would say is necessary. People should have a general understanding of like lesbian and gay, which is like the same thing, honestly. Um, bisexual, trans, you know. Um, I didn't know transsexual was actually part of that. Is that I thought that LGBT? Like, I thought that I thought that was like a dated term. Anyway, point is, is like I wouldn't expect somebody that to really have a deep understanding of like pansexuality or asexual. I don't, you know, or even like what queer. I really don't even understand what queer means in it. I just don't get it. I, you know, it just I thought it was a blanket term for everything. But I think that, that my point that you get my point. Alphabet plus some numbers. So there's all these micro distinctions. This Why is she going to strong community? She just has different opinions, and I think that she hates non-binary people. <laughs> Jeez. This is this type of person. This is this type of person. This is this type of person. But yet, for me saying, okay, I'm this? different than that is a problem. She seems highly insecure about the fact that she may also have to share the spotlight with people who haven't gone through medical procedures, which I'm sure are highly distressing experiences, and I would never take yeah. that away from anyone. Nonetheless, anyone who's subjected to additional social stigma for not conforming to binaries like Blair does is still another form of suffering. Most people would probably just like to live in peace away from that. When it comes to this issue, Blair says it pretty succinctly herself and the goal of trans people is to operate within the binary as in moving from one to the other she wants to exist within the gender binary which is good i'm happy for her however it feels like she's driven by this slippery slope argument that the transgender community and society as a whole will just evolve into this there's an edit for every single section this is like the weirdest edit <laughs> like it's just it seems almost like i'm not you know so like it's good it's not bad edit but comparatively it seems very basic this totalitarian civilization where everyone announces their pronouns before they initiate a conversation and those who don't conform will be thrown into the gulag. An exaggeration, I'm aware, but she frames it as if many non-binary people are motivated to deconstructing the gender binary as we know it. Despite the fact that many non-binary people also identify with traditional gender roles as well. This isn't just the case of non-binary people though, this is the problem with Blair's rhetoric in general and one that reared its head again with the Janae Marie Croc situation. That claim that some fabric of what we're used to is going to be lost. And hey, trying to preserve tradition is in part what makes her conservative. I understand that. However, it feels like Blair's reaching for bogeymen to raise one's level of concern when a lot of the time a situation is more bogeymen. <laughs> <laughs> more nuanced than it appears, right. watering it down with notions that she's long established but not necessarily thought to check if it's completely relevant to the point that she's making in the first place. Hell, in a video a few uploads after a big apology where she responds to a video with a person who identifies as a dog, she falls foul to this once more. The only thing I know about this before watching it is that this is a trans man who is also a trans dog. If you think I'm saying this to make fun of this person, that is not the case. This is literally how this person describes themselves. A trans man who also identifies as a dog. 2020. Same here. That's good. Bella, look at your cousin. <laughs> The issue is that this person never said they identify as a dog, and a quick watch of the full video will show you that this is roleplay. That plays any time that a person- Okay, well, listen, if you think I'm gonna be like, oh, God, you got her, you got her. All right, so maybe it's like a little shitty to call him a trans dog, but also pet plays fucking, like, come on. Come on. It's a little bizarre. Okay, we just watched that whole fucking zoo file thing. I don't know, man. I'm not super quick to defend people who dress as- You do you. Dress as a fucking dog if you want, but I don't- <laughs> I mean, come on. You know, I hope those dogs are okay. That's all I have to say. This person takes on the role of an animal, um, and they emulate that animal, either through their behavior or their actions. However, it's put in the original video's title as a bit of clickbait, I suppose, and Blair just runs with it without...
Identify as a dog, yeah. Demonstrating any semblance of critical thinking and playing into the biases that she's been known to possess time and time again. The identify as a dog thing. I identify as a man and also as a dog thing. Like, it makes a mockery of actual trans people and y'all don't need me to even tell you that. Like, y'all know. This perfectly feeds into the millions of people on social media. Just search up the terms I identify as. Just, it's like a big joke. Like, well, I mean, in this case, like, I didn't watch the whole video, right? And so what this person is saying is that in the video, they clear, they clear up that she doesn't identify as a dog. Or they, sorry. The he? Was it a trans man? Whatever. You get my point. That person identifies as a dog. Um, or they don't identify as a dog. But in the title, it says that they do. So, quick, what we have to understand about titles of stuff and, and, and thumbnails is that thumbnails and titles are prime, priming. Always. So, if I make a video titled... Uh, I fucking hate chickens. And then I go into the video and you watch it and it's a moderate take about how I think chickens are kind of just shitty, but I don't hate them. You've, I've already primed you to believe that I hate chickens. So it, it's not unreasonable for you to be like, yeah, this guy hates chickens. It's a, it's a priming. It's a, it's a tactic. So like, I'm not going to go like fucking balls deep on that. Like it's a joke. Like I identify as a helicopter. I identify as this phone. I identify as this hairbrush. And it adds such an extra layer that the person is actually, you know, a trans man supposedly like why are you equating like why are you doing that you're blurring lines that <laughs> and see that that sticks out to me more than anything else this person's a trans man supposedly right like that that is something i would have honed it on more than anything else that in factor of invalidation is is more accurate than anything else i feel I would prefer not to be blurred. And here's the thing. With this in mind, I do think the mainstream media mishandles trans issues in a way that may provoke some people to be defensive of their identity. True, the Mr. Potato Head thing is being more gender neutral. Like, who gave a fuck about that? Like, there are people had a meltdown. Like, who gives a fucking it's a toy potato? Like, who gives a shit? Who fucking cares? If you want your, if you want this to still be Mr. Potato Head, this is what you do. Check it out. You buy it, and then you just tell your kid it's called Mr. Potato Head. I fucking blew your mind on that. Kids can't read. Hot take. So, who gives a fuck? You know what I'm saying? Like, who gives a shit? Um, I've never liked the idea of singular spokespeople for a whole community of extremely diverse individuals. And I do think a lot of them take advantage of the shock value that some may provoke. But you have to see through that. The greatest problem is that instead of merely calling out the coverage of a lot of this content on these failings, Blair goes one step further and in a way contradicts herself. Now, she does call the mainstream media out sometimes, but then goes on to assume a lot of the stories as prototypical, often using them to denigrate other trans identities, whether she intends to or not. However, I think once you Potato. establish the fact that a lot of the time, the media and third party sources can be highly unreliable narrators in representing your community, you have to consider how they may have changed the perception of a story and where the truth actually lies. Blair makes this argument that, to put it quaintly, feels like she's frustrated that the attention on certain individuals begins to erase her own lived experience and warp this idea of what the community is really like. But her response is to try and undermine these people's identities, sometimes with the same points that are levied against her community in the first place. It's cruel and counterproductive. No community is going to represent identical experiences. No group of people is even going to share all of them together. We are different. And I don't think people in any community should need to compete for validation. Does that mean they're the same? Of course not. But does that mean that a person can't share a label that many believe to be inclusive anyway. Hell no. I don't think Blair accomplishes anything by putting people down in such a way, and the fact that her points aren't well grounded makes her own biases even more blatant. Maybe there is more work to be done. But I you know what's interesting is that like um I don't think it's an unreasonable perspective to say, hey listen, like um non binary people non binary people are valid. I just don't think that they should fall under the trans blanket. Right. I could see why people would say that because they're very different experiences. But she doesn't say that. She just invalidates by non binary people. She doesn't say like hey I understand there's a struggle but they should be categorized differently. She's she's saying like, hey, I think that this is morally reprehensible and invalidates me. And I get the invalidation part, but there doesn't even seem to be a, um, an attempt to try and understand and be somewhat like reasonable about it, you know? Or, like, uh, empathetic about it. But I don't think Blair ever presented a solution, and I don't think she's changing. But what changes should be made? It's easy to sit here and point out the problems, but what's the solution? Whoa, we got a we got a nature editor here, baby. Woo! At the start of the video, when I stated that I was at least surprised that I found myself on this alongside Blair. I Why do we need Keemstars and SES covering stuff when we have other people, the right opinion, a bunch of other people? Oh, they got Blair White as one of their yummies, okay. I guess the shock wasn't just because of what I knew her previously for, but how I recognized that a best begrudged ambivalence many critics still held towards her. How she was. It's funny that this guy fucking like, he's like, I fucking hated that they, that they collected uh, her and me together. Pissed me off. <laughs> still disliked by a lot of people. The issues were still prevalent, and I think it made her position more vulnerable given the number of those who looked to her for reasons other than her politics. I questioned a lot whether I should make this part in past or present tense, given the fact that a lot of it is obviously retrospective, and she has definitely mitigated some of her rhetoric. However, Blair has continued to slip up in delivering information, and I'm writing most recently with a story about a person by the name of Barbie Kardashian, who is worse than Jessica Yanith. Nice little throwback reference there. The star 
of today's video is someone by the name of Barbie Kardashian. Yes, this mugshot is real. This is not a creepypasta. And this story is probably the most disgusting and disturbing instances of a trans person being put into a women's prison. And I say trans person in quotations, you will see why this person is basically just like he and Eve on steroids. I would say on hormones, but that's not the case. The video once again circulates information from very slanted websites and doesn't really address the actual situation, including this picture, which lacks a source. After some reading, I'd say the allegations against the woman appear to be true, though they're taken from a report which keeps the original individual anonymous, but it adds up. The mugshot may be true because the Garda did release one to its officers. However, one site just said they obtained it and no one questioned it. However, Blair, once again falling foul to the pseudo common sense position, implies that a take on this matter is the moderate one. I think there are problems with both ends of the extreme, and so I'm going to offer some solutions in this video that are outside of that. I know a lot of people, maybe even they're watching this video, are more comfortable with keeping it simple in their minds, which, you know, biological sex you're born as, that's what prison you go to. And then other people are going to be more on the extreme of if this person says they're a woman, they're a woman, put them in the women's prison. But these sort of absolutist extremist positions are what gets us into 99% of the messes we get into in all areas of when it comes to trans people. For example, me in their right mind who would think that if God forbid, y'all caught me slipping and convicted me of some kind of crime, that I would be best placed into a men's prison. Of course, Blair, we should have an independent board which assesses when people are woman enough to be permitted to women's prisons. Genius. Here's the thing, and in my humble opinion, in part a reason for why so many people in the past took to Blair. I don't think our philosophy is one that is completely alien, particularly in 2016. Born out of a frustration at certain institutions, individuals, and their somewhat obnoxious doctrines, you see the antics and it causes a gut reaction. A lot of people felt about them, and some- You know what's interesting? I, this is like a new thing that I've been thinking about, so don't, don't uh, shit on me for it. But it's interesting that we are very concerned about trans women um, or men pretending to be trans women to get into prisons with other women so that they could harm them in some capacity, right? But I feel like if you're super afraid of somebody doing that, you're afraid of a trans woman going to a woman's prison so that they can assault a woman, it sounds like there's a fundamental problem with our prison system. Like, how could that happen in our system? Shouldn't it be designed to watch everybody equally um, and to, to, you know, change people into being more productive citizens? I don't know. I've been just thinking a lot about how prison is fun. Our prison system is fucking worthless and it doesn't actually give people opportunities. It just kind of puts people into a space, a uh, timeout, and then come out worse off because they're going to have been uh, pushed into the stresses of prison of prison life. Uh, they're not really getting any job training. They're not coming out any better. They're going to probably get passed up on job applications just because they have a, uh, uh, they've done time. I would say, if anything, uh, you know, if somebody can go into jail or prison or whatever from like a relatively like low level crime, like, oh, I was selling drugs. And then all of a sudden you go into prison and then like, you just become a worse person because of the environment you're in. So I don't know. Still feel it today, especially when they feel like they're on the receiving end of it. There definitely are people out there who make unreasonable demands of those around them, some who are far too hostile and unpleasant in trying to pursue their causes, and others who I think are too sensitive and far too overreaching in what they try to police. Quite, American prisons are questionable at best, bro. Not even. We have like a 78% res, uh, recidivism rate in the first five years. Like people are going to jail and going back right after they get out. It's not working. It's a fucking, we have a failure of a system. You know, the other day, uh, there was a TikToker, like a pr guy in prison with a cell phone. And people sent it to me and they were like, dude, this is ridiculous. Why do they have cell phones? I'm like, who the fuck cares if someone in prison has a cell phone? Like, I feel like I like I feel like we are very programmed to think that people in prison deserve to be treated like fucking shit. There are people who do deserve that, like murderers and rapists for sure. But if you got a dude who went to jail for selling drugs, chances are that guy went to jail for selling drugs because he had no other fucking like a not, he didn't have a better opportunity. And he's not a horrible person. He's just being an asshole, you know, and they're going to treat him like shit. No, we should give him job training, you know, figure out how to fucking strengthen the local economy so that there's more jobs available. Righteousness doesn't always make you right, and I'll be the first to say that. I think the issue is that even to this day, a lot of us tend to base our beliefs as a reaction to the environments around us, rather than the bigger picture. If you do not listen to her, your event will be shut down right now. Right now. Your decision. What the hell's happening? We are going to we are going to let you on the mic. Okay, okay. All right. So we are trying to be reasonable. We are trying to be. We are trying to be reasonable. We are trying. We're going to give you. We're going to let you on the mic. We are going to give you the mic. Well, after Senator Sanders. 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 Why are people yelling? What the fuck is happening? What's the context here? These guys are going fucking ballistic. Why is this like a? What what is this? They just, their Senator Sanders is speaking, and then they just need to wait their turn. They're going to let them on the mic. I get so fucking mad, dude. I'd be pissed. Someone yelling in my fucking face like that. Oh, my God.
I am reasonable. Ah! Like, that's fucking insane, dude. After Senator Sanders. After Senator Sanders. After Senator Then given how someone documented to- What's the fucking context there? What the fuck? Been behaving, it made Blair's existence as a creator easier to justify, and consequently normalized a lot of the actions that we now reflect on with distaste. However, over the years, for a lot of people, it's been about understanding that actually, even if the previous criticisms leveled towards certain individuals may be valid, it doesn't mandate complete opposition to them or their ideology. In the case of Blair, this sense of closure seems to have been replaced with a greater and greater straw man of what these people may collectively want and why it's wrong, despite the fact that there isn't necessarily a clear consensus that could easily define their interests beyond acceptance. This then leads to certain sweeping statements and comments which may as well be from those on the other side of the aisle. I've been there before, trying to fight the middle ground because you see people who claim to speak for your interests who don't even want to consider your it was a Black Lives Matter rally that was disrupted Bernie Sanders. This is six years ago. I mean, it's not a long clip, so I kind of want to watch it. Seattle for South America. Moments later, Black Lives Matter activists rush the stage. We are trying. We're going to give you. We're going to let you on the mic. Activists who last year shut down a holiday tree lighting in the St. Park today prevented the most progressive candidate for president from speaking to thousands of people who came to hear him. I came here to join this rally and watch what was going on. Not thought Sanders waited patiently. We are shut it down. We, will, we will shut it down. After about 20 minutes, Sanders' wife Jane appeared to give the signal it was time to go. Soon after. Okay, wait, what the fuck? Wait, where's the context? Oh, welcome back. You are looking at this now live. Marissa, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Tamara. Okay, so let's first clarify something, Tamara, because I've been inundated with tweets that say you're not actually part of the Black Lives Matter movement. There have been others who actually have said, and again, who knows if people are, why you were on that stage, from that you were a plant from Palin, to that you're not a part of the Black Lives A lot of people have progressed in this. Yeah, my name is Marissa Johnson, and um, I grew up with Tea Party parents, and I no longer believe that anymore. A lot of people have progressed in this moment, and where black people are, where all of us are being radicalized um, and changing our views on a lot of things. But I think it's really interesting to note that no one is really engaging with the content of what I said on the stage. I read out a lot of claims about Seattle and Seattle's racism and our national racism, and yet people are trying to go after my personal character and just derail and derail and derail. And that signals to me that the thing. Right, I don't care. This is like she's shut the fuck up. She's uh, just she's being annoying. Um, I don't know. I why well, yell? They were like, yeah, we'll give you the mic, and then I would be like, okay. Like that's like I get it. Be a little aggressive, and then but once you get your way, like why? So they they broke. They got up on stage, and then they're like, okay, we're gonna let you speak after, and they're like no, and then then they ended up not speaking or something. Your own opinion as a member of that group, but at the same time, arguing for the contrary without the conscious recognition of that can be just as destructive. I remember uploading a video myself towards the end of 2017 on Riley Dennis when I was in that genre, which would be chronologically after Blair had apologized to Riley, and even. Though I expressed my many disagreements with her, the most backlash I received was for actually addressing her as a woman. For many in that genre, the damage had already been done. And I think there's a point where you have to recognize that when you position yourself against people, you're just playing into the division that you seem so driven to resolve. Blair appeared to have that realization herself, but then just regressed back to it, just for a different set of people. In a way, she hasn't changed. She just goes after people who are indisputably terrible and uses it to indirectly demean their trans identity instead. And sometimes she just doesn't even go after people who are terrible anyway. In 2020, the year where I think everyone was just about tired of smoke and mirrors, the extremes we were being driven to, Blair may have been looked towards as a saving grace, but I think it ultimately led to her position being unraveled because people had enough. Those who didn't believe her position as the creator standing up for Isn't that fucked, man? This is one of the big that's one of the things I learned as a as a content creator early on. Um is that like there's gonna there are moments like you have your ups and downs. There's moments where people like your content or don't like your content or really enjoy like a take or a topic you're talking about, but then you know they're not gonna be always be popular or whatever. And there's times where you have like lulls, like low points in your content. And a lot of times when people have that, instead of just being patient and chilling, maybe making content that you enjoy, they're desperate to maintain their viewership or like the amount of views they're getting. So they'll make some fucking crazy shit just so people will watch it, which is something that I did. And uh, I did that on TikTok and it got banned. And I'm actually happy about that because it's made me a better content creator. And now I have, like, have that on, on YouTube. And I have like times where I get like a lot, like for me, a lot of views and times where I don't get a lot of views. And instead of being upset that I don't get a ton of views on when I'm having like a low point, I'm just like, okay, this is okay. I mean, just post stuff that I like. And then there's going to be a topic that I'll cover and I'm going to have another spurt again. It's not that big of a deal. Like I don't always have to be maintaining like lots of views. It's ridiculous. Common sense was legitimate. Common sense isn't built. I feel like that's where she's caught in. Because, you know, there's gonna, there probably was a time where she could have been, like, huge. It could have been, like, a moment that would have really blown her up. And people would have been like, wow, I really appreciate that perspective. But now she's kind of killed her credibility for chasing a story, you know?
on one's sense of centrism or compromise, it's built on a philosophy that values information, research, and rigorous discourse, whether that leads to positions that are left or right wing. And that's the thing. Anyone could go over Blair's videos, pick apart every time she's wrong, every time she's been reckless or irresponsible, oh my God. Her, but that wouldn't make you better than her. And it certainly doesn't make me better than her. Everyone fucks up. The difference is that Blair's problem is one that fundamentally underlines her career on YouTube, her own philosophy, which is continuously laid more and more bare every time she makes the exact same mistakes. It's not a popular opinion, it's not a politically correct opinion, but I've never been one for political correctness, so yeah. Back when she started, you could see the potential. You know, it's like interesting. It's so weird. Like I have times where I'll acknowledge that I'm edgy or whatever. But it's so weird when people say stuff like that where they're like, oh, um, like, oh, I'm edgy. Or they'll be like, oh, no, rather they'll be like, I, I'm not politically correct. Or I'm controversial. And I don't know. Like, can context it makes sense if you're talking about it's like, yeah, I know I'm not controversial, but that makes sense. But like when you, I don't know, there's something about it. Like when you actively say I'm controversial, to me, it's just like weird. I, it's hard to express this as perspective. It's just weird. It's almost like you're like, yeah, I'm controversial intentionally. Like I'm, I think I'm controversial somewhat unintentionally. Like I just like to speak my mind and do what I got to like say what I feel like I need to say. But some people are like, I'm controversial. I like, I like that I'm kind. Con- I don't, I don't like that I'm controversial. I just happen to be because of the way that I express myself online, especially since I'm a, a blunt person. Um, and I'm not everybody's, you know cup of tea which i totally get so i'm unintentionally controversial but <laughs> i feel like there's people like blair white re- reads it's like uh i'm controversial because i'm trying to be and it's so interesting because if we get super woke here when you look at blair white and she's an attractive person so and, and that's relevant is because of the halo effect right attractive people people who align with uh the beauty standards of the like the, the, the atmosphere they're in so in this case western beauty standards uh, tend to get more leeway, right? So I'm it's like, she's somebody who's blunt intentionally and divisive and people give her a break, but I'm somebody who's not traditionally attractive, which is fine. And I'm blunt, but I get interpreted as being harsher also because I'm a large man. That's a part of like the implicit bias of people who perceive me. And it's just very interesting the way that it works. Cause I think that I'm probably like less hyperbolic than Blair white, but it seems like she's gotten a lot of breaks in her intensity that I don't, which I'm not asking to get those breaks. Like I'm fine with the way that I present myself. There are positives to being a big, scary man as well, for sure. Of course, I'm just, I'm just saying that it's very interesting. I'm always wary of people who are like, I'm controversial. I'm con, I'm, I'm controversial. You know what I mean? The creator that she is today, her channel always felt like a very personal. Ba- you only time you disagree with me is on is Elon, Ethan. Fuck you. I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm curious. What is it that uh, you disagree with me? I'm just genuinely curious. Uh, and you watch all my videos. I appreciate that. Except for the re-uploads of the clips. Yeah, that, because you watch the podcast. I really appreciate that. Venture with many videos definitely discussing her experiences and stories. However, there were also prevalent flaws which show- Bro, we made it fucking two hours through this video. And, this, and then but somebody had to ask me a fucking question about Blair White's fucking penis. Like, wh- I didn't think that we were- I was like, I was thinking at the beginning, I'm like, I'm, someone's going to ask about it. And we made it through the whole video. Seven minutes left. And someone asks if they have Blair White has a big penis. So thank you. Thank you. You fucking, we almost, we were this close. We were this close. Owed her nature to jump to conclusions and points that felt strained to prove a greater thesis which wasn't always there. At the same time, there were definitely reasons to think she could alleviate these. She used some references here and there, seemed quite open to discussion, and was definitely part of a greater community which could be partially accountable for the atmosphere that bred certain behaviors. Yet, that just hasn't happened. In a way, Blair White is the only YouTuber I've come across who uses less references in her videos now than when she started, despite the fact that I'd argue it's more important than any time before. Calling out people for heinous actions gives you a greater imperative to justify it, whether other people assume it to be true or not, whether it has been established. Also, it's really not missed on me that in recent years, it seems like a really cheap, easy way to get a lot of media attention for celebrities to come out as they, them, and non-binary and trans and all that. And of course, it's very convenient to come out as a they, them, because you don't have to actually commit to any sort of transition. Courtney Stodden, Sam Smith, the guy from Queer Eye who's- I mean, there's a there's an argument there. It, there is an argument there. I feel like there are people who are, what you call them, trans trenders, who don't really have um, any type of differing experience with their gender identity that will still say it because it's socially acceptable and it makes you look good. It's the same thing as like a celebrity saying they're like bisexual or something when they're married because they can't act on it. So it's like, who the, what the fuck does it matter if you're bisexual? You know what I mean? Like not, not ones that are bisexual and then get married. People who are like, they're like, oh, I'm straight. But then all of a sudden they're together for a while. Like, oh, I'm bisexual now. It's like, well, what the fuck? Like, what, where's, you can't, you're not going to put your money where your mouth is because you're in, a, you're married. So like, okay. But the thing is, is like you really can't identify those people, except for Trisha Paytas. You can identify that one, but 
So it's one of those things where you think of that privately or you think of it in a general sense, right? So I wouldn't sit here and start counting out non-binary people or people identifying as non-binary that I would think aren't, right? I would, because that's shitty. You know, it's one of those things where it's like, they say that they're that thing and like, what is it? You know, what are you going to do about it? Like, I'm not going to fucking sit here and be like, I don't think such and such. And so like making the general point that I just made, I think is fine. But then all of a sudden, if you're applying it to people, like you really don't know what they're saying or thinking. So unless there's some kind of factual evidence somehow, it's really just like not worth engaging in. And it's kind of shitty because for all we know, all those people, that means a lot to them, their gender. Or maybe they're just older and experiencing gender now. Like I mean, It could be because trans issues are trending and they're looking for attention. It could be because now they feel comfortable actually exploring what their gender means to them. I don't fucking know. I, you know, you could think that they're weird, whatever, but, you know, you, to, to sit here and specifically point them out publicly seems like kind of a shitty tactic. The name I can't remember, the one who looks like Jesus. The actor we talked about earlier was Tree and Tree Self. And literally just so many more I can't even think of. And I'm Calls himself a tree? All right, then that's a little weird, but whatever. I'm not saying every single one of them is disingenuine, but, like, it's a little too convenient that it's just one after another, after another, after another, when you know that if this was 2014 or 2013 before this was even a trend, they would not be coming out. Oh, yeah, but we also know at those times that those people would be told to fucking kill themselves. Honestly, terrible things would be said about them because we weren't as, as inviting of a space. Like, dude, like gay marriage wasn't legalized till what, like 2015? 20, am I right about that? You know what I mean? Like, we've moved very quickly as a society in our acceptance, you know? So we have to remember that even five years ago, it was fucking crazy different socially. Given the fact that the only real influential variable that has remained consistent is that personal sentiment she appears to possess, many people feel that she is attempting to separate herself in a way to obtain acceptance from those who may be more skeptical of certain identities. If that's how she personally feels, then I can't take that away from her. But it's not how you run a channel that claims to be bridging the divide, given how much her personal sentiments surface in those videos. I don't think society is a negotiation table where you bargain who's going to be accepted to satisfy the most individuals. In the grand scheme of things, that's not moderation to me. It's appeasement. Moderation isn't only about what opinions you have, though it does influence it. It is a state of mind, and on too many occasions, Blair failed to exercise it. I wouldn't care if you were a conservative, liberal, or progressive, that stands independently to me. That duty couldn't be more valuable as Blair had shoehorned herself into the mainstream. People wanted that recognition of nuance, that attention to detail, the moral obligation. But they didn't find it, because Blair's opinions often didn't extend in a way that went beyond countercultural conservatism. That whole counterculture position never felt like it had too many beliefs to stand on on its own merit. And you can only be against so many people before those around you wonder what you're really for. If you don't back up your positions, then what reason do people have to trust you over those you paint as the extremists, some of whom hardly have the most extreme views? If Blair wants to give us moderation, then she has to represent the other side rather than just her response to assume absolutists. There is a discussion about trans people included or excluded from it and what is the right way to navigate, right? And my friend and I both agree that the trans community as it stands now will never achieve full acceptance and how we've almost noticed an uptick in like anti-trans people and almost like a resurgence of people who like straight up don't like trans people, don't get it, are very turned off by the community and by trans ideology and then actually lash out at us like in an anti-trans way. As many other creators have already observed, there are other... That's an interesting statement to make because I'm sure that there's a level of truth to that with some toxic like trans people some toxic trans people online perpetuating like this weird narrative could be turning people off to transness but it's also interesting that if you're a content creator who is trans and you validate transphobic responses and remarks and perspectives then you could quite possibly be encouraging the transphobia so it's interesting that Blair White actually might have a uh, negative role to play in the acceptance of trans people because she, you know, a normal person I think would look at like the modern new age, like some of the modern bullshit trans narratives, like the the the, the, the crazy million gender bullshit, right? As like it's it's honestly outliers in the community. Like there's some people who say it. It's fun to make fun of sometimes, but they're outliers. They're not they're not generally representative of most trans people. Most trans people are just fucking trying to live their life and go to work and fucking they're just trying to wake up, eat, take a shit, and have kids. Most it's just like a, any other person. But when you make your content solely off of deplatforming and invalidating other trans people, you're really just encouraging people's like in, like what we call it, implicit biases. Right, you're really just encouraging because people, a lot of people that are more moderate leaning, they can be susceptible to being pulled in either direction. If you, if you, you know, you just have an open mind and you're trying to do what you feel is like logical, you can, you know, they, they might there's to set the people that would be susceptible to be uh, becoming more transphobic, and I think Blair White would have a contribution to that, saying like this is what a real trans person looks like. And you're very passable. And since most people aren't passable trans women, all of a sudden, most trans women aren't valid by your own logic. 
And I think that's what she does, whether it's like uh, intentionally and directly or unintentionally and indirectly. Individuals who cover a variety of trans issues in a balanced and detailed way, and in much more depth, some of whom have gone to lengths in the past to correct some of Blair's shortcomings. I don't think this means that Blair's perhaps lightweight content should be banished from the platform, but I think it also has to be done with perspective for what it represents, and at least with an active effort to distinguish what point should be drawn from such an upload. Otherwise, people give it too much consequence in what it could say about communities, and she needs to be more mindful when dealing with the topics that do carry that substance. Blair needs to be more sensitive on that front, whether she wants to retain that nonchalant brazen attitude or not. She's still a creator who takes themselves seriously enough to make videos about online scoundrels alongside some pretty strong words. These things have consequence. But sometimes things just cross a line, and on several occasions, I cross a line. And I'm sorry. We've all learned the hard way, but we own it and we work out how to improve. Yet over the years, the changes to Blair's channel feel cosmetic, made to resent the feeling of progression, some apology, some alleged reconciliation, but you strip away the makeup and it's the same foundation that it was before. And as the internet changed, those flaws became clear. Makeup is temporary, what's underneath is permanent. And I'll make this clear, I think Blair is far from the worst political creator on YouTube, but she suffered the most because she played the riskiest game. Her audience held her in very high regard. She appealed to those in the mainstream, some of whom very conscious of their ideas and still- I have a, qu I have a question. <clears throat> Who do you think is the worst political, uh, that's my question. I'm being uh, fucking 100% serious. Somebody ask this guy. Who is your least favorite? Who do you think is the worst political commentator? on YouTube. I'm genuinely curious. Piled straw onto the beleaguered panel. A part of me believes that she does hold her beliefs close to her heart, because as she said herself, much of her failure to present solid information isn't the best option. But she I've had a couple of political things come up in my thing, and there's some fucking dumb fucking political people, bro. There's some fucking... <sighs> It's not even worth mentioning it because these people are so toxic and desperate for attention that if I said something about them, it's possible that they're like, oh my God, this fat, bald piece of shit <laughs> said something about me. I want attention, but it's like, oh my God, so all these people are fucking dumb. They say some dumb shit for attention. A lot of times it's for attention. They'll say something fucking outlandish just for attention. Like just, they'll say something fucking preposterous, insane. Just so that like people will watch them, even if it's negative attention. I don't know what kind of fucking person does that. It's insane. You can and it's they're they're very obviously could never possibly believe these things. They're just so dumb that nobody could ever believe it. Like it's, it's fucking crazy. Continues to do it. Yet a connection to a bygone era that may be worth letting go. Through old friends and new enemies and the incessant drama. Time may have passed. Like, I'm just gonna say one of them. Like I watched sort of, like a fucking debate about somebody that was like, oh, we shouldn't have man you shouldn't f have mandatory schooling. Like, you shouldn't force kids to go to school. You should just let them pick. And it's like, bro, are you kidding me? I cut school constantly. Like, that's a dumb perspective. There are so many people who would just not go to school. Like, you can make the school experience better while also forcing kids to get an education. We already have a fucking crippling education crisis in the United States. Like, I don't think the solution is telling people that they can stay home and play fucking Fortnite. But she remains ever present. And as she does, I hope she pays these thoughts some consideration. The world is changing, and as we move towards 2022, it should be clear that moderation needs to be more than just a buzzword. It needs to be backed up. You can't just play both teams or expect your character will be defined off the back of who you call out alone. Blair set a higher bar than she could obtain and ultimately pay the price for it. Whether she'll continue to do so will depend on how she goes forward. I just hope she doesn't go back. Thank you. Pause. So that was the video, um, and a big thank you as always. A very, very long one, but I hope you enjoyed it nonetheless. I want to give a big thanks to the editors who, um, who have done a fantastic Oh my god, there's so many editors. What the fuck? That's crazy, though. That's pretty cool. I like the collaborative project. Um, Fantastic job. I'll be putting all their links in the pinned comments, so be sure to check them out if you liked what they did. Big shout out to Logan as always. Post editing. Titus have a great work. Thanks to Lenusky for the music and stuff over the thumbnail. Just it's great work all around. I really appreciate everyone who helped. Rest of the day, at least. I don't really have too much else to say, so I'll wrap it up there. Uh, thank you again all for your support. All last, slightly. Thanks again to everyone who helped out. Much love to everyone who supported me. I know I've been a bit slow, but hopefully they can return to a decent pace soon. Though. All right, there's nothing really there. I made it, I can't, I fucking sat through that whole thing in one sitting, dude. I'm, I'm honestly the most impressive person in the world. No, I'm not. I, I played some games, I had some fun. That video was pretty good. That was solid. I thought it was pretty, pretty solid. It was very well informative. I mean, obviously, there's a couple of things I disagreed with. Um, there's a couple of things I disagreed with, but. It was solid. I respected the perspective. Pretty, pretty epic poggers moment. So very, uh, very cool. Very cool.